preface of the treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rob Marland. The treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini. Translated by C. R. Ashby. Preface. An introductory account of the origin and object of the treatises and of Cellini's position as craftsman and author by C. R. Ashby. This translation is intended for the workshop and to bring home to English craftsmen and more particularly to my colleagues and pupils at Essex House the methods and practice of the goldsmith of the Renaissance. It is with this end in view that the work has been undertaken and I am in hopes that the knowledge of this may induce my critics to give it a kindlier reading, aware as I am of its many shortcomings. To the translator of the treatises, two things are necessary, Italian scholarship and a thorough knowledge of workshop technicalities. These two qualities are difficult, perhaps impossible, to combine, and I am conscious of grave deficiencies in both, but more especially in the former. My endeavour has been to follow the lead set me by John Addington Simmons, and to make this first English translation of the treatises serve, if but in some far-off measure, as a continuation volume to his masterly translation of the autobiography. I have in many cases, therefore, adopted his manner of handling the subject, but inasmuch as the more technical and less directly personal matter with which the treatises deal demands a somewhat different treatment, I have sought to retain what I would call the workshop vernacular, without at the same time sacrificing the archaism of the old Italian dialect. Cellini's graphic touch, which gives their manifold brilliancy to the varying passages of that wonderful autobiography, is equally evident in the treatises, but this very vividness increases the translator's difficulty. The book is full of amusing workshop pictures and anecdotes, but it's always a workshop book. Cellini sees each process before him as he describes it. We, however, only hear the description. We do not see the process. Hence, it is often to the expert metal worker alone that some of the more complex technical narrations appeal, while the translator is as frequently in doubt as to whether he has realised the picture the author sought to draw. If, in my English rendering of some of these pictures, I have gone astray, I trust that my errors may be pointed out by those who are better able to follow the author's meaning. Apology is perhaps scarcely necessary for what will often appear to be loose or ungrammatical English. This may be an offence to the stylist or the pedant, and it certainly at first sight jars in what purports to be a scientific textbook. It would have been perfectly easy for me to cut out the improper stories, trim up the phrases and give precision, accuracy and even grammar, to certain of the sentences, but this would not have been Cellini. We have him not writing, but rapidly and with a delightful forgetfulness and confusion, talking his treatises to a scribe, and then omitting to revise them. It is the spirit, therefore, of the spoken word, not the careful writing, that I have sought to render. Another difficulty hampers the translator, the absence of any living workshop tradition upon which to fall back when his subject becomes too technical. In our day of the subdivision of labour, the study of the eight branches of the glorious art of goldsmithing, as it was in Benvenuto's time, is a thing of the past. Except in a few instances where workshops are conducted with the enthusiasm of the artist rather than with the itching fingers of the tradesman, there is no such thing as an all-round grasp of the art such as Cellini postulates. To the tradesman, the sculptor's ghost, the working jeweller, whether of Birmingham, Bond Street or Clerkenwell, in the thousand and one gimcrack shops where they sell merry thought brooches and our latest stock of Christmas presents, the glorious art of goldsmithing has no meaning. 
or rather is a thing not of eight branches but of a hundred subdivisions fanned into existence by a hundred callous machines and workshop tradition has been destroyed by the trade for the same reason the circle of readers will be small to those of us who in recent years have been seeking to lift the art of the goldsmith out of the slough of industrial despond to show once more what the human hand and fancy can create and to relegate without repudiating it the machine to its right place in relation to human endeavour all this manifold production of rubbishy trinkets useless ornaments and things made for the market is stupid and wasteful and makes for the destruction not the ennobling or beautifying of life but though small the circle of my readers will be an earnest one to such as are setting the standard of modern art and craft to those who are fighting the trade and seeking to relate the creations of their hands to the reasons for existence in life this book of the aspirations and traditions of the old italian will have some value fortunately their number is increasing not only in england but in europe and in the united states in the workshops of men like Frampton, Alfred Gilbert, Simmons, Fisher, Nelson Dawson, among the artists of Glasgow and Birmingham, or among the keener creative spirits in New York, whom I have found ready to welcome every genuine inspiration of the hand, will the real readers be found. It is perhaps not my province as a translator to criticise the artistic merit of Cellini's work, but as my hope in placing his treatises before english craftsmen is to familiarise them with his methods i may perhaps be allowed to give a few words of warning we must not take cellini at his own valuation and we must remember that he did not draw that subtle distinction between designer and executant that we nowadays are wont to do the fact that every aesthetic criticism is inevitably biased by the style of its period must be taken into account by the student if such criticisms as i myself speaking as an artist should venture to make are to be of value to him to cellini's best known critics this applies in equal measure vasari delaborde milanese brinkman simmons have each had their point of view so to speak to some like vasari it has been coloured by what the germans call die vol renaissance of which cellini in the art of goldsmithing was undoubtedly the central figure to others like delaborde it was influenced by the romantic reaction of the early nineteenth century and to them his work was an exploded myth criticised from the modern point of view the point of view that distinguishes between goldsmith and sculptor between craftsman and designer we cannot rank him among the highest. There is a want of feeling for proportion in such work as we have of his, and the whole is marred by the overcrowded detail, often very exquisite in itself, of the parts. The craftsman indeed invariably overpowers the artist. Above all, there is a want of spirituality in all his more important work, a want of refinement of soul, if one might so term it, a vulgarity there is none of the evertheia of donatello the graciousness of ghiberti or duccio the mingled strength and sweetness of verrocchio the simple grandeur of pisanello michael angelo's manner perhaps we can trace but of his inspiration and his self-control there is none if we take cellini from the point of view he would himself have wished us to criticise him he challenges us first as a sculptor and a designer of the figure. In this sphere, however, he falls far short of the standard he calls upon us to judge him by. Affected and uneven and imperfect in handling is his work when set beside that of earlier masters. Attenuated as we see in the nymph of Fontainebleau, thick and exaggerated as in the Perseus at Florence, leaden and stiff, as in the Neptune and Cybele of the Salt, there is about his figures always something manqué. They seem indeed to have in them the effort of a decaying school. 
much the same criticism applies to his work as a medalist. There is an absence of reserve and the fine feeling for his limitations which puts him to my mind far beneath Sperandio, Merende, Francia, or other of the great Cinquecento medalists. And it needs no artist to point to the superiority of the Greek coins with which, with redoubtable modesty, he compares his own. To estimate his position as a jeweller is all but impossible, as there is not one jewel remaining that can be authenticated as his. If, however, we may be allowed to gauge his reputation as an artist from such pieces as are attributed to him in the Rothschild, Vienna, Paris, and Chantilly collections, and of which I give some specimens on page 22 and 24, I should be inclined to place him on an equal footing with any of the great masters of the early Renaissance or the Middle Ages in any country. The reasons of this are not far to seek. Jewellery is, before all others, an art of limitations. An artist cannot but but put less of himself into a gem than into a statue. He is necessarily more cabined. Further, Cellini made most of his jewellery as a young man in Florence and Rome, when the traditions of the Florentine workshop which read Brunelleschi, Donatello, Ghiberti, were still fresh upon him, and before he had as yet attempted the impossible task of translating the Gusto Grando of Michelangelo into minor craftsmanship. Subject to the disproving of the attributions, I give therefore to Cellini as a jeweller an equal place with the artists of Greece and Japan, with those of Spain, England and Germany in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, whose works are known to us. But as medalist, goldsmith and sculptor, I would place him on a much lower footing. My whole criticism might be summed up briefly thus. He was a very first-rate craftsman, but a very second-rate artist. The autobiography and the treatises of Cellini must be read together. They tail into one another. The former gives the life of the man, the second the methods of the craftsman. Both alike bring out the writer's strong personality. A few words are needed as to their bearing upon one another, and the original of the present translation. Both the Vita and the Trattati were dictated by Cellini to amanuenses, and, feeling their stylistic imperfections, he offered both, after their completion, to literary friends to polish and refine before publication. The Vita he sent to the great historian Benedetto Varchi, who had the good taste and the wisdom to leave the manuscript as it was, saying that he preferred it in its rough and unpolished condition. The latter was placed in less tactful hands. And Gerardo Spini, a literateur of the Florentine Academy, to whom this task has with good reason been attributed, undertook its recasting to the no small detriment of the original. In this polished and emasculated form, the Trattati first appeared and for three hundred years remained, the Editio Princeps being published in Florence in the shape of a very beautiful volume in 1568, three years before Cellini's death. It was not until 1857 that Carlo Milanesi, working on the lines of Francesco Tassi, who had in the Marciana rediscovered the original manuscript, gave to the world the work as Cellini had originally dictated it. It is on the Trattati of the Marcian Codex, therefore, and not of the first edition, that this translation is based. Cellini is fortunate in having been handled in our own day by four eminent and scholarly men, and to the work of each of these am I indebted. Milanesi, 1857, may be placed first, and his admirable and exhaustive edition of the Trattati cannot be too highly praised. Herr Justus Brinkmann followed him in 1867 with his excellent translation of the Trattati into German, and his very able comparative treatment of the work of the monk Theophilus with that of the Cinquecento artist. 
in eighteen eighty three eugene plon brought out his splendid volume on the life and works of cellini especially valuable for its illustrations and the critical investigation of the authentic and attributed works of the master the work of our own john addington simmons is familiar to most english readers and it is to the study of his masterly translation of the vita that i owe my first introduction to cellini to his memory i would wish here to express my gratefulness and perhaps the best expression of this is in the assurance that through his introduction to cellini has grown up the wish to familiarize the methods of the renaissance workshop among english metal workers and particularly among the metal workers of the guild of handicraft for whom this book is written my thanks are due to messrs plon and c for their kind permission to reproduce the box originally used in monsieur eugene plon's volume and which illustrate in this book the various examples as cellini describes them and i am indebted to many friends artists and scholars for the most part who have helped me with difficulties both in the text and in the workshop to mr and mrs de morgan and captain victor ward for many hours of helpful and i fear sometimes tedious revision to miss constance blount for her great assistance with the enamelling chapter and mr virtue tebbs for his advice among the coins to mr wenlock rollins and mr t sterling lee in the complicated passages dealing with casting and the making of furnaces and above all to professor roberts austin and professor church not only for their invaluable help on all points dealing with metallurgy and stones but also for their kind assistance in correcting the proofs of the whole book i have likewise to thank for their courtesy in allowing me to refer to them in one way or another over technical and literary difficulties mr haywood sumner mr m hewlett professor giglioli of naples and professor ferguson of glasgow c r ashby essex house bow e end of preface Section 1 of The Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing Introduction What first prompted me to write was the knowledge of how fond people are of hearing anything new. Then, in the second place, and this perhaps had greater weight still, I felt much troubled in mind because of all sorts of annoying things, the which I purpose, in the following treatise, with due modesty, to recount. That they will move my readers to great pity and no little anger in my behalf, I am quite positive. Forsooth, you can often attribute to difficulties of this kind the most opposite turns to the greatest of evil the greatest of good and had the troubles in question never come upon me i for sure should never have set about writing down these most useful things thus it was that i did what no one had done before v undertook to write about those loveliest secrets and wondrous methods of the great art of goldsmithing footnote cellini had of course never heard of theophilus the monk of the eleventh century and his great treatise diversarum artium schedula End footnote. things such as neither your philosopher no nor any other kind of man neither if he be not of the craft durst write about but since they of the craft are for the most part better at work than at talk they fall into the error of silence this at least i determined to avoid and so set myself strenuously to the task perhaps never before or at least so rarely that it has never been recorded has a man been found who was a specialist in more than one or at most two of the eight different branches of this goodly art but where he is he knows as you may imagine how to make a good thing of them 
mind you i don't intend to talk about those kinds of muddlers who set themselves busily dabbling in all the eight branches at once and who many and many a time are employed by such as either couldn't or wouldn't decide whether a bit of work was good or whether it was bad men of that ilk methinks may be likened to the sort of small shopkeeper who hangs out in the slums or suburbs of the town and does a little now in the bakery line now in the grocery line now in the apothecary line and now in general retail business in fact a little bit of everything and nothing good in anything these sorts of fellows i don't intend to talk about but only of such as have come to the front in what they've done and only of the right workmanlike way of doing things well then i mind me to begin with of our city of florence and of how we there were the first to revive all those arts that are the sisters of this art of mine of how the earliest light dawned in the time of that first magnificent cosimo de medici of how under him flourished donatello the great sculptor and pippo di ser brunelleschi the great architect and of that wondrous lorenzo ghiberti in whose time were made the beautiful gates for what was once the ancient temple of mars and is now the baptistry of our patron saint john lorenzo ghiberti he was a goldsmith indeed not only in the wonderfulness of his own peculiar style but because of his unwearied power of marvellous finish and his exceeding diligence in execution this man who must be counted among the most admirable of goldsmiths applied himself to everything but especially to the casting of smaller work and though now and then he set about doing large pieces yet one can see that his particular line was the production of small work and in this branch we may well call him a master in the art of casting indeed he pursued this with such excellence that as is still obvious to all no man can touch him antonio Pollajuolo, or the poulterer's son as he is always called was likewise a goldsmith and a draughtsman too of such skill that not only did all the goldsmiths make use of his excellent designs but the sculptors and painters of the first rank also and gained honour by them what was more this man did little else beside his admirable drawing but at this he was always busy masso finiguera pursued only the art of engraving niello in witchcraft he had no rival and he too always made use of the designs of the aforesaid antonio amerigo wrought in the art of enamel and was by far away the first craftsman in it either before or after his time he too great as he was made use of the designs of antonio del pollajuolo michelangelo the goldsmith of pinzi di monte was a capital fellow and worked in a variety of diverse things and especially in the setting of gems he wrought and designed well in niello in enamel in hammered work and though he came not up to the other distinguished men just named he deserves much praise he was the father of baccino whom pope clement made a knight of saint john footnote baccio bandinelli the sculptor one of cellini's bitterest enemies End footnote. he added the surname bandinelli on his own account and since he had neither family nor arms really he took the sign of his knighthood for a coat about this man i shall have more than enough to tell as we go along bastiano del bernardetto cennini was a goldsmith and worked also in a number of different things his forefathers and he for many years made the dies for the coins of florence until the time that alexander de medici the nephew of pope clement became duke this bastiano in his youth did admirable large metalware grocery footnote groceria cellini uses this term for all large ware as distinguished from minuteria or small ware End footnote and hammered work footnote 
de Chesselo, what we would call repoussé. End footnote. And verily he was a first-rate craftsman, and though I said above I wasn't going to talk about bunglers, who take up a number of different things indifferently, one must nonetheless distinguish between those who are bunglers and those who are good craftsmen and worthy of praise. Piero, Giovanni and Romolo were brothers, the sons of one Goro Tavalacino. They were goldsmiths too. They did good work and made good designs. Amongst other things, they were very good at setting jewels in pendants, rings and so forth, and this they managed so tastefully that at that time, 1518, they had no equal. They also worked in intaglio, in bas-relief, and were not bad at hammered work. Stefano Saltarelli was a goldsmith too, a good man in his day, working like the others in a number of different things, but he died young. Zanobi, son of Meo del Lavacchio, whose craft he followed, was a goldsmith also, had a charming way of working and designed admirably, but he died just when his beard began to bloom, at about the age of twenty. Indeed, at that time there were many young fellows whose equal and colleague I was, who promised great things to begin with, but the most of them has death snatched away, and the rest have either not stuck to the drudgery, or with undeveloped talents have got no further. As for me, I have heard myself blamed because I have talked so much about such excellent men in one profession only, but I have still to tell of work in filigree, an art, though the least beautiful of many beautiful arts, still very beautiful for all that. Piero di Nino was a goldsmith who worked only in filigree, an art which, while it affords great charm, is not without its difficulties. He, however, knew how to work in it better than anyone else. Inasmuch as there was great riches in those days within the town, so was it likewise in the country, especially among the peasant folk of the plain, who used to get made for their wives a sort of velvet girdle with buckle and pin, about half a cubit long and covered all over with little spangles. These buckles and pins were all wrought in filigree with great delicacy, and fashioned in silver of excellent setting. When later on I shall show how these things are made, I am sure the reader will find delight in them. I knew this Piero de Nino when an old man of near ninety years. He died partly from fear of dying of hunger, and partly from a shock he got one night. As for the dying of hunger, it was this way. An edict had been issued in the city that no more belts should be worn either by peasants or others, and the poor old fellow, who knew no other branch of goldsmithing but this, was always grieving and cursing from the bottom of his heart all those who had a hand in making this law. He lived near a draper's shop, where was a young rogue of an urchin, the son of one of them that had made the law. The boy, hearing him thus continually cursing his father, Oh, Piero, said he, if you go on swearing like that, some fine day the devil will come and carry you off, bones and all. Now, one Saturday night, when the old chap had worked right up to midnight to finish some job he was engaged on that was to go to Bologna, the urchin took it into his head to play him a practical joke and gave him a fright. So he stood on the watch for the old man on his way home. The latter, as was his wont, locked up his shop, took his lantern in his hand, and, with the lappet of his cloak thrown over his head, trudged along ever so slowly and as lonely as a ghost, home to his house, which stood in the Via Mozza. Just as he was turning the corner of the old market, the urchin, who was awaiting an ambush for him, and had tricked himself out with ragtag sulphur lights, blue fire, and such like horrible devilries, suddenly jumped out upon him. The poor old thing was so terrified at the fearful monster thus suddenly coming at him, that he lost his senses, so much so that the boy, seeing he had played the fool, had to lead the old man home as well he could, and consign him to the care of his grandsons, among whom was one called Maino, a courtier, who afterwards became warden of Arezzo. Suffice it, the fright had been so great 
that soon after the poor old fellow died. This is usually stated as the actual cause of Piero's death, and I have myself oft times heard it narrated. Antonio di Salvi was another of our Florentine goldsmiths, a capital grocerie worker. He died at a very great age. Salvatore Pilli, likewise, was a first-rate man, who also died very old, but he never worked in a shop of his own, but always in someone else's. Salvatore Guasconti was an all-round man, more especially good in small things. His work in yellow and enamel is well worthy of praise. You must know too that there were ever so many others, all of them fellow Florentines, who commenced in the goldsmith's art and took their inspiration from it for various other arts, such as sculpture, architecture and other notable lines of work. Donatello, for instance, the greatest sculptor that ever lived, about whom I shall have plenty to say later on, stuck to the goldsmith's art right along into manhood. Pippo di Ser Brunellesco, the first who gave new vigour to the glory of architecture, he too was a goldsmith for a long time. Lorenzo Dalla Golpaia also was a goldsmith and always continued true to the art. As for him, he was a very prodigy of nature, for he specialised in clock-making and finding his own peculiar bent in this line, so wonderfully reproduced the secret of the heavens and the stars that you really might have thought he lived up in the sky. Amongst other things, he showed his cunning in a clock he made for the magnificent Lorenzo de' Medici. In this clock he put the Medici arms, making them represent the seven planets. These used to move round slowly and revolve just like the planets in the sky do. This clock is still in its place, but it is not what it used to be because it has been so badly taken care of. Andrea del Verrocchio, the sculptor, remained a goldsmith up to the time of manhood. He was the master of Leonardo da Vinci, painter, sculptor, architect, philosopher, musician, a veritable angel incarnate of whom I shall have heaps to tell whenever he comes to mind. Desiderio, too, was a goldsmith in his youth, who took to sculpture later, and was a great master in the art. I can't possibly recount all our Florentines who were adepts in the great goldsmith's art. Suffice it that I have mentioned most of those who became famous therein. But I will say a word or two about some of the foreigners who seem to me preeminent, and I will begin with such as wrought in Niello. Martino was a goldsmith from beyond the Alps, who came from some German town or other. Footnote. Martin Schongauer. End footnote. He was a first-rate fellow in designing and in intaglio work in the way they do it there. It was just about the time when the fame of our Masso Finiguera spread abroad, who did those wonderful niello intaglios. By the way, you may still see preserved in our lovely church of St. John of Florence a silver pyx of his, with a crucifix above it, and the two malefactors, with a lot of detail of horses and other things. Antonio del Pollajuolo, whom I mentioned before, did the design, and Masso the Niello work. Well, then, this good German Martino set to with great diligence and zeal to practice the art of Niello, and turned out a number of excellent things. But because he saw that he could not produce work that should come up to our finigueras for beauty and go, yet being a right-minded man and wishing to do something that should be generally useful, he set to cutting his intaglios on copper plates with the graver, Bellino, for so is the little steel tool called with which you engrave. In this wise he engraved a number of pretty little picture tales, very well composed, and with great understanding of light and shade. In fact, as far as one can say such a thing of a piece of German work, they were charming. Alberto Juro also tried his hand at engraving, and with much greater success than Martino. He too was not satisfied with the results of his work in Niello, and so determined to do engravings. And this he did so well that no one can hold a candle to him. 
he too was a goldsmith nor was he satisfied with niello only he resorted in addition to his engraving and did extraordinarily well in that line andrea mantegni our great italian painter tried it too but couldn't do it so the less said about it the better antonio pollajuolo the same happened with him and because both these men could make nothing of it i'll say naught but that mantegni was an excellent painter and pollajuolo an excellent draughtsman antonio da bologna footnote mark antonio raimondi and footnote and marco da ravenna must also be counted among the goldsmiths antonio was the first who began to engrave in the manner of alberto Giorgio. he studied closely the work of the great painter raphael of urbino he engraved beautifully could design in the right good italian manner and studied closely the style and methods of those old greeks who always know how to do things better than other folk many others pursued this branch of engraving but because none of them came up to the great alberto Giorgio, and even also a long way behind our italian antonio of bologna i'll not mention them more especially as to do so would be to go beyond the limits of our inquiry which is to consider the lovely art of niello and all its many difficulties now you must know that when i first was a goldsmith's apprentice in the fifteenth year of the century which was my fifteenth year too the art of engraving in niello had quite fallen into disuse it was only because a few old men still living did nothing else but talk of the beauty of the art and of the great masters who had wrought in it and above all of finiguera that i was seized with a mighty desire to learn it so i set to diligently to master it and with the examples of finiguera before me made many good pieces my difficulty however was how to find out after i had engraved the intaglio how the niello that was to fill it ought to be made so i went on trying ever so hard until i not only mastered the difficulties of making the material but the whole art became a mere child's play to me here then is the way in which niello work is done end of section one Section 2 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini. Translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing. Chapter 1. On the Art of Niello. Take an ounce of the finest silver, two ounces of copper well purified, and three ounces of lead as pure as you can possibly get it then take a little goldsmith's crucible sufficiently big to melt the three in together you must first take the one ounce of silver and the two ounces of copper and put the two together in the crucible and the crucible in a goldsmith's blast furnace and when the silver and the copper are molten and well mixed together add the lead to them then quickly draw the crucible out and with a bit of charcoal held in your tongs stir it round till it's well mixed the lead according to its want will make a little scum so with your charcoal try and take this off as much as possible until the three metals are fully and cleanly blended at the same time have ready a little earthenware flask about as big as your fist the neck of which should however not be wider than might hold one of your fingers fill this flask about half full with very finely ground sulphur and empty into this your molten mass while quite fluid and hot then quickly stuff it up with moist earth and holding it in your hand wrapped up in a stout bit of canvas say for instance an old sack shake it to and fro while it's cooling as soon as it's cold break the flask and take out the stuff and you will see that by virtue of the sulphur it will have got the black colour you want but mind you take care that the sulphur is the blackest you can get footnote this is obscure as the purest yellow sulphur would answer End footnote. as for the flask you may take one of those which are generally used for separating gold from silver take then your niello which will now be in a number of little grains 
for you must know that the object of all this shaking up and down whilst cooling in the sulphur is to make it combine and put it anew into a crucible then melt it in a moderate fire adding to it a grain of borax when you have recast it two or three times and after each casting broken up your niello take it out for you will see it will now be splendidly broken up footnote perhaps have a fine fracture End footnote. and that is as it ought to be and that will do now i'll show you how to apply and make up your niello but first a word or two about the plate on which your intaglio is to be engraved whether in silver or in gold for niello is used only on these metals if you want to get the plate on which you have cut your work nice and smooth and without holes footnote bucolini perhaps specks End footnote you must boil it in a solution of clean water mixed with a deal of very clean charcoal the best for this purpose being charred oak when your work has cooked in the pot for about a quarter of an hour or so transfer it to a beaker of clean fresh water and scrub it for a long time with a clean brush till every particle of dirt be rubbed off it then see that you have ready a bit of iron long enough to hold the work to the fire its length should be about three or four palms more or less in accordance with what the nature of your work may seem to you to need but mind you look out that the iron to which your work is fixed be neither too thick nor too thin for it should be of such sort that when you put both to the fire they should heat equally for if either the iron or the plate become heated first you'll make a mess of it so pay great attention to this next take your niello and crush it on an anvil or on a porphyry stone and do this with a pair of pliers or a copper rod and so that it does not spring aside take care too that it's crushed to grains and not to a powder and these grains should be as equal as possible and about the size of a grain of millet or sago if not less after this put the niello grains into some sort of vase or glass bottle and with fresh clean water wash it out well till it be quite purified from any dust or dirt that may have got into it during the pounding this done take a spatula of brass or copper and spread the niello evenly over your engraved plate to about the thickness of the back of a table knife then powder over it a little well ground borax but mind it be not too much put a few pieces of wood or charcoal so that you can blow them into flame with your bellows and this done put your work very slowly to the wood fire and subject it to the heat very dexterously till you see the niello beginning to melt but look out that when it does begin to melt you don't get it too hot or into a red heat for if it gets too hot it will lose its natural character and become soft because the principal component of niello being lead this lead will begin to corrode the silver or even the gold of which your work is made in this way you might have all your pains for nothing have great heed to this therefore which is as important as your good engraving to begin with now before we follow the work through to the end we will pause and consider things a bit I advise you, when you're holding your work over the fire and see the niello begin to disintegrate, to have at hand a fairly stout iron rod with a flatted end, this end holding the fire, and when the niello begins to run, rapidly put your hot iron over it, and, treating it as if it were wax, spread it well, until it has quite filled all the graven part of your intaglio. After this, when your work has got cold, take a delicate file and file off your niello and after you have removed a certain quantity not so as to graze your intaglio but sufficient to lay it bare take your work and put it on the hot ashes or the live charcoal when it is a little hotter than the hand can bear or even a bit hotter still but before it gets too hot take your steel burnisher well tempered and with a little oil burnish your niello as firmly as the work would seem to admit of and with due discretion in every case 
the only object of this burnishing is to stop up certain bubble holes footnote spugnutze end footnote that sometimes come during the process you've only got to have patience enough and with a little practice you'll find this burnishing stops all the holes up beautifully after this take your knife and touch up the intaglio then to finish with take some tripoli powder and pounded charcoal and with a reed peeled down to the pith scrub your work till it's smooth and beautiful O oh, thou discreetest of readers, marvel not that I have given so much time in writing about all this, but know that I have not even said half of what is needed in this same art, the which, in very truth, would engage a man's whole energies and make him practice no other art at all. In my youth, from my fifteenth to my eighteenth year, I wrought a good deal of this art of Niello, always from my own designs, and was much praised for my work. End of section two. Section three of the treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The treatise on goldsmithing, chapter two, on filigree work. Though I don't work much in filigree myself. I have none the less done one or two very difficult and very beautiful pieces of work in this line, and so I'll say something about it. The art is a charming one, and when well executed and well understood, is as pleasing to the eye of man as anything done in goldsmithing. Those who did the best work in filigree were the men who had a good grip of drawing, especially designing from foliage and pierced spray work, for everything that you set to work upon requires first of all that you think it out as a design. And though many have practised the art without making drawings first, because the material in which they worked was so easily handled and so pliable, still, those who made their drawings first did the best work. Now give ear to the way the art is pursued. Innumerable are the purposes to which you may apply filigree, so first of all we'll begin with some of the ordinary everyday things and then have a look at such other things as will make a man's mouth water. The more ordinary use to which filigree is applied is for buckles and pins for belts, such as I told of in the introductory chapter of my book. Then it is used too for making crosses and earrings, small caskets, buttons, certain kinds of little charms and diverse manner of necklaces. These latter are often worn with fillings of musk, as is also frequently the case with bracelets, and so an endless other variety of things. Now, it's necessary that for everything that you want to execute in this line of work, you must, to begin with, make a gold or silver plate exactly in the way you want your work ultimately to be. After this is done, and of course, after you've made your drawing, have ready all the different kinds of wire of which you'll have need, such, for instance, as thick and thin and middling, the usual three sizes in due sequence, and perhaps a fourth size likewise. Then have ready some granalia, granulated metal, for so the stuff is called, and in order to make this, you take your gold or silver, melt it, and when it's well melted, pour it into a pot of powdered charcoal. In this way, every kind of granulated metal is made. Footnote. Fine granules of gold are made by cutting gold wire into short lengths, mixing the cut pieces with charcoal, placing the mixture in a crucible, and then heating the whole up to the melting point of the metal. Afterwards, the charcoal is washed away, and the gold granules, which have been fused into a round form, sorted according to size by sifting. End footnote. Then, too, you must have your solder prepared and ready to hand, and the right solder to use is the terzo solder, so called because you make it with two ounces of silver and one of copper. Now, though many are accustomed to make solder with brass, be advised that it's much better to make it with copper, and less risky. Take heed that you file your solder very fine, 
then put to every three parts of solder one of well-ground borax and having well mixed them put them in a borax crucible such as a goldsmith does footnote boracciere perhaps a borax pan and footnote then have handy some gum tragacanth footnote uno scarpaletto augnato and footnote a sort of gum which you can buy at any apothecaries dissolve this gum tragacanth in a little cup or vase or whatever is convenient when you have all these things in order you will also need by you two pairs of stout little pliers and also a small sharp chisel cut angularly like the wood engravers use footnote dragante End footnote. but its handle ought to be short the length and size of the handle of a graver for its object is to cut the wires in accordance as you may wish to twist them either one way or the other as your design requires or your taste determines you will also need a copper plate fairly stout very smooth and about the size of the palm of your hand when you've twisted your wire into the shapes you want you must place it bit by bit on the copper plate and so bit by bit with a camel's hair brush streak it over with the solution of gum tragacanth arranging at the same time the little gold and silver beads tastily during the time that you're piecing together your bits of leaves and other particles the tragacanth water will hold them together sufficiently to prevent their moving then every time that you have composed a part of your spray work and before the tragacanth water has got dry throw a little soldering powder out of your borax upon it and put just as much as may suffice to solder your spray work and not more the object of putting just enough on is that the work when soldered shall be graceful and slender for too much solder makes it look fat hereupon when it's time for soldering you will need in readiness a little stove such as is used for enamelling but since there is a great difference between the melting of enamel and the soldering of filigree you will need to heat this furnace with a much smaller fire then attach your work to a little iron plate but so that the work stands free above it and put it little by little to the heat of the furnace until the borax shall have fumed away and done as is its wont now too much heat would move the wires you have woven out of place so it's essential to take the greatest possible care really it's quite impossible to tell it properly in writing i could explain it all right enough by word of mouth or better still show you how it's done still come along we'll try and go on as we started when you're ready to begin soldering and want to make your solder flow put your work in the furnace and place beneath it a few little pieces of well-dried wood fanning them up a bit with your bellows then it's not a bad thing too after this to throw a few coarse cinders upon the fire and this done at the right moment does a deal of good but it's practice and experience together with a man's own discretion that are the only real ways of teaching one how to bring about good results in this or in anything when your work is soldered that is to say if it be silver work you must to begin with cook it in tartar footnote gomma di botte i.e tartrate of potash End footnote mixed with some salt or other and cook it so long till all the borax is off it this ought to last about a quarter of an hour by which time it'll be quite clean and free from borax if on the other hand it be made of gold you must put it in strong vinegar for about twenty-four hours until you see a little salt forming upon it and so after this manner can you fashion all sorts of rosettes that may be needed in your work such as i have not only seen but myself made and that give much variety to the work when you have ordered them each in their place and in accordance with your design but now i'll tell you yet something further about the cunning of this charming art i'll tell you of a wonderful and priceless work that was shown me in france in paris their most beautiful and richest city which the french according to their language call paris simpari 
that is to say, sans peer or without equal. It was in the service of King Francis in the year 1541. This most royal and splendid of kings retained me in Paris and gave me of his liberality a castle standing in the city itself and called by the name of the Little Nello. Here I worked for four years, the which will be recounted all in its place when I come to tell of the great works which I made for this most worthy king. Here I will continue my talk as to the way of working in filigree, and, as I promised, tell of a work most rare, a work such as may perchance never again be executed, which I saw in this city. One day, a solemn fate day, the king went at Vespers to his Saint-Chapelle in Paris. He sent word to me that I was to be at Vespers too, as he had something nice to show me. When Vespers were over, the king called me to him through the constable, who sometimes represents the king himself. This gentleman came, took me by the hand, and led me before the king, who with great kindness and affability began to show me the most beautiful trinkets and jewels, and briefly asked my opinion on them. After these he showed me a variety of ancient camei about as big as the palm of a large hand, and asked me many things about them, on which I gave him my opinion. They had stood me in the middle of all of them. There was the king, and the king of Navarre, his brother-in-law, and the queen of Navarre, and all the first flower of the nobility, and of those that came nearest to the crown. And before all of them his majesty showed me many beautiful and priceless things, about which we talked for a good time to his great delight. Thereupon he showed me a drinking bowl without a foot, and of a middling size, wrought in filigree with the choicest spray work, upon which much other ornamental detail was admirably applied. Now list to my description of it. In among the spray work and interstices of filigree were settings of the most beautiful enamel of various colours, and when you held it to the light, these enamel fillings almost looked as if they were transparent. Indeed, it seemed impossible that such a piece of work should ever have been made. Thus, at least, thought the king, and asked me very pleasantly, since I had thus highly praised the bowl, could I possibly imagine how the work was done? I thereupon answered his question thus, Sacred Majesty, quoth I, I can tell you exactly how it's done, even so much so that you, being the man of rare ability that you are, shall know how just as well as the master himself that made it knew. But the explanation of the methods that underlie its making will take rather a long time. At these words of mine all the noble assembly that waited on his majesty thronged around me, the king declared he had never seen work of so wondrous a kind, and since it was so easy of explanation, bade me tell as I had promised. Then spake I, if you want to make a bowl like this, you must begin by making one of thin sheet iron, about the thickness of a knife back larger than the one you want ultimately to produce in filigree. Then, with a brush, you paint it inside with a solution of fine clay, cloth shearings, and Tripoli clay, finely ground. Then you take finely drawn gold wire of such a thickness as your wise-minded master may wish that of his bowl to be, this thread should be so thick that if you beat it out flat with a hammer on your clean little cup, it bends more readily in the width than otherwise, in such a way that it may then be flattened out to a ribbon shape, two knife blades broad, and as thin as a sheet of paper. You must be careful to stretch your thread out very evenly, and have it tempered soft, because it will then be easier to twist with your pliers. Then, with your fine design before you, you commence to compose your stretched thread inside the iron bowl, first the principal members, according to their way of arrangement, piece by piece painting them over with solution of gum tragacanth, so that they adhere to the clay solution with which you pasted the inside. Then, when your craftsman has set all his principal members and larger outlines, he must put in the spray work, each piece in its place, just as the design guides him, setting it spray by spray, bit by bit, in the way I've told you. And then, when all this is in proper order, 
he must have ready his enamels of all colours, well ground and well washed. It is true you might do the soldering first before you put in the enamel, and you would do it in the way that I explained above when I considered the soldering of filigree work, but it's as good one way as the other, soldered or not soldered. And when all the preliminary work is carefully done, and all the interstices nicely filled with the coloured enamels, you put the whole thing in the furnace in order to make the enamel flow. To begin with, you must only subject it to a slight heat, after which, when you've filled up any little openings with a second coat of enamel, you may put it again under a rather bigger fire, and, if it appear after this that there are still crannies to be filled up, you put it to as strong a fire as the craft allows and as your enamels will bear. When all this is done, you remove it from the iron bowl, which will be easy by reason of the paste of clay to which the actual work and the enamels are attached. Then, with a particular kind of stones called frassinelle, and with fresh water, you begin the process of smoothing it down, and you must go on with this so long till the enamel is polished down to an equal thickness throughout, and as may seem good to you. And when you have gone as far as the frassinelle can take you, you may continue your polishing with still finer stones, and lastly with a piece of reed and tripoli clay, as I explained it in Niello work. Then the surface of your enamel will be very smooth and beautiful. When the admirable King Francis heard all this description of mine, he declared that they who knew so well how to explain, doubtless knew still better how to perform, and that I had so well pointed out to him the whole process of a work that he had erst thought impossible, that now, owing to my description, he really thought he could do it himself, and therewith he heaped great favours upon me, such as you can't possibly imagine. End of section three. Section four of the treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The treatise on goldsmithing, chapter three, concerning the art of enamel. Now, let us have a talk about the beautiful art of enamelling, and therewith consider those excellent craftsmen who wrought best therein, and with the knowledge of their lovely creations before us, see what is beautiful and what is difficult in this art, and get to understand the difference between what is really good and what is indifferent. As I said in the first chapter of my book, this art was well practised in Florence, and I think too that all those countries where they used it, and preeminently the French and the Flemings, and certainly those who practised it in the proper manner, got it originally from us Florentines. And because they knew how difficult the real way was, and that they would never be able to get to it, they set about devising another way that was less difficult. In this they made such progress that they soon got, according to popular opinion, the name of good enamelers. It's certainly true that if a man only works at a thing long enough, all his practising makes his hand very sure in his art, and that was the way with the folk who lived beyond the Alps. As for the right and proper way about which I intend to talk, it is done in this wise. First you make a plate either of gold or silver and of the size and shape that your work is to be. Then you prepare a composition of peque greca, footnote, probably powdered resin. In Hendry's Theophilus, it's given as common white pine resin from which the oil has been evaporated over hot water. End footnote. And brick ground very fine, and a little wax, according to the season. As for the latter, you must add rather more in cold than in hot weather. This composition you put upon a board, great or small, in accordance with the size of your work, and on this you put your plate when you've heated it. Then you draw an outline with your compasses in depth rather less than a knife back, and this done, ground your plate anywhere within this outline, and with the aid of a four-cornered chisel to the depth which the enamel is to be, 
and this you must do very carefully. After this, you can grave in intaglio on your plate anything that your heart delights in, figure, animals, legend with many figures, or anything else you like to cut with your graver and your chisels, and with all the cleanness that you possibly can. A bas-relief has to be made about the depth of two ordinary sheets of paper, and this bas-relief has to be sharply cut with finely pointed steel tools, especially in the outlines, and if your figures are clothed with drapery, know that the folds, if sharply drawn and well projecting, will well express the drapery. It is all a question of how deeply your work is engraved, and the little folds and flowerets that you figure on the larger folds may go to represent damask. The more care you put into this part of your work, the less liable your enamel will be to crack and peel off hereafter, and the more carefully you execute the intaglio, the more beautiful your work will be in the end. But don't imagine that by touching up the surface of your work with punches and hammer it will gain anything in the relief, for the enamels will either not stick at all, or the surface that you're enamelling will still appear rough. And just as when a man cuts an intaglio he often rubs it with a little charcoal, such as willow or walnut wood, which he rubs on with a little saliva or water, the same you may do here when you cut your intaglio in order to see it stand out better, because the shine made by the metal tools on the plate will make it difficult for you to see your work. But as owing to this the work gets a bit untidy and greasy, it's necessary, when you've finished it, to boil it out in a concoction of ashes, footnote, bolelo in una cenerata, end footnote, such as was described above for Niello work. Now, let us say you want to begin enamelling your work, and that it's in gold. I propose telling you first of how to enamel on gold, and then how to do it on silver. For both gold and silver, the same cleanness is necessary, and, in either case, the same method, but there is a little difference in applying the enamel and also in the actual enamels applied, for the red enamel cannot be put on silver because the silver doesn't take it. The reasons of this I would explain were it not too long a business, so I'll say nothing about it, especially as to do so would take us beyond the scope of our inquiry. Furthermore, I have no intention of talking about how enamels are made, because that in itself is a great art, also practised by the ancients and discovered by wise men. But as far as we're aware, the ancients did not know of the transparent red enamel, which, it is said, was discovered by an alchemist who was a goldsmith as well. But all I need tell of it is that this alchemist, while engaged in the search of how to make gold, had mixed together a certain composition, and when the work was done, there appeared among the stuff in the metal rest of his crucible a sediment of the loveliest red glass, just as we see it to this day. After much time and trouble, and by many mixings of it with other enamels, the goldsmith finally discovered the process of making it. This enamel is far the most beautiful of all, and is termed in the goldsmith's art smalto roggio red enamel or in the french roggia claro rouge clair that is to say and which means in other words red and clear or transparent a further sort of red enamel we have also which is not transparent and has not the splendid colour and this is used on silver because that metal will not take the other and though I have not had much practical experience of it, I have tried it often enough to be able to talk about it. As for the other, it lends itself more aptly to gold by reason of its being produced from the minerals and compositions that have been used in the search how to make gold. Now let us return to the process of enamelling. The method of enamelling is much the same as painting, for you can have as many colours as come within human ken. But just as in painting, so in enamelling, you have them all ranged in order and all well ground to begin with. 
we have a proverb in the craft which says smolto sottile e niello grosse enamel should be fine niello should be coarse and that's just what it is you put your enamel in a little round mortar of well-hardened steel and about the size of your palm and then you pound it up with very clean water and with a little steel pestle specially made for the purpose of the necessary size some to be sure have pounded their enamels on porphyry or serpentine stone which are very hard and moreover have done this dry but i now think that the steel mortar is much better because you can pound it so much cleaner the reasons of this we may consider later but because we want here to be as brief as possible and to avoid any unnecessary difficulties and useless confusion all we need know is that the particular mortars in question are made in milan many excellent men of this craft came from milan and its adjacent territory and i knew one of the best of them his nickname was master caradoso footnote his real name was ambrogio foppa End footnote. and he never wanted to be called by any other and this nickname was given him once by a spaniard who was in a great rage because he was kept waiting by the master for a piece of work which he had promised to get finished by a particular day when the spaniard saw that he could not have it in time he got so fearfully angry that he looked as if he would like to do him an injury at which caradoso to appease his wrath began excusing himself as best he could and in such a plaintive tone of voice and such an uncouth milanese lingo that the irate nobleman burst out laughing and looking him straight in the face cried out in his high and mighty manner hai caradosso that is to say you bumface the sound of this appellation pleased caradosso so much that he never would answer to any other when later on one fine day he found out what it really meant he would gladly have got rid of it but he couldn't it was too late i knew him as an old man of eighty in rome where he was never called by any other name than caradosso he was a splendid goldsmith especially at enamelling and i shall have more to say of him later on now let us proceed with the beautiful art of enamelling as i said above the best way of pounding the enamels is in a little steel mortar with water i found out from personal experience that the best plan as soon as the enamels are ground is to pour off the water in which you grind them and put the powder in a little glass pouring upon it just so much aqua fortis as may suffice to cover it and so let it stand for about one-eighth of an hour this done take out your enamel and wash it well in a glass bottle with very clear clean water until no residue of impurity be left you must know that the object of the aqua fortis is to clean it of any fatty just as fresh water is to clean it of any earthy impurities when your enamels are all well washed in this way you should put each in its little jar of glassware or majolica but take care that your water is so contained that it doesn't dry up because if you put fresh water to them your enamels will spoil at once now pay great attention to what i'm next going to tell you if you want your enamels to come out properly you must take a nice clean piece of paper and chew well between your teeth that's to say if you've got any i couldn't do it because i've none left so should have to soften it and beat it up with a little hammer of iron or wood whichever might be best this done you must wash out your paper putty and squeeze it till there's no water left in it because you'll have to use it as a sponge and apply it from time to time upon your enamels the more your colours dry up during the process the better they'll look afterwards then too i mustn't forget to tell you another important thing which will also affect the good or bad enamelling of your work and this necessitates your trying a piece of experimental work first to this end you take a plate of gold or silver whichever material you elect to cut your intaglio upon and on this experimental piece let us suppose it's gold 
put all the different colours with which you intend to work having made as many little hollows with your graver as there are enamels thus you take a little bit of each and the only object of this is to make the necessary preliminary trial for by this trial you find out which run easy and which run hard because it's very necessary that they should all run alike for if some run too slowly and others too fast they would spoil each other and you would make a mess of your work all those preliminaries done you may set to work at your enamelling lay the nice clean colours over your engraved bas relief just as if you were painting always keeping your colours well covered up and take no more out of one bottle than you can conveniently use at a time it is usual too to fashion an instrument called a palettier pallet holder this is made out of thin copper plate and in imitation of fingers it should not be bigger than your fingers and there should be five or six of them then you take a lump of lead in the shape of a pear with an iron stem to it which would correspond to the stalk of the pear and then you put all your bits of copper which you've hollowed out somewhat one over the other on your pear stem and this little finger-shaped pallet you stand beside your work and you put your enamels upon it one by one using due care how careful you have to be with this cannot be told in words alone you'll have to learn that by experience as i said above enamelling is similar to painting though the mediums in the two sorts of painting in colours are oil and water while that of painting in enamels is by dissolving them with heat to begin with then take your enamels with a little copper palette knife and spread them out little by little very carefully over your bas relief putting on any colour you like be it flesh colour red peacock blue tawny azure grey or capuchin colour for that is what one of the colours is called i don't mention yellow white and turquoise blue because those colours are not suitable to gold but one colour i forgot and that was aquamarina a most beautiful colour which may be used for gold as well as for silver then when you have all your enamels of all colours placed in the best of orders you have to be careful in the first coat as it's called to apply them very thin and neatly and just as if you were painting in miniature you put each in its place exactly where it's to be this done have your furnace in order and well heated with charcoal later on i'll tell you further of furnaces and point out which are the best of the many different ones in use but now let us assume that you have in it a fire sufficient for the purpose of the work you have before you then having your furnace as i say in its place you must put your gold work on an iron plate a trifle larger than the work itself so that it can be handled with the tongs and you must so ply it with the tongs and hold it to the mouth of the furnace that it gets warm gradually then little by little put it into the middle of the furnace but you must take the greatest possible care that as soon as the enamel begins to move you don't let it run but draw it away from the fire quickly so however that you do not subject it to any sudden cooling then when it is quite cool apply just as carefully as before the second coat of enamel put it in the furnace in the same way this time to a rather stronger fire and draw it forth in the same manner as before after this if you see your work need further touching up with enamel in any of its corners as is often necessary judgment and care will show you how to do it for this i advise you to make a stronger and clearer fire adding fresh charcoal and so put your work in again subjecting it to as strong a heat as enamel and gold can stand then rapidly take it out and let your prentice be ready bellows in hand to blow upon it as quickly as possible and so cool it this you have to do for the sake of the red enamel the smelter roggio of which we spoke above because in the last firing it's wont to fuse with the others and so to make new colour effects the red for instance going so yellow that you can scarce distinguish it from gold this fusing is technically called aprire 
when it has once more cooled you put it in again but this time with a much weaker fire until you see it little by little reddening but take great heed that when it's got the good colour you want you draw it rapidly from the fire and cool it with the bellows because too much firing will give it so strong a colour as to make it almost black when you've duly carried out all these processes to your satisfaction take some of your frasinelle these were the bits of stones or sand that i described before when i told you about king francis filigree bowl and with them smooth your work over until you get the proper effect then finish by polishing it with tripoli as i showed you above also in the filigree bowl this method of finishing which is by far the best and safest is called hand polishing in contradistinction to a second method by which after you have your work smoothed with the frasinella and then well washed with fresh water so as to remove from it all dirt you put it again onto the iron plate and into a clear fire and thus slowly heat it in this method by which you get the effect of polish much quicker than with the other you leave the work in the fire till it's hot and the enamels begin to run but its disadvantage is that as the enamels always shrink a bit and shrink unequally in the firing you cannot get so even a surface as by the hand polishing you have to take the same precautions too as you took when firing your roggio claro or red enamel in the event of your not employing the latter as would be the case on silver you must take great care to observe the same precautions in putting your work in but do just the opposite in taking it out of the fire that is to say draw it very gradually from the furnace so that it cools very slowly instead of very rapidly as was the case with the red enamel of course you may have to enamel a lot of pieces such for instance as little pendants and bits of jewellery and other such things where you're not able to use the frasinella at all things of this kind fruit leaves little animals tiny masks and such like are applied in the same way with well ground and washed enamels but cannot be similarly polished because of their relief and if by reason of the great time and labour and patience you spend upon the doing of all this your enamels begin to dry up and thus fall off in turning your work this you may remedy in this wise take a few quince seeds which you get by cutting the fruit through the middle choose such as are not empty and let them soak in a vase with a little water this you should do overnight if you want to enamel the next morning and you should be careful to do it very clean then when you want to apply your enamels having put a morsel of each colour on your palette the finger palette i described to you above fixed onto the stem of your leaden pear you mix with every bit of enamel you lay on your work a tiny drop of this quince seed water the effect of which is to produce a kind of gum which holds the enamels together so that they don't fall and no other gum has a like effect for the rest all you have to do is to carefully carry out the methods i've so far explained to you and whether your enamel be on gold or silver except in so far as i have told those methods are the same end of section four section five of the treatises of benvenuto cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by benvenuto cellini translated by c r ashby this librivox recording is in the public domain the treatise on goldsmithing chapter four jewellery now let us discuss jewellery and of what pertains to precious stones of such there are four only and those four are made by the four elements the ruby is made by fire the sapphire most obviously by the air the emerald by the earth and the diamond by water in its due place i shall have something to say of the virtue of each but what we have before us here is to talk about what pertains to the setting in pendants bracelets rings tiaras and crowns we will leave diamonds till the last because they are the most difficult of all stones to treat 
and the reason of this is that while of the other stones set in gold each one has its foil of which more anon the diamond of certain varieties has a tint which has to be specially prepared at the back of the stone according to the peculiarities of each and in their place will i tell you the loveliest things about them we'll begin with rubies of which there are various sorts the first is the oriental ruby which is found in our side of the levant and near home this part of the levant indeed produces rarer and more beautiful jewels than any other lands these levant rubies have a mature colour they are deep and very fiery the rubies of the west on the other hand though still red lean towards peacock colour and are somewhat sharp and crude northern rubies are sharper and cruder still while those of the south are quite different from the others but so rare that they're very seldom to be met with so i'll mention one of their peculiarities only they have not the same grand colour as the levant ruby but verge somewhat upon that of the ballus footnote bellachio and footnote and though this has not the beautiful suffused colour it is none the less fiery and so grand is it that they seem perpetually to scintillate by day and by night throw out a gleam akin to that of a glow-worm or other little creatures that shine in the dark true it is that these southern rubies do not always possess this wonderful quality but so delightful are they to the eye that your good jeweller easily tells them from the others the name carbuncle is however only applied to the very rare ones and those that shine in the dark as soon as we have considered from personal experience and from the experience of others what are the best ways of setting jewels we will talk of the qualities of the stones themselves but i have a thing or two to say in order not to scandalise a certain class of men who call themselves jewellers but may be better likened to hucksters or linen drapers pawnbrokers and grocers i have seen more than enough of wonderful samples in plenty of them in rome and there you may still see them to this day with a maximum of credit and a minimum of brains so what i say is out of respect to these dunderheads lest they should be shocked at my affirming that the real stones are of four sorts only and thus wag their arrogant tongues at me and cry how about the chrysoprase or the jackins how about the spinel how about the aquamarine nay more how about the garnet the vermeil the chrysolite the plasma the amethyst ain't these all stones and all different yes and why the devil won't you add pearls too among the jewels ain't they fish bones i really don't think it worth while to try and cope with veritable empty-headed ignoramuses but i will say that there are many very many like them and that your great princes are mainly to blame for encouraging them since they quite put themselves in the hands of such men and so not only do injury to themselves but undervalue men that walk in the right way and do excellent work but let us pass from this little digression and consider what is most beautiful and most rare in jewellery a digression merely entered into because i don't want ignorant men to jeer at me for having said nothing of the ballas and the topaz the ballas is a ruby with but little colour as if it were a kind of feminine form of the stone called in the west the ballas ruby but it is of the same hardness and so a gem of the nature of the ruby and differing from it only as to cost the like holds good with the topaz in its relationship to the sapphire it is of the same hardness as the sapphire and though of a different colour must be classified with the sapphire just as the ballus must be with the ruby what better classification do you want hasn't the air got its sun of these four sorts of stones the ruby the sapphire the emerald and the diamond you must know that the first is far the most costly 
a ruby for instance of five grains of wheat and of as fine a fire as you could wish would be worth about eight hundred golden scudi and an emerald of the same size and beauty would run to about four hundred similarly a diamond would be worth a hundred and no more while a sapphire would fetch about ten these few facts i thought might be worth having to all those many youths always springing up and eager to learn the beautiful art of the goldsmith to be sure they ought to begin learning as soon as they can toddle and use that greatest of all opportunities which is afforded by apprenticeship to some master of renown whether in rome in venice or in paris in all of them did i sojourn for a long while and in all of them did i see and handle many and invaluable pieces of jewellery end of section five section six of the treatises of benvenuto cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by benvenuto cellini translated by c r ashby this librivox recording is in the public domain the treatise on goldsmithing chapter five how to set a ruby we'll now continue our talk and consider the way of setting a ruby and the box of gold in which it has to be fitted this box whether in a pendant a ring or what not is always called the bezel what you have first of all to observe in the setting of the stone in this bezel is that the former must not be set too deep so as to deprive it of its full value nor too high so as to isolate it from its surrounding detail i mention this because i've seen mistakes made in both ways and i am certain that practising jewellers who have a right knowledge of drawing and design would not go wrong in either the one direction or the other so let us place our fine ruby into its bezel in order to what is technically called set it footnote legare and footnote we must provide ourselves with four or five ruby foils footnote literally leaves that are of themselves red and footnote of which some should be of so deep a glow that they seem quite dark and others differing in intensity till they have scarce any red in them at all with all these different specimens of foils before us we take hold of the ruby with a piece of hard black wax well pointed pressing the wax upon one of the projections of the stone then your good jeweller tries his ruby now upon this foil now upon that till his own good taste determines him which foil will give most value to his stone sometimes the jeweller will find it may help him to move the stone to and from the foil but he has to recollect that the air between the foil and the stone will always give an effect different to that afterwards given when the stone is set in the bezel where no air passes behind therefore your capable man places the cut foil in the setting at one time bringing it close at another interposing a space thereupon let him set his jewel with all the care taste and delicacy of which an able man is master End of section six. Section seven of the treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The treatise on goldsmithing, chapter six: How to set an emerald and a sapphire. Now, as to the emerald and the sapphire the same skill must be used with the foils adaptable to them as with those of the ruby and because i consider that practice always has come before theory in every craft and that the rules of theory in which your skilful craftsman is accomplished are always grafted on to practice afterwards i will give you a case in point of what once happened to me when i was setting a ruby of about three thousand scudi in value this ruby had when it came into my hands been very well set at different times by some of the best-known jewellers of the day so i was incited to work at it with all possible care seeing that i could in no way satisfy myself with the result of my efforts i locked myself up somewhere where no one could see me 
not so much because i didn't wish my secret to go further but because i did not want to be caught trying so mean an experiment upon so goodly and wonderful a gem i took a little skein of silk stained with kermes and with a pair of scissors cut it carefully having previously spread a little wax in the bezel then i took the tiny bit of silk and pressed footnote calci possibly i frayed and footnote pressed it firmly onto the wax with the point of a small punch then did i put my ruby upon it and so well did it make and such virtue did it gain that all the jeweller folk who had seen it first suspected me of having tinted it a thing forbidden in jewellery except in the case of diamonds of which more anon but for this ruby some of the jewellers asked me to say what kind of a foil i'd put behind it upon which i answered that i'd put no foil behind it at this reply of mine a jeweller who was with the gentleman to whom the ruby belonged said if the ruby has no foil you can't have done anything else but tint it some way or other and that you know is forbidden to which i replied again that i had neither given it a foil nor done anything forbidden to it at this the jeweller got a little nasty and used strong language at which the gentleman who owned the ruby said benvenuto i pray you be so good provided i pay you for it to open your setting and show it to me only i promise you i'll not tell any one your secret then said i to him that i had worked several days on the job and that i had my living to earn but that i would willingly do it if he paid me the price of the setting and moreover do it in the presence of all of them because i should be much honoured in thus being able to teach my teachers when i'd said this i opened the bezel and took out the stone in their presence they were very much obliged we parted very good friends and i got very well paid the ruby in question was a thick one and so limpid and luminous that all the foils you put beneath it gave it a sort of uncertain flash like that which shimmers from the girasol opal or the cat's eye two kinds of stones to which the dunderheads of whom i told before would also give the name of gems now a word about the emerald and the sapphire in both which gems one meets with the same peculiarities and difficulties as with the ruby so i know of but little to say about them than that they are stones that are often falsified which should be a warning to those who delight in gems or buy them whether to set or to keep there is a kind of indian ruby with as little colour as you can possibly imagine and i once saw a ruby of this nature falsified ever so cleverly by one of these cheats he had done it by smearing its base with dragon's blood which is a kind of composition made of a gum that will melt in the fire and that you can buy at any apothecaries in florence or rome well the cheat had smeared at the base of the stone with dragon's blood and then set it in such a way that it showed so well you would gladly have given a hundred golden scoody for it but without this colour it wouldn't have fetched ten and have been much more likely to come out of the setting but the colour looked so fine and the stone seemed so cunningly set that no one unless very careful would have spotted it it happened one day that i was with three old jewellers to whom i had expressed my doubts as to the genuineness of the stone so they made me unset the ruby and they stood round me greedily watching ready to pounce upon it as soon as i had done it they all three jeered at me for my wisdom and said another time i should open my eyes better for it was obvious that this stone was set by a good man who wouldn't do such a thing and who knew his business right well enough at these words of theirs i held out my hand and begged them to let me see and have proof of my mistake adding that if this time my good eyes had failed me it might be because i was less keen-sighted than they but i promised it shouldn't happen again when i had the ruby in my hand i soon saw with my sharp eyes what their dullness had missed and quickly taking a little steel tool i scraped off the bottom of the stone then might the ruby have been likened to the crow that tricked itself out in the feathers of the peacock 
I returned the stone to the jewellers and suggested to them that they would do well to provide themselves with eyes somewhat superior to those they were at present using. I couldn't resist saying this because all three of them wore great big gig lamps on their noses, whereupon they all three gaped at each other, shrugged their shoulders, and, with God's blessing, made off. You come across similar difficulties and occurrences with emeralds and sapphires, which I will omit, as I have other things of more importance to tell of. I mind me also of having seen rubies and emeralds made double, like red and green crystals stuck together, the stone being in two pieces, and their usual name is doppy or doublets. These false stones are made in Milan, set in silver, and are much in vogue among the peasant folk. The ingenuity of man has devised them to satisfy the wants of these poor people when they wish to make presents at weddings, ceremonies and so forth, to their wives, who of course don't know any difference between the real and the sham stone, and whom the little deceit makes very happy. Certain avaricious men, however, have taken advantage of a form of industry made partly for a useful and partly for a good end, and have very cunningly turned it to great evil. For instance, they have taken a thin piece of Indian ruby, and with very cunning setting have twisted and pieced together beneath it bits of glass, which they then fixed in this manner in an elaborate and beautiful setting for the ring or whatever it was and these they have subsequently sold for a good and first-class stone. And for as much as I don't tell you anything unless I can illustrate it by some practical example, I'll just mention that there was in my time a Milanese jeweller who had so cleverly counterfeited an emerald in this way that he sold it for a genuine stone and got 9,000 golden scudi for it. And this all happened because the purchaser who was no less a person than the King of England, uh, put rather more faith in the jeweller than he ought to have done. The fraud was not found out till several years later. Emeralds and sapphires are also manufactured out of single stones, and this so cleverly that they're often difficult to tell. But however wonderfully they're counterfeited in colour, they are so soft that any good jeweller with the average amount of brains can easily spot them. I could tell you ever so much more about all this, but it must do for the present because I have to pass on to a lot of other important and useful things. End of section 7「Section 8 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 7, How to Make Foils for All Sorts of Transparent Jewels In order to make good foils for jewels, it is essential to have steel tools, and all of the best and of the most finished description. Then, as you may suppose, for an undertaking of such importance you need the greatest possible care and patience, together with the greatest possible neatness. Long ago, when I was a lad of fifteen and began to learn goldsmithery, I knew a master in the art whose name was Salvestro del Lavacchio. This man only did stone setting and specialised on the making of his own foils for all sorts of gems. Though the foils from France and Venice and other places often showed up more splendidly, experience proved that they were not as lasting as Lavacchio's, which were always thicker. For this reason, the setting of the gems upon them was often more difficult than on the foreign foils, but so strong were they, and so telling to the gems, that as soon as they became a bit known, he got orders from all over the world and soon had no time for anything else but foil making. Indeed, it requires all a man's energies to do this, so I thought I would give a few facts about it for the benefit of anyone anxious to learn. The first foil is called the common foil. It is of a yellow colour and is used for many jewels and transparent stones. But first a word as to the weight of a carrot, which is a weight of four grains. The foils can be stated in weights thus. Common yellow foil, nine carats of fine gold, 18 carats of fine silver, 72 carats of fine copper. 
blue foil, sixteen carats of fine copper, four carats of fine gold, two carats of fine silver. Red foil, twenty carats of fine gold, sixteen carats of fine silver, eighteen carats of fine copper. Green foil, ten carats of fine copper, six carats of fine silver, one carat of fine gold. Melt the copper well first, and then put in the two other metals. When they're well mixed, cast them into a fairly long ingot mould, and don't make it too thick. Footnote. Logita in uno canale un poco largo e non fare la verga molto grosso. End footnote. When it's cast, let it cool, then file it well, after which beat it very lightly and with the broad end of a hammer, often heating it again as you go on, but putting it in water, not cooling it with the bellows. And when you've beaten it down to about the thickness of two knife-backs, flatten it with a strong rounded scraper, and pare off the edges quite smoothly till no crack remain. Then, when you're spreading it out, See that both it and your hammer be even, smooth, and burnished, and with every possible care make it as thin as you can, as, according to its nature, the metal will rend. The size of it should be about a couple of fingers, or a little longer, and the square should be of such dimensions as your metal will afford. Also mind that the size is such as you propose to make when your work is completed. But as in beating it will rend and crack, See that you watch this and cut it accordingly, and to the utmost thinness possible, and all these pieces you must blanch, clean, and polish with tartar. Footnote. Gomma. End footnote. Salt and water, which is the blanching liquor ordinarily used for silver. Then wash in clean water, rub with a clean rag lightly, and then scrub it on a big copper tube that must be very clean and shining. See that you scrape it with the sharpest of all possible goldsmith's scrapers, and do this with the greatest care, in order that you do not mark it with notches. Then take it with a very clean and white cloth, and have by you a graver that shall be well sharpened on an oilstone, and clean off everything in the nature of grease or dirt. It is needful, when burnishing it, to be in a room where there is no dirt. Get a black hematite stone. Footnote, amatita nera. End footnote. Such as the sword cutlers use for burnishing gold. When you have polished it very well, give it its colour. This you do over a moderate and clean fire, keeping your piece of foil near the said fire, and take care that of the two sides, the unburnished one turns to the fire. Gradually you will see the colour come, according as it takes the heat. It is necessary to vary the colour as need requires. Pope Clement gave me the commission to make a button for his cope. Footnote, this great piece, perhaps Cellini's masterpiece, was melted down in the present century. End footnote. This morse I made about the size of an ordinary plate, but because of all its wealth of figure work, I had better talk of that later when I treat of embossing and the many difficulties of that art. For the present, I will consider only the jewels with which it was enriched. In the middle of the morse I set a diamond, the facets of which were cut starwise to a point, for which Pope Julius II had given 36,000 ducats of the camera. I set the stone quite free, azure, between four claws. In this manner did it seem to me to make better. I had given this setting a good deal of thought, but the stone was of such exceptional beauty that it caused me much less trouble than costly stones of similar character are wont to do. True, some jewellers were of a mind that it would be better to tint the whole base of the stone and the black facets. Footnote, padiglioni, or in English, pavilions. End footnote. But with my good results I got them to see that it was much better thus. Together with the diamond and around it were two large ballas rubies and two big sapphires, splendid stones, and four emeralds of a goodly size. To all these stones did I apply those same careful methods of which I have spoken above, 
thereby satisfying not only the pope but also the practising artists for previously at the beginning of the work and before i set to at the diamonds and the other stones for they were right difficult to handle certain old fossils in the art had part in envy part speaking true sought to scare me away from the job footnote spaventavano and footnote verily said they we know you to be sure enough in all that pertains to design and to the embossing of an excellent piece of work but when you set to the tinting and arranging of such costly jewels why twill make the teeth chatter in your head with fright now i'm not the sort of fellow who's afeard of any mortal thing but i must say that this somewhat emphatic way of expressing their astonishment made me pause a bit but i minded me of those gifts from god himself and which come to a man without any toil of his own comeliness for instance or strength or handiness and to me methought god had given surety of purpose so much was this so that i could afford to turn laughing away from all their silly prattle the tale of phoebus came to my mind and how at the outset he had sought to fright his son phaeton from wishing to guide the chariot of the sun but then you see when all was done i was luckier than phaeton for i did not break my neck but came out of it with much honour and profit to myself End of section eight. Section 9 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 8, On the Cutting of a Diamond. As we have now said enough of the three gems, ruby, emerald, and sapphire, we must, perforce, consider at greater length the diamond. Now, though the diamond is said to be kin to water let no man suppose that this need imply an absence of colour perfume and taste such as would be the case in good water just as water may have both colour perfume and taste even so the diamond not that the diamond actually has perfume or taste but it has colours as many as nature herself I propose here only to mention two, and these diamonds about as splendid as it's possible to imagine. The first was a stone I came across in the reign of Pope Clement, a diamond literally flesh-coloured, most tender, most limpid. It scintillated like a star, and so delightful was it to behold that all other diamonds beside it, however pure and colourless, seemed no longer to give any pleasure and to lose their gratefulness. The second was a stone I saw in Mantua. It was green, and green such as you might see in a very pale emerald. But it shone just like any diamond, and as no emerald ever shone. Indeed, it seemed the most glorious of all emeralds. Though I have seen all imaginable colours in diamonds, the mention of these two may suffice. Now, for just a word about the cutting of the diamond, that is to say, on the changing of the stone from its roughness into those lovely shapes so familiar to us, the table, the faceted, and the point. Footnote. In tavola a facette e in punta. End footnote. Diamonds you can never cut alone. You must always do two at a time on account of their exceeding hardness. No other stone can cut them. It is a case of diamond cut diamond this you do by means of rubbing one against the other until a form is obtained such as your skilful cutter may wish to produce and with the diamond powder that falls from them in the process the final polish is subsequently given for this purpose the stones are set in little cups of pewter footnote piombo e stagno End footnote and held against the wheel by means of certain little pinches prepared on purpose and they are thus held with their dust mixed with oil. The steel wheel upon which the diamonds are cut and finished should be about the thickness of a finger, and the size of an open hand, and of the finest steel excellently tempered. 
this wheel is fastened to a hand mill and turned round as fast as it's possible to turn it four to five diamonds or even six can be applied to the wheel at the same time and by bringing to bear a sufficiently heavy weight you can increase the pressure of the diamonds upon the wheel and give greater grip to the dust which wears them away and so they're finished i could tell you a deal more and all about the ways of cutting but because it's not my own craft i will not bore you with it tis sufficient for me to have given a general sketch of the method in question to return however to the subject we have at hand i will say something of the tinting of the diamond of its setting in gold and of the variation between one stone and another on account of the above mentioned colours however great the variety of these colours is the wondrous hardness of the stone is similar in all cases or at least the variation is so slight that the process of cutting is the same with the greatest possible care will i show how i set about making tints for diamonds and give likewise a number of instances on various exceptional occasions that i have come across in diamonds of great importance it is only owing to experiences such as i have passed through that one is able satisfactorily to show the great difficulties that stand in the way of those who wish to make them fine settings i will begin with one occasion when pope paul the third of the house of farnese was given a diamond by the emperor charles v it was when he returned from the capture of tunis and paid a visit to the pope in rome the diamond in question was purchased in venice by certain servants of the emperors for twelve thousand scudi and it was set merely in a plain and simple bezel with a little claw footnote gambo End footnote. in this fashion it was given by the emperor to the pope as soon as he visited him and i heard tell that he gave it as a sign of his goodwill and friendliness the latter receiving it courteously with the same spirit now for as much as the pope for a month previously had ordered a present to be prepared for the emperor worthy to pass between them he had held much counsel on the matter with many and so called for me and asked me in the presence of his counsel but quite privately to give him my opinion on the matter i straightway said that inasmuch as the pope was the veritable head of the christian religion and the veritable vicar of christ the most fitting gift from the pope to the emperor seemed to me to be a fine christ of gold set upon a ground of lapis lazuli an azure stone from which they make ultramarine the foot of this crucifix i said should be of gold and set with jewels and of such value as should please his holiness and because i had with great care already executed three gold figures that might serve for the base of this cross and because they symbolised faith hope and charity and were already completed the suggestion pleased the pope mightily and he bade me set to and make a model of what i proposed for him to see at this model i wrought for a day and a half and then brought it to him completed pleased as he had been at my suggestion he was simply delighted when he saw the model and determined to give me the job we clinched the bargain in no time i was paid the earnest money and bidden to bestir myself i strained every nerve to bring this beautiful work to being but so it was i was hindered from finishing by certain beasts who had the vantage of the pope's ear tis a thing that often happens this with all princes the worst men in the whole court are often the best listened to and these fellows believe for them what they don't even believe themselves one of these men whispered such evil things into the pope's ear that he got him to believe that it would be better to make a present to the emperor of a breviary of the virgin in miniature that had been made for the cardinal hippolytus de medici as a gift to the lady julia gonzaga that this little book should be bound in a cover of fine gold set with what variety of stones might please his holiness and that the emperor would like this much better because he could make a present of it to his wife the empress and so it came that the pope got so gammoned that he was dissuaded from the crucifix and bade me make the little book which i accordingly did footnote 
the illustration given is probably not of the breviary in question but it is a reasonable cellini attribution End footnote. when the emperor arrived in rome i had not yet put the finishing touches on the book because it took some time before they made up their minds about it none the less the cover was visible as it had all been put together and it looked splendid with all its gorgeous jewels set upon it then the pope sent to let me know that i must have it in order as well as i possibly could within three or four days as he wanted to show it incomplete as it was to the emperor and that he would excuse me to the latter for not having completed it on the plea of illness as for that i would speak of it in its place after this the pope with his own hands gave me the diamond he'd received from the emperor told me to take the measure of his forefinger and make him a ring as richly wrought as possible and as quickly as ever i could off i hurried to my workshop and with the greatest dispatch and in the space of two days produced as rich a ring as was ever made now pope paul had waiting in attendance on him a number of milanese who patronised a certain milanese jeweller gaio by name this gaio came before the pope and all off his own bat without ever having been as much as asked holy father quoth he your holiness knows that by profession i am a jeweller and that i am better skilled at my craft than any man ever born now your holiness has given benvenuto a diamond to set and the diamond is one of the most difficult stones in the whole world to set and this particular diamond is more difficult than any other diamond and it's a very beautiful stone and a very costly stone and withal a very delicate stone and benvenuto is a very young man and though he is enthusiastic enough about his art and apt enough at his work the tinting of so precious a stone is rather too tough a bone for tender gums like his in my opinion your holiness would do well to commission two or three old and tried jewellers to go and look benvenuto up and not let him tint the diamond without their advice it was a jeweller called milano larghetta of venice your holiness who tinted and set the stone as your holiness has it at present this was an old man and never did any one better know how to fix foils and tint stones weary of this plaguy babbler the pope told him he might go and do what he liked and thought best so off the fellow went to look for raffaello del moro the florentine and guaspari romanesco both of them men of great cunning in the manner of jewels with these two he came to my shop on behalf of the pope then did he begin to babble so tiresomely that i could scarce contain myself the other two talked sense and were decently civil so i turned to them in my politest manner explained to them my views and begged them to let me have a couple of days to prepare a few tints to try this lovely stone for this could only do good in the first place by trying a few rare tints for the diamond i might be able not only to teach myself but lure on others who were following the art and in the next place the stone might so gain at my cost that it might delight them do the pope a service and bring much credit to me all the time i was giving them my reasons that insolent beast of a gallo kept fidgeting about with his feet and his head and his hands ever and anon interjecting the most irritating words so that i very nearly lost my temper altogether but the others men of sense they managed it so that i got the time i asked for as soon as they were gone i set to like anything to make my tints and this is how i did it end of section nine Section 10 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 9. How You Tint a Diamond. Take a very clean lamp with its cotton wick as white as possible, its oil too should be old, sweet and clear, then stand it on the ground, or if you like, between two bricks on the top of the two bricks put a concave copper disc its upper surface cleanly polished and its under surface acted upon by the flame to a third part of it but not more 
be careful that only a very little soot collects on the disc at a time, because if too much soot comes, it may catch fire and be no use to you. Then, from time to time, while the flame smokes, take a little smooth paper and brush the smoke soot off the disc into a clean vessel. You may know that the soot doesn't catch fire till it grows to a coat the thickness of two big knife backs, so you needn't fear to let it smoke itself to a thickness of one knife back at a time. Then you take mastic, footnote, the varnish resin commonly called gum mastic, end footnote, a sort of gum that every apothecary sells, not, however, too fresh. You may know the fresh gum by its being bright and pale. On the other hand, it mustn't be too old, and the old gum you will know by its being yellow and dry and of little substance. When you've chosen the right sort of mastic, neither too fresh nor too dry, you proceed to select from it the roundest and cleanest grains, because... You know, when they fall from the tree, they are apt to absorb earth and other impurities. All this done, as I've told, you put a little pan of live charcoal on the bench and heat at it some small pointed steel instrument, with which you proceed to spike one of the mastic grains, not, however, spiking it right through the middle. This you then hold nearer and nearer to the fire till it begins to get hot, when you quickly with a little spittle on your fingers, squeeze the hot mastic grain, the result of this squeezing will be a teardrop, as limpid and pure as you can possibly imagine. Then quickly cut it off with a pair of scissors from the dirty part of the grain, and save it in a clean place. This process you repeat till you have as many mastic tears as you need. Then you set to and make your linseed oil, and this is how you do it. You pick out the cleanest and best grains, grains without insect holes and perfect, and place a handful at a time on a porphyry stone, or a very clean copper or iron plate. On this you spread the grains, and place over them an iron plate about one finger thick and five fingers square, this plate having been previously heated so that it would singe paper, but no hotter. To the weight of it you add the pressure of some great hammer, and then you will soon begin to see the oil oozing out of the grains. But you must mind that your iron is neither too hot nor too cold, for if it be too cold, the oil won't ooze out, and if too hot, it'll be scorched up and bad. But if well tempered, the oil will be admirable. Then, ever so carefully, you lift up the plate and the grains, and with a clean knife, scrape off the oil. You have also to note that what is first pressed from the grain is a little water. This you will tell by its running to the edges of the stone, while the genuine oil remains in the middle. Then you take the oil and put it into a clean glass vase. Next, you have also to provide a little sweet almond oil, and some folk use olive oil two years old, not more, and very sweet and clean. Then you want a spoon about four times the size of an ordinary spoon, and have in readiness your pan of live charcoal. You put your teardrops of mastic into the spoon, and with a very clean silver or copper spoon, you begin to melt them over the fire. When your mastic is melting, you add a little of the grain oil to it, in proportion about one part of linseed to six of mastic, and so mix the two liquids together, then apply the third, be it oil of olive or almond. After they're fused, you add a little purified turpentine, and finally the lamp black you prepared to begin with, putting just so much and no more as you need for your tint. Diverse sorts of diamonds require some a darker, some a lighter tint. Some again need a softer, some a harder tint. And so it's necessary, whenever you're setting a diamond of great importance, to try it with the hard and the soft, or with the dark and the light, in accordance with the quality of the stone and the judgment of the good jeweller. Some have put as little lamp black as possible when tinting a diamond that seemed too yellow, and have instead mixed with their tint indigo, a blue colour known to every painter. 
they have even let indigo entirely take the place of lampblack and this did they do when they tinted a diamond that looked like clear topaz in these cases was a dark tint applied with admirable effect and for this reason by mixing the two colours blue and yellow they make green hence the yellow diamond with the blue tint made an admirable water and if it be well applied it becomes one colour neither yellow as heretofore nor blue owing to the virtue of the tint but a variation in truth most gracious to the eye inasmuch as all stones have then to be treated in accordance with the ability of the master and the quality of the stone the cunning with which you treat them will depend on the amount of your experience in the art applied to each particular stone and each several occasion now to return to that big diamond a notable example of its kind that i set for pope paul and which i had only to tint because the setting was already made as i told you i had asked raffaello guaspari and gaio to allow me some two days space during this time i made a set of experiments in tints and by great labour produced a composition which made a much finer effect beneath the diamond than had been made by the master miliano targhetta and when i had made sure that i had beaten so admirable a man what did i do but set to work anew with still greater energy to see if i could not beat even myself as i told you above this particular diamond was a most peculiarly difficult one to manage because of its subtlety footnote sottile i e the refinement of the water and the good jeweller is he who produces his effect with the tint alone without having recourse to the reflector footnote specchietto End footnote. about which i shall have occasion to speak in its place when i had quite satisfied myself i sent to fetch the three old jewellers and when they arrived i had arranged all my tints in order for them when the three appeared that presumptuous gaio marched into the shop first and seeing all my apparatus neatly ranged about for the purpose of tinting the stone in their presence he straightway began wagging his head pumping about with his hands and chattering benvenuto said he all this is mere silliness mere bagatelle you just turn up again that tint of master miliano's and apply it and don't lose any time about it because we haven't any to waste owing to all the important commissions we have to execute for the pope at this raffaello seeing that i was just about to fly into a most terrible passion interposed he was a good fellow was raffaello and also the oldest of them and he began to say soothing words to me encouraging things and such like and so just calmed me in time the other man also master guaspari romanesco in order to put a damper on that beast of a gallo he too began saying things funny things which didn't come off because i wasn't in a mood for funny things after a bit perceiving that i was getting to be a source of quarrel between the three men i turned to them and spake thus god almighty said i with the gift of speech granted to mortals four different ways of expressing themselves and these are they the first is called to reason which means to explain the reason of things in a sensible way the second is called to talk which means to make words words of good import that is and which if they don't explain the reason of things may yet be in the way of doing so the third is called to chatter and that means to say things of little value funny things that sometimes please and that don't hurt you the fourth is just to grasshopper gabble footnote chicolare as the chatter of birds a murmur of neither concord nor discord End footnote. grasshopper gabble and nothing more and that's what people do who haven't got any sense in their heads at all and want to show it off as much as they can so my good friends i will just reason with you and expound to you my reasons master raffaello of a sooth has talked elegant words sound words master guaspari to cheer us up has chatted a few amiable and funny things none of which have got anything to do with what we have in hand gaio what has he done 
white just drivelled in the most sickening way but since his grasshopper gabble hasn't done me any special injury i'm not going to lose my temper over him and shall just take no notice of him at all so now i pray you gentlemen just to let me tint the diamond in your presence and if my tint does not turn out better than master miliano's i can still use his and i have shown you how at least i have tried my best to improve it scarce had i finished these words of mine when that beast of a gallo called out so according to this i'm a driveller am i whereupon the good raffaello began soothing him down with amiable words till the beast got a bit pacified i meantime set to work with my tints upon the diamond raffaello and guaspari were all agog to see me tint the diamond and first i tinted it with my own tint the first one and this showed up so well that they were in doubt as to whether or not i had not surpassed that of miliano and they praised me abundantly then raffaello turned to gallo and said you see gallo that benvenuto's tint even if it has not surpassed miliano's makes a close second and so tis always right to give encouragement to a young man like benvenuto who tries to do well i turned to him thanked raffaello for his pleasant words and said now my good friends will take out my tint and in your presence put in master miliano's and then shall we be better able to judge on which the diamond makes best i quickly took out mine and put in miliano's raffaello and guaspari said that the stone showed better with mine and all three said that i should reapply my tint as rapidly as i could before the impression was lost to their eyes whereupon i replaced mine quickly and handed it them all three were agreed and gallo before all his ass's face quite beaming up and they declared most amiably that i was a clever fellow that i had good reasons for my action and that i had beaten master miliano's tint by a long way a thing they never imagined possible at this i made a bow not without a little pride but so as not to be noticed and said to them dear masters since you have vouchsafed me such kind encouragement to so good an end i am only too ready on my part to be judged by you and since you admit that i have beaten miliano will you now decide whether or not i have beaten myself only just give me a quarter of an hour's grace therewith i left them and went up to the attic of my house where i had all in order that i wanted to what i did there i'll tell you now i've not told it any one yet and it brought me such honour in this diamond but it does not necessarily succeed in others and cannot be done without much labour and experience i took a fair-sized grain of mastic cleared it well of its skin as i told above so that it was as pure and bright as possible and with all imaginable delicacy having well cleaned the diamond spread it over the stone with the aid of a moderate fire then i let it cool holding it tight with the tongs used for tinting when dry and cool i had my black tint ready spread the same carefully and before a gentle heat on the top of the clear coat of mastic this method suited so well to the tenderness and peculiar water of the diamond in question that it seemed to remove from it any internal imperfections and make of it a stone of perfect quality then down i ran and put it into master raffaello's hand he uttered an expression of astonishment like you do when you see a miracle the two others guaspari and gallo likewise expressed amazement only more so and praised me up to the skies gallo even so far let himself down as to begging my pardon then they said to me all three of them together twelve thousand scudi was the worth of this diamond before but of a truth it's worth twenty thousand now we shook hands amicably and parted the best of friends end of section ten section eleven of the treatises of benvenuto cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by benvenuto cellini translated by c r ashby this librivox recording is in the public domain the treatise on goldsmithing chapter ten how to give a diamond its reflector 
in order not to leave out any of the few things that i have mastered we'll now discuss what is termed the reflector of the diamond footnote specchietto and footnote this reflector is put beneath such diamonds as are so delicate as not to be able to stand a dark tint such as would turn them black if it happen that their delicacy is not great and their water is good it is customary to give them the tint under the step facets alone and to combine the reflector with this and the result is admirable the reflector is made in this wise you take a small piece of crystal glass quite clean and free from cracks or flaws you cut it into a square of the size that shall fit into the bezel in which you propose to set your diamond and you tint your bezel with the black tint of which we spoke above be careful to put the said reflector the glass of which is tinted on the lower side only in the bottom of the bezel low enough to admit of the diamond standing over but not touching it because if it does it will not reflect well this is how all the tenderest diamonds should be set and beautiful they look too beryls and white topazes and white sapphires white amethysts and citrine quartz footnote chitrini and footnote are all set in the bezel with a reflector of this kind if they are of a sufficiently important size it must be borne in mind that no stones but diamonds will stand a tint at the back because they turn black and lose their splendour so much for the reflector it's an extraordinary thing that the diamond which is the most limpid and brilliant of all earthly stones gains a thousandfold in beauty when you as it were soil it with a black tint while all the other light stones as soon as you touch them with a tint lose their splendour and turn black forsooth this is owing to some occult power some secret of nature in the diamond which human imagination cannot penetrate there are certain sapphires which the ingenuity of man can turn white by putting them in a crucible in which gold is to be melted footnote nel quale sia dell'oro che sabbia astrugere and footnote and if not at the first heating than at the second or third indeed your cunning gem setter will always pick the palest sapphires because though they have the least colour they are the hardest in substance the same holds good of topazes which are of similar hardness to sapphires and so may be classified with them i propose here only to touch on these two stones in so far as they have kindred qualities to the diamond there are few then however great their experience when having before them the two stones could tell which of the two was the diamond often being unable to distinguish them at first sight the peculiar virtue of the diamond however admits of the trying of a simple experiment by which you can at once distinguish one stone from another and it's this you take your tint and rub both stones with it your true diamond grows in brilliance and beauty the other becomes deadened and splendourless and this test suffices without trying the test of hardness too but if you rubbed the two stones together you would soon find out the diamond though the sapphire is so much harder than the ruby and the emerald it is a thousand times less so than the diamond by the way i need hardly mention that it would be absurd to test a polished gem by the above method that's as much as i want to say about the diamond End of section 11section 12 of the treatises of benvenuto cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by benvenuto cellini translated by c r ashby this librivox recording is in the public domain the treatise on goldsmithing chapter 11 about white rubies and carbuncles i promised to tell you something about the finest sort of rubies but before doing this i want you to know something about another sort of ruby called the white ruby this stone is white by nature not by any heating process like the other stones mentioned above 
and its whiteness may be likened to the chalcedony the twin sister of the cornelian the latter has a sort of unpleasing livid pallor and for this reason is not used much i have oft found many such in the bellies of wild fowl so also the loveliest turquoises i used to be very fond of going out shooting i made my own powder and became such a rare fine shot that i should be ready to stand any test you like i always shot with the simple ball and as for the powder well i'll talk of that in its right place but it was quite different from the powder commonly used in this wise did i used to march over the roman campagna at the time when the birds of passage return and in their bellies i found stones of all sorts turquoises white and coloured rubies also emeralds and every now and again a pearl but as i said these white rubies are of very little use only you know them for rubies because of their great hardness of carbuncles according to promise i'll tell you of these and first of what i have seen with my own eyes in the time of pope clement the seventh there turned up a certain raugio who was called biagio de bono this man had a white carbuncle similar to the white ruby mentioned above but possessing so delightful a brilliance that it shone in the dark not so splendidly perhaps as the coloured carbuncles but still so that when you put it into a very dark place it seemed as a glowing ember and this did i see with my own eyes but i must tell you in this connection an anecdote of a little old roman gentleman old did i say nay very old for his grandson was one of my shop assistants this man came often to my place and always had lots of pretty things to chat about one fine day we fell a-talking about gems and the old gentleman spake thus once when i was a young man i had to be in the palazzo colonna and i saw one jacopo cola a distant kinsman of mine coming along he was beaming all over and he held out his closed fist to some friends who had been sitting on a bench hard by and were just getting up he spake thus to them what do you think my friends i've made a good day to-day for i've found a little stone so beautiful that it's worth many scoody and i found it in my vineyard and i suppose it must have belonged to our ancestors because as you know this vineyard lies beneath the great ruins familiar to all of you well when i was coming home from work and had gone about two hundred yards i was prompted to make water as i was doing this and looking towards the vineyard i fancied i saw a spark glowing at the foot of one of my vines it seemed to me a perfect age before i could finish what i was about when i did i'm blessed if i could find anything however hard i tried so i thought i'd go back again and have another look and keep my eyes fixed upon it so back i went the same way and then all of a sudden out burst the spark again well i kept looking and looking at it till see here i found this so saying he opened his fist and showed his treasure while he had been talking a venetian ambassador who was coming along on his mule with a few servants had stopped to listen after a bit this gentleman came up close as if he wanted to hear all about this wonder of a fire being transformed into a stone then very politely accosting my poor kinsman gentlemen said he if i am not presuming upon you or appear to be taking too great a liberty might i beg of this gentleman to allow me to look at the beautiful stone that he says he found in his vineyard at these words cola opened his fist which he had kept locked up tight and said to the ambassador there he is look at him as much as you like the venetian gentleman who was a man of perfect manners continued with the politest language if i am not appearing too presumptuous he said i would make so bold as to ask if you sir are disposed to part with the stone and if so at what you esteem its value the poor roman whose coat was somewhat frayed and out at elbows a fact which had given the venetian pluck to drive his bargain said well it isn't exactly that i've got to sweat for my daily bread but if you're ready to pay the stone's value i don't mind obliging you look at him well now and see if you like him 
i shall require ten ducats of the camera for him the venetian simpered satisfaction for a bit and then spake in the fashion of those polished gentlemen much more polished than your roman who though they are examples to the world in glory are not up to your consummate venetian in speech they can't out with it fast enough one favour only i beg of you i never carry much money in my purse only i entreat you to send the jewel to me by some trusty servant of yours and i will give him what you've asked the poor roman who knew no trustier friend than himself said he would go along with him personally and winking to one of his mates to whom he told all his adversity he strode off with the ambassador who dismounted and walked beside him then the venetian in order to prevent the latter from repenting of his bargain began chatting in the most delicious manner in a manner such as only your venetian can and enough to take any roman's breath away the one listened enjoying these exquisite nothings the other prattled along as hard as he could the journey really seeming an eternity to him at length he reached his house and putting his hand into a purse in which he had a great pile of ducats of the camera he spread them out with open hand before the astonished gaze of the poor roman the latter who had gone many a long year without seeing the like of such feasted his eyes on the delicious looking gold and then put the jewel in the ambassador's hand one two three the latter counted out the ten ducats shouting in haste to his servants that they should saddle his good horse and taking out two more ducats called out to the roman who was just going off here i say these two gold ducats i give you over and above our bargain to buy a rope to hang yourself with the proud roman couldn't make out why he was thus spoken to he fired up and wanted to make for the ambassador but our fine gentleman quickly mounted his horse and sped away from rome later on it transpired that he had had the jewel perfectly set and gone off with it to constantinople where a new prince had ascended the throne owing to the rarity of the stone he asked and received for it a fabulous sum with which he afterwards betook himself again to venice that's all i ever heard of this kind of carbuncle End of section 12section thirteen of the treatises of benvenuto cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by benvenuto cellini translated by c r ashby this librivox recording is in the public domain the treatise on goldsmithing chapter twelve minutery work minutery work is all that class of work done with the punch such as rings and pendants and bracelets in my time too it was the custom among other charming things to make little medals of gold which were worn in the hat or the cap and on these medals portraits were engraved in low or half relief and in the round and they looked just lovely the greatest master in this art that i ever knew lived in the times of the popes leo adrian and clement and he was caradosso of whom i told you above now will i tell you not only of the method which he adopted in his craft but that which was employed by other masters it was caradosso's custom to make a little model in wax of the form he wished his work to be when he had carefully finished the modelling of this and filled in all the undercutting he made a cast of it in bronze of the proper thickness then he beat out a gold leaf rather thicker if anything in the middle and so as to admit of its being easily bent and in surface some two knife-backs bigger than the surface of the model this he proceeded to beat out into a slightly curved form and to soften with heat and then laid on to the bronze model and with punches of the right sort wooden ones to begin with of birch or cornel footnote cornus sanguinea or dogwood End footnote. the latter by preference he very very carefully followed the shape of his figure or whatever it was he was working on ever so much care is necessary while doing this to prevent the gold from splitting and on you work now with your wooden now with your steel punches sometimes from the back sometimes from the front ever most mindful to keep an equal thickness throughout 
for if it become thicker in one place than in another the work would not attain so fine a finish it was just in this very getting of the gold so equal all over that i never knew a man to beat caradosso well then when you've got your model worked up to the point of relief at which you want to bring it you begin with the greatest cunning to bring the gold together over the legs and over the arms and round behind the heads of the figures and the animals then if when all has been well worked together there is still a little bit of gold loose at the edges you carefully cut it off with a pair of scissors and the little bits that stick out at the back of the legs and arms and heads that is to say those in high relief are likewise ever so carefully beaten down by the way i ought to have told you that your gold must be good gold of at least twenty-two and a half carats but not quite twenty-three carat gold for you'd find that a bit too soft to work in and if it were less than twenty-two and a half it would be too hard and rather dangerous to solder and now for the soldering if you've brought your work on so far for this same hot soldering you take a little verdigris the best you can get from its original cake nor must it ever have been used before and it should be about the size of a young hazelnut without its rind with it you put the sixth part of salts of ammonia and as much borax when these three substances are well pounded together you dissolve them in a glass of clear water then with a soft wood shaving you take the mixture which will now have the substance of a paint and spread wherever there are joint lines on arms legs heads or on the ground of your work after this you pepper a little more well-pounded borax upon them out of your borax caster and then light a fresh fire of partly consumed wood coal and put your work in the fire see that your coals are set with their unconsumed sides away from it as they are apt to smoke this done erect a little grating of coal on top of your work minding however that the charcoal does not touch the work itself be ready at hand when the charcoal is beginning to glow and your work is growing fire-coloured to blow wind over it with your bellows very skilfully and very evenly so that the flames may play all round it alike if you blow too hard the fire will spring up and burst into flame and you run the risk of melting and spoiling your work watching with care you will see the outer skin of gold begin to glow and then to move as soon as you note this quickly take a brush and sprinkle a little water on your work which will there and then be beautifully soldered without any need of special solder being applied to it and this one might call the first firing indeed the first soldering ought not to be called soldering at all but rather firing in one piece because there is so much virtue in the verdigris when combined with the salts of ammonia and the borax that it only moves the outer skin of gold and so fuses footnote e con quello stesso lo amarginano a tale che viene a essere per tutto una equal durezza and footnote it together that it all grows to one even strength after this you put your work into vinegar very strong and clean and mixed with a little salt and in this you let it bide overnight next morning you find it bright and free of all borax after this you put a little stucco at the back of it so that you can work on it with your punches and this stucco you make of greek pitch resin with a little yellow beeswax together with a little brick dust or well-ground terracotta and this is the real right sort of stucco on which you may lay your medals or any other similar work you may have to chase then as to your punches you must have no end of these from the broadest getting smaller and smaller down to the very tiniest and every one of these must have no sort or kind of cutting edge because you see they're only to be used for the purpose of beating in and not of taking away and this beating in you have to do ever so delicately 
now of a sooth shall you find that in the doing of this you will have made lots of little holes and rents and these same have got to be soldered up not mark you in the way you did it before but by the making of a special solder and in this wise you take six carats of pure and fine gold and put with it one and a half carats of fine silver and of fine copper melting the gold first and then putting the others to it and so you have your solder and with it you may make good all your holes and rents note further that at every fresh soldering you must introduce a fresh alloy of silver and copper footnote or it might be rendered you must put in the ready-made solder a little of the alloy which is softer in the fire each new soldered piece having to be softer than the last to avoid the running again of the earlier work the alloy is presumably half copper and half silver though cellini does not say so elsewhere he talks of one copper and two silver so it might well be one carat of silver and the half carat of copper End footnote. so as to prevent the solder of the time before from running together and so on too in between each turn out you take your work press it on the stucco and chase over it with your punches until you have wrought it to such finish as you may desire and then you have the whole fair method of the master caradosso of whom i told you before now i'll tell you of another fine way of working employed by other able men who ran him pretty close after the model in wax has been made and you have decided what it is you want to create you take a sheet of gold as i explained above thin at the sides and thick in the centre and you little by little beat it from the back with your larger punches until it is bossed up much like your model by this means you don't need to use your bronze footnote occorre adopterare il bronzo and footnote and you bring your work considerably forward before even in the other method the casting is done in the former method too you will have had before each rejoining to rub your metal down with glass paper such stuff as the glass makers sell in order to clean from it most carefully whatever matters the fumes from the bronze may have sullied the gold withal but if you follow my second method you won't need to do this glass papering because you won't be bothered by the nasty stains the bronze makes on the gold whenever i can while thus telling of my craft i purpose giving you a practical example which you know is always a much better way of explaining what a man means and which will make those of my readers who are eager to learn and to practice and delight themselves in these diverse methods much more likely to believe what they read in the manner above described i once fashioned a medal for a certain Gidolano moretta a sienese and on this medal was a hercules rending the jaws of the lion both hercules and lion had i wrought in such high relief that they only just touched the background by means of the tiniest attachments the whole work had been done in the second of the above methods that is to say without the bronze models now working them in front now from the reverse and brought to such a height of delicacy and finish of design that our mighty michelangelo himself came to my very workshop to see it and when he had looked at it a minute or so he in order to encourage me said if this work were made in great whether of marble or of bronze and fashioned with as exquisite design as this it would astonish the world and even in its present size it seems to me so beautiful that i do not think ever a goldsmith of the ancient world fashioned aught to come up to it these words stiffened me up just footnote me sapicorno adosso and footnote and gave me the greatest longing to work not only in the smaller things but to try larger things also for thought i words such as these coming from so great a man can but have the following meaning 
had the figures been tried on a large scale i should not have produced them with near such beauty as on a small and while on the one hand the great man gave me so much praise he on the other intimated that one who could do things in little of such merit might yet not be able to do them in great but still not so much because i imagined this to have been michelangelo's meaning as that i had heard that he had expressed it in words to others these words of his inspired me with longing to learn yet a thousand times more than i already knew this happened about a year after the sack of rome i was in florence at the time when i had made the medal one of our florentine gentlemen by name federigo genori came and looked me up he was a great lover of beautiful things and especially fond of men of talent to whom he was a great patron in former days he had been many years in naples on business and there he had fallen in love with a great princess on his return to florence he bethought him of having a medal made whereon to record this somewhat formidable attachment of his so he came and found me out and spake benvenuto my well-beloved i have seen a little medal by your hand made for girolamo moretta and albeit i long to tell you that it is impossible for any medal to cap that one yet for the love you bear me make another for me will you if not more than at least as beautiful as that one and in this medal i should like to see an atlas with the heavens on his back and i should like it all so exquisitely done that it shall be recognised at once and pray don't bother about any considerations of cost whatever i set to work and made a little model with all the diligence i could fashioning the atlas in question out of white wax then having said to the gentleman that he might leave the working out to me i determined to make a metal that should have a field of lapis lazuli the heavens a ball of crystal and engraven upon them the signs of the zodiac so i made a plate of gold and began bit by bit to work my figure up in relief with all the patience you can possibly imagine i took a small rounded stake footnote tacetino tondo and footnote and on this i wrought little by little working up the gold from the ground with a small hammer working right into arms and legs and making all alike of equal thickness in this manner and with the greatest diligence and patience i brought the work to completion this we call lavorare in tondo working in the round that is without putting the figure on pitch or such a stucco basis as i described above it wasn't till i'd worked it up to a certain point that i then took my punches and continued it on the stucco with very great finish then little by little did i raise the figure off its ground footnote spiccando dal suo campo and footnote which is a thing very difficult to explain how to do still i'll tell you as best i can previously we saw how the arms and legs of the figure might be worked as one and part of the gold background and thus make it possible for the background to be utilised as a fitting part of the design now however since the background is not needed as a part of the design it may be used up therefore with a small hammer on your little stake or anvil and with the small end of the hammer you work gently on the gold and with the action of the hand push the gold behind using the punches as well so that the figure comes up in high relief from the ground in the other method where you left the figures on the ground you didn't want them in high relief but took care that your fine ground never got out of line now however since you have no use for it you can twist it about at will care only being taken that sufficient gold is left for the attachments at the back and when all the background is cut away you can proceed to fix your figure on to whatever independent background you may have devised for it after this you give it a last coating of solder to finish up with but without however laying your work on the stucco for the simple reason that there are now no more open places for the stucco to go in 
this is how I did the atlas, and when I had finished him, I fixed him in those places where he was to touch the lapis lazuli background by means of fastening two little pins or stakes of gold of sufficient strength into holes made in the lapis, and so he was firmly set. Then I got a lovely crystal ball of good proportion to my atlas, engraved the zodiac thereon, and fixed it upon the nape of his neck, so that he held it high in his hands. To end all I made a most sumptuous frame adorned with gold, full of foliage, fruits, and other conceits, and set the whole of my work within it. Nor ought I to forget a very pretty sentiment that had to be added in the shape of a Latin motto. My gallant, inasmuch as he was enamoured of so great a lady, and of rank so much loftier than himself, wished me to place on the medal the words summam tu lisse juvat. Some say that this gentleman died shortly after, though still quite in his youth, by reason of his love for the lady. As he had been a friend of Messer Luigi Alamanni, also a great lover of art, the latter at his death came into possession of the medal, and he, while at a later time on a visit to the King of France, made a present of the medal to the King, then began the king to make most earnest inquiry as to whether he knew the master who had made the medal. Messer Luigi declared that he did not know him personally, albeit he was all along my very dear friend. King Francis thereupon began to have a great longing that I should come and enter his service, the which in the end I did. But of that I'll tell later on, all in its proper place, because that didn't happen till many years after. I promised to speak in good time of a clasp that I made for Pope Clement to fasten his cope with. Now, since I can't do your fine, elegant manner of writing, I'll tell about my craft as clearly as I can, and as well as my simple mind will permit it. And, best of all, I'll give some more examples of things that happen to me. I shall be much safer if I do that. This clasp was a very big and a very hard job, for, albeit a small piece of work, there is little doubt but that these small pieces of work are often harder the smaller they are. The clasp was about the size of an open palm, and circular in form. Within it was a design of God the Father giving the benediction. The head and arms of the Father were worked completely in the round, the rest was raised in good relief out of the background, and was surrounded by a number of jolly little angels, and of these some of them were peeping from out of his mantle, some were scattered about among jewels, of which I'll tell you first. These angel babies were some of them done completely in the round, others in high relief, others again in bas relief, and I so devised it that God the Father was seated on the big diamond, which had been bought, it was said, for thirty thousand scudi, this suggests the reflection as to how much harder it is for a man to do a piece of work in which his design is limited by having to use special jewels, or aught else in particular. Still, for all that, you can do anything if only you set to work at it with all the love and the zeal that your noble craft demands of you. And so did I, and this is how I did it. I flattened out a sheet of gold about a finger's width wider than my work was to be, having first made a very highly finished model of it. Then I began beating up the middle of the plate with my small hammers upon the stake, and now working with a narrow end on the front, now on the back, I gradually bossed up the gold, using the punches in like manner, till the figure little by little took shape, and so, little by little, first using one tool and then another, I gradually mastered the material, till one fine day God the Father stood forth in the round, most comely to behold. Pope Clement had got to hear that I worked in a method different from Caradosso, for certain envious men had told it to some of his suite, and by reason of their evil tongues the Holy Father imagined that I was an ignoramus, and not up to managing so big a job, so he sent for me to come and show him the method in which I worked, and how far I had got. 
straight away i went to him bringing with me my work as far as it had got god the father stood out from it already and showed very well how he was going to look when finished for my part i thought that the work in the metal excelled that in the wax and so thought his holiness also and being the sensible man that he was he turned to certain gentlemen of his suite and said great is the virtue of determination footnote e gran cosa la forza che ha la virtù and footnote the more she is troubled with envy the more beautiful doth she become and grows in despite thereof i know but little of the technique of the work but i am well assured that it is much more beautiful now than in the model i saw before only i can't for the life of me see how you're going to get that crowd of angels on to this disc without spoiling what you've done already on this i described to the pope the way in which i purposed to bring the angels to the fore one by one first those that were to be quite in the round then those of less relief working the gold up thick into the places where the highest relief was to be in fact just as i had worked up god the father and employing hammers and punches alternately now from in front now from the back and i showed him how the highest part of the relief was the hardest part of the work and how the great art was to get the gold of as equal thickness as possible all over of course i know quite well that our good master caradosso worked in a different way and indeed i have learnt many goodly things from him and for those who have learnt their craft tis easy to put two and two together but i am of opinion that caradosso's method of working on the bronze model would have been much more difficult to employ in this instance would have taken a much longer time would have needed ever so many botchings and solderings and would have run all the risks of the fire into the bargain thus my experience was that by employing the other method you got rid of all these difficulties and had your work done much quicker at these words of mine the good pope who was really an exceedingly capable man said go my benvenuto work in your own way finish it for me quickly and it shall be well for you and when from time to time i bid you come bring your work with you not that i may instruct you thereon but that i may have the joy of beholding such goodly handiwork as yours the age of a good prince whose delight is in the encouragement of all beautiful things is the age for men of talent and such a time came about in the days of the first cosimo de medici who was their great patron it was he who gave filippo brunellesco donatello and lorenzo ghiberti their opportunity filippo was as fine an architect as ever was donatello sculpted in marble and in bronze and even wrought wondrously in the difficult art of painting lorenzo ghiberti made the bronze gates of san giovanni that have no equal in the world then came lorenzo de medici under whom was developed michelangelo buonarotti most marvellous of men he had scarce given proof as yet of his great powers when god willed that he should be called to rome by pope julius the second who not only took pleasure in all that was beautiful but also understood it and so set bramante the architect to work bramante who though a painter of little credit had such a bent towards architecture in its grandest manner that good pope julius of his bountifulness gave him lots of work and a salary of a thousand scudi a year to boot seeing how fond pope julius was of all kinds of beautiful work and how he had a mind to have the inside of the sistine chapel painted bramante introduced michelangelo who was then living in rome almost unknown and of little account the work was entrusted to him and such goodly encouragement did he receive in the painting of that wonderful chapel that the grand manner of painting was as it were revived then came pope leo the tenth and at the same time francis king of france and these twain ran it hard between them as to which should gather the greatest talent about him then came the luckless pope clement 
and he helped and furthered the arts too tis true but he had so much adversity in his papacy and there was so much trouble in the land that he could never help as much as his kindly soul longed to do i know well to tell of this for i served him during all his papacy and was quite a young man at the time it was in connection with the work of which i have been telling you above that the pope said he wished to see the designs and models of all those who thought themselves able to undertake the work and this was soon after the great sack of rome and i had come thither from florence and when i heard the rumour of it i too made me a model in white wax of the size the work was to be and taking it with me presented myself before the pope many artists were there showing the sketches they had prepared for this beautiful commission and when i joined them the pope had already seen a goodly number and they were set before his holiness by one micheletto a stone carver an able man enough in his own line in all these diverse designs their authors had so devised it that the big diamond was set in the middle of the breast of god the father footnote see cellini's autobiography simmons translation and footnote the pope himself had suggested the motive of the design but when he saw how everybody alike had set so great a stone into the breast of so tiny a figure he said why can't that stone be set in some other manner except always in the breast whereupon some of them replied that it could not be set otherwise if right value was to be given to it in the design the pope who was beginning to weary of so many designs turned to me and asked if i had brought nothing to show while i was still undoing my box the pope turned to some of the other masters and said to them tis always well to look at everybody's rendering of a thing albeit benvenuto is young yet have i seen work of his that convinces me that he is in the right way then when i had uncovered my model and put it before him he had scarce seen it when he turned to me and cried out you've hit it that's how i want it done then he turned to the others and said see you now how this diamond can perfectly well be applied in another manner mark how benvenuto has made a stool of it and seated his figure thereon a better way of rendering it i can't conceive straight away he had me paid five hundred golden scudi and with most courteous words bade me godspeed to my work and this was the beginning of such work as i a simple man as i am have been enabled to do for the world you remember i promised in the beginning of my book to tell the causes that inspired me to write it causes which will move men to great wrath and to great compassion for me well i can't keep it locked up in my breast any more i must out with it i have just told how great princes give opportunity to men of genius and cause to rekindle through them the beautiful art of the past well i make bold to say that francis king of france was the greatest lover of genius and the most open-handed of any man that ever lived in the world i was called to his majesty when i was in rome and i joined him in the year fifteen forty being just forty years of age this king gave me all sorts of goodly work to do the which i will describe all in their place according as their various methods demand during my time with his majesty i made my first big works in sculpture and bronze works of great size never had i to ask him for pay or provision but i just lived on his lordly liberality for out of it he made me a stipend of a thousand scudi annually and gave me into the bargain a castle that is in paris called petinello wherein i served him four entire years and for as much as there was great war in these parts i begged grace of his majesty to let me travel to italy which favour he accorded me though none too willingly in the end i left with his good will and remained his creditor for seven hundred ducats of gold of my salary and in addition all the stock and material for the great works i had been engaged on the which amounted to about fifteen thousand scudi in my castle 
footnote, see Cellini's autobiography, Simmons' translation, and footnote, which I left under the guard of my two pupils, Pagolo Romano and Ascanio Napolitano. I left several great and small vases made of my own silver, not to mention a large vase all embossed with figures. This one I had made with the king's silver, and the others, as I have said, were made from my silver, and therefore mine. And over and above all this I left behind all the flower of the studies of my twenty years in Rome, and all the rich furniture of my house, which was such as to be worthy of hosting any noble lord or gentleman. The Bishop of Pyra, who was a friend of mine, did I thus entertain, and bring away from the hostel where he was staying, during a long sojourn in Paris, and to many others too, in like manner I gave abundant hospitality. I affirm that I came to Italy for no other purpose than to keep my six poor nephews, sons of my own sister, and I gave aid to all of them as soon as I was again among them. Before departing from Italy, I went to seek out my lord, the illustrious Duke Cosimo de' Medici, in order to pay him my respects, and ask his permission to return again to France. This amiable prince gave me as warm a greeting as could possibly be imagined, and entreated of me to make him a model for a statue of Perseus with the head of Medusa in his hand, telling me that he wished to erect the statue under one of the arches in the great loggia of the piazza. This raised a mighty zeal for glory within me, and I said to myself, So is a work of yours to stand between one of Michelangelo and one of Donatello, both of them men who surpassed the ancients in genius. What greater treasure could I desire than the honour of being set between these two mighty men? And, for as much as I knew that my studies in this art had by no means been slight, I promised myself that my work should hold its own beside theirs. In lightness of heart and full of energy, I set me to a model of a Perseus about the height of a cubit, such as His Excellency had commissioned. And when I had done it, I took it to him, and he marvelled at it and said, Benvenuto, if you had the courage to do this thing in great, as admirably as you have done it in little, I trow for a certainty that it would be the loveliest work in the piazza. These words moved me greatly, and in part with confidence for what I had already done, in part with great ambition for what I still had in mind to do, I said to the Duke, but with due modesty, Most excellent sire, consider well that in this piazza are works by Donatello and by Michelangelo Buonarroti, perhaps the biggest men that ever were in the world. As for my own little model, I will undertake to turn out the work at least three times more beautiful than this model you see here. At these words of mine the Duke shook his head, and I took leave of him. Two days after, he set a room at my disposal, supplied it with material and all the appliances needful for doing the work, the which, by slow degrees in a few years, and after great difficulties needless here to relate, I completed in the state you now see it. The noble duke said to me in winning words that I had been better than my promise, and as I had contented him so well, he was minded similarly to content me in whatever way I might wish. At this so charming speech from His Excellency, I asked leave first, before he accorded me aught for my labours, to be allowed to go on a pilgrimage to Vallombrosa, Camaldoli, Irma, and San Francesco, in order to give thanks to God for having helped me through so many difficulties, all of which I will tell of in their place. At these words His Excellency was graciously pleased to let me go, and so I went on my way, giving thanks to God. In about six days I returned, and at once called upon my lord, who welcomed me again with the greatest favour. Two days later he seemed a bit grumpy without my ever having given him any cause for being so. When I asked him for leave of absence, he refused to grant it, and at the same time he gave me no more commissions, so that I could serve neither him nor other man. 
nor was i able to find out the reason for the evil plight i was in so in my despair i felt sure my bad luck was due to the influence of those heavenly powers who have dominance over us here below and in this state set to work to write my whole life my origin and all the deeds i had done in the world and i also described the many years in which i had served the illustrious duke cosimo but on thinking the matter over i was minded how great princes often take it ill if their subjects complain and tell the truth about them so with much heart-burning and not without tears i tore up what i had written about the part of my life spent in duke cosimo's service and threw it into the fire vowing that i would never write about it again but for the mere purpose of being of some use to the world since i was thus left with nothing to do and moreover prevented from doing aught and wishing to give god some sort of thanks for having made me the man i was i set to write what i am now writing well it's off my mind now so let us get back again to good pope clement who gave me so many opportunities of doing great work all of which i will duly speak a little more about the cope clasp then having thus bossed up god the father and wrought the whole thing in a manner different from caradosso i set myself afresh to fashion little by little the angels round about him especially those that were of higher relief than others everybody knows that this is one of the most difficult things to do in our craft and likewise one of the most pleasing for just think i bossed up in high relief with my punches in the manner i described above some fifteen little angels without ever having to solder the tiniest rent and all this i was able to do because of my diligence my knowledge my patience and my mastery over all the best methods of workmanship the pope would scarce let three days pass without sending for me and each time would he see first one then another angel baby peep forth and this made him marvel greatly and each time he asked me how on earth i managed to do it and how i could bring so difficult a piece of work about in so short a time and all without a single rent i have seen said he and he was a man who knew a good thing when he saw it many works of caradosso which were full of holes and solder long before they got as far as this and thus each time he gave me good encouragement and i pegged merrily away at my work when i had completed all the high relief angels and joined together the gold behind their heads and arms and legs and filled up the openings i began with great care the soldering doing it in the way i described above but putting with each new soldering a fresh alloy of the baser metals i e the copper and the silver now for as much as i did not wish to disfigure so large a work with many solderings and also because i wanted later on to enamel it i put it into the fire as little as possible managed to get all the legs and arms and heads together at one go and finished the lot in four firings this done i began with great diligence to work over the soldered parts especially those on the background till i had it all of uniform evenness whereupon i set it once more on the pitch i e the stucco and once more wrought it over with the punches a large number of angels in bas relief and many in mere outline were still to do so them i brought out boldly with the punches upon this i melted the pitch out again heated the gold well and applied it once more to the pitch but this time with the underside of the work uppermost so that all my figures were buried in the pitch also this time made the pitch a bit softer because i was going to emboss from the back the figures which i had outlined in from the front and this i did with great skill determining which i wanted to boss up most then once again i emptied out the pitch and placed the work face upwards on the harder pitch and most cunningly finished it all over with the punches as i described above as there were still the gems to go upon it i made a base to the work with an eye attached so that it might therewith be applied to the cope on the pope's breast 
this base was all worked around with different little snails and masks and other pleasing trifles and was firmly fastened with invisible screws to the boss and looked just as if it had been soldered on as moreover the work was enamelled in various places especially round the framework i set to to burnish it up to a fine finish on the bare and unwrought parts and this is how i did that i took some four or five hard pointed stones footnote punte di pietre and footnote which are sharp at the ends and thicken upwards in the manner and of the size of punches and i used with them some well powdered pumice stone the object of using these stones is to take out the marks of the steel tools the punches chisels files and such like and to give it a fine uniform surface and last but not least a brilliancy of colour which would not be so easy if the marks of the steel tools and the skin they make were not obliterated to finish the draperies also i made a very fine steel tool exquisitely tempered and then broken off for the broken end gives the right delicacy of texture footnote una certa grana sottilissima and footnote and i tapped it all over the draperies with a small hammer weighing about two scudi or less and this is what we call camo schiari, tanning the surface footnote this might be better rendered as matting or posting and footnote a further different method may yet be employed for larger drapery and this is called granire graining and is done by a sharp pointed steel tool but not broken like the other one then there is yet a further method by which the ground is sharply accentuated from the figures by hatching it over with a fine sharp graver footnote possibly what we should call a scorper End footnote. in one direction crosswise for it does not turn well the other way when all the above has been carefully carried out put your work in a clean glass vase and get some little children to make water over it for their urine is purer and warmer than men's then prepare to give it its last finishing touches by colouring this you do with verdigris and salts of ammonia the verdigris must be as pure as possible and if you want it firm and richly coloured add a twentieth part of clean saltpetre the stuff they make gunpowder with these must all be well ground together but mind you don't grind them upon iron or bronze they must be pounded on stone and with stone porphyry is the best stone of all you then take the powder you have made from the above put it in a glass flask and mixing it with a strong white vinegar make a paste of it not too moist nor too dry and apply this paste to your work with as fine a hog sable as you can find putting it on very evenly and to about the thickness of half a knife's back at the same time you must have ready a wood coal fire half burnt out spread the coals so that you can lay your work upon them put it in the fire and with your pincers take a few glowing coals and move them up and down over the paste especially where it is thickest so that it heats equally all over you must be careful not to do this for too long there's all the difference between heating and scorching your work and if you did this it would get a bad colour on the one hand and on the other be difficult to clean afterward when you see the paste drying equally and about half dry put your work onto a stone or on a wooden table and cover it up with a clean basin till it has got cold then put it again into a glass jar and if you want it to come out well let the little ones make water over it again as before after this clean it up with small soft hog sables this injunction need only be observed in cases where the work is enamelled in other cases it will do just to dip it in urine after the heating of the paste of verdigris after this the precious gems are set firmly with screws and clamps and last of all the base is as i told you before firmly screwed on 
yet another way there is of working upon gold particularly in cases where you want to introduce figures of about half a cubit in size pursuing my method of always making things clear to you by means of examples i mind me of many of the cardinals in rome who used to have crucifixes in their private cabinets these crucifixes were about the height of a palm or a finger more and were made of gold silver and ivory the first of these gold crucifixes was made by master caradosso and most admirably designed and i suppose he got about a hundred scudi apiece for them or more first i'll tell you the way he made his then i'll tell you how i made mine which differed considerably from his method and was much harder but was sooner finished and produced more beautiful results it was in this wise caradosso would make a little model in wax of the size he wished his work to be but he made the legs apart and not as is customary with the crucified one crossed over the other then he cast his model in bronze and cutting his gold sheet in triangular form some two or three large fingers wider all round than would cover his model he laid it thereon and hammered it over with rather long wooden hammers till it looked like a half-relief next he proceeded very carefully to work it all over front and back with punches and hammers till the relief stood out to his liking then still with the same tools he joined the ends of gold together at the figure's back until they touched on the round of the head back and the legs after this he filled the figure with pitch i e the aforesaid stucco and with punches and hammers brought out footnote richer cando and footnote all the muscles and limbs then he emptied the pitch out again joined and soldered the gold together using gold of two carats less than the gold of his figure leaving one hole still open at the shoulder to admit of the pitch being again poured in and out and then wrought it over once more with his punches very carefully placed the feet crosswise and then gave it its last coating and finish i don't employ this bronze method because i don't think bronze and gold go well together the bronze tending to crack the gold and the whole thing taking a long time in the execution owing to my experience and my all-round knowledge of the craft i went straight to the gold with my punches and a number of small stakes called caccian fuori and so while caradosso was still fiddling away with his bronze casting i had got several days work ahead of him and was quit of the bother of the bronze firings into the bargain and thus though in other respects i followed all the methods of this excellent man also in enamelling and in colouring it came about that i did much more and obtained much better results than he now my friend in order to keep my promise with you as to the real practical things and to show you that i am not one who goes cribbing other people's ideas and methods but has worked them out with his own hands i'll tell you of the salt cellar footnote see autobiography and footnote i made for king francis i it was oval in shape and about two-thirds of a cubit round and the base of it was about four man's fingers high and very richly ornamented and i divided it up in such pleasing wise as one's craft will allow one part i made as ocean and the other as earth and on the side of ocean i had put the figure of gold about half a cubit high completely rounded and made with punches and chisels in the manner told above ocean was personified by neptune god of the sea and i made him in a shell a kind of nautical triumphal car in which were yoked four seahorses horses heads and fishes tails in neptune's right hand i put his trident while his left was stretched out the whole length of his arm over a most richly wrought bark which was meant to hold the salt were graven most minutely and cunningly battles of marine monsters on the opposite side to neptune was a female figure of the same size as the male 
and I so devised it that the legs of the male and the female were crossed most gracefully one with the other, and in each the one leg was bent and the other extended, thus typifying the mountains and the even places of the earth. By the side of the female figure I put a little ionic temple, most richly wrought, and this was to hold the pepper. In her right hand was a very elaborate cornucopia of leaves and fruit and flowers, and on the earth where she sat I indicated a number of beautiful little beasties, just as on the other side I had fashioned a variety of exquisite little fish peeping up from the sea. Furthermore, in the oval body of the salt I had planned out eight niches, in each one of which figured spring, summer, autumn and winter on one side, and dawn, day, twilight and night on the other. In the hollow of the salt's base was a block of ebony, of which, however, only a tiny strip showed beneath, and the which, being black, told well against the gold. This base again rested on four balls of ivory, set halfway into the ebony, and so devised that they turned on their pivots, and you could move the salt cellar about hither and thither on the table, and roll it where you liked. I must tell you some absurd things that happened to me when I presented the salt to the most Christian king. His majesty had referred me to one of his treasurers, a Monsieur de Marmagne, a shrewd old fellow, and terribly fierce. Now, you know the French and the Italians are deadly enemies. Well, this old gentleman, about a month before I brought the salt cellar to the king, had shown me a little bronze statuette, a trifle bigger than my gold ones. This figure was an antique, and represented Mercury with his caduceus in his hand. He told me that it belonged to a poor peasant, who would gladly sell it, whereupon I said that if he did not care to buy it for himself, I, who knew the figure to be a very charming workmanship, would willingly give a hundred golden scudi for it, and like the frank and open man I am, I praised the figure greatly, declaring I had never seen a lovelier. Whereupon that evil old man said he would do his best to get it for me, and gave me great hopes of getting it, for that I had set it at a higher value, and offered more than any other connoisseurs who had seen it. I thought no more about the matter till the day that I brought my salt cellar to King Francis. The good king examined my work very carefully, and expressed himself most satisfied, when, just as all were expressing their delight, that wicked old fellow drew forth his statuette, and said to the king, "'Sacred Majesty, this figure is an antique, as you may readily see, and tis of so excellent workmanship that Benvenuto here has himself offered a hundred golden scudi for it. I had it brought among my baggage from Languedoc at the time of my treasurership, but courage failed me to present it to your majesty until I had satisfied myself that it was of sufficient excellence to merit your acceptance.' At these words the king turned to me, and, in the old boy's presence, asked if what he had said was true. I replied, most assuredly, and that the work appeared to me admirable. Whereupon the king said, Then God be praised that here in our own day there be yet men born who can turn out so much more beautiful things than the ancients. Therewith he smiled, and gave old Monsieur de Marmagne back his statuette, for of course he saw that the intention had been to disparage my work beside the antique. Hundreds of most graceful and complimentary things did he continue to say about my work, so much so that I never wished for any better remuneration for it than I got that day. End of section 13「Section 14 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. » The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 13, On Cardinal Seals This sort of work is delightful. 
In my time in Rome, that was about 1525, there was a certain master from Perugia called Lotizio, who practised nothing else but the making of seals for the bulls of cardinals. These seals are about the size of a ten-year-old child's hand, and they're made in the shape of an almond. The cardinal's title is engraved on them, and usually in the form of a rebus, or allegorically. Lotizio used to get at least a hundred scudi for each seal he made. Now, always sticking to my method of describing things from work I have done with my own hands, I'll tell you of two that I made in this branch of my art. The first was for the Cardinal of Mantua, brother of the Duke. On it was engraved the Ascension of Our Lady, with the Twelve Apostles, for so ran the Cardinal's title. The other seal, much more richly figured, was for the Cardinal Ippolito of Ferrara, brother of Duke Hercules. On this one was engraved St. Ambrose on horseback, with a whip in his hand, chastising the Arians. And as two stories had to be wrought upon it, for the Cardinal had a twofold title, it was divided down the middle, and the legend of St. John the Baptist preaching in the desert was engraved on the other part, and both subjects were wrought with figures. For the Mantua seal I got two hundred ducats, for the Ferrara one three hundred. The seals are made in the following manner. You take a smooth and polished black stone, and draw thereon the design you want to appear on the seal, and with black wax, a bit hardened, you fashion whatever relief you wish the seal ultimately to impress. When this is very delicately accomplished, you take a little Volterrano gesso, footnote, gypsum or plaster from Volterra. The 1568 edition has gesso cotto Volterrano, end footnote. Or any other gesso, provided it be very fine. Boiled gesso it should be, and after having moistened your wax by painting it over very lightly with a fine paintbrush and a little clean and pure olive oil, you put the gesso on your wax. You must mind not to get too much oil on your wax, for it would then hurt the gesso and prevent it from penetrating into the finer delicacies of the wax. Before pouring on your gesso in the liquid state, you must make a little wall or embankment of fresh clean clay, about two fingers high, all round your seal. As you pour your gesso on, you guide it about very carefully into all the interstices of the wax by means of a long-haired brush. Footnote. Un penaletto al quando grandicello di vaio. What I think in the English workshop would be called a rigger. End footnote. After the gesso is well set, remove it from the wax. This, of course, will be easily done, as there is no undercutting, for since the work is ultimately to serve the purpose of a seal, no projections are permissible. Then you clean out the matrix with a knife, removing any scum or spoiled surface that may have been made by the gesso on the inside, and polish it up all round. Now, there are two ways of casting in silver. Both of them are good, and both of them will I describe to you. Tis true that one is a little easier than the other, but, as I say, both are good, and you may adopt whichever most wins your fancy. Do not, however, fail to try both, because it is good for you to learn them, and you will find them very helpful to you in many ways in other branches of the goldsmith's art. The first method was the one employed by Lotanzio, and he, as I said, was the greatest master in this branch of work whom I ever knew. He used to take what is called earth for founding in boxes. Footnote, che si chiama terra da formare nelle strafe. It is not a clay, but, as he says, a sand tufa, areno di tufo, a volcanic spongy rock like pumice, and they make cement of it. End footnote. The same that all the bronze founders use, and from which they cast the harness of horses and mules, brass studs, and such like trappings. And, for as much as this clay is known all the world over, 
I shan't bother about describing it, but only say that it is a kind of tufa earth. By the by, as I write, I am minded of a very rare kind of this tufa, which is found in the bed of the Seine in Paris. While there, I used to take what I wanted from hard by the Saint Chapelle, which stands on an island in Paris, in the middle of the Seine. It is very soft, and has the property, quite different from other clays used for moulding purposes, of not needing to be dried. But when you have made from it the shape you want, you can pour into it, while it is still moist, your gold, silver, brass, or any other metal. This is a very rare thing, and I have never heard of it occurring anywhere else in the world. Before considering the other kinds of clay that may be used for this sort of work, it will be best for me to tell you carefully how to make your gesso model for casting your seal from. After it is well cleaned with a knife in the way above described, powder it with a little fine charcoal dust, or smoke it over with the soot from your lamp or taper. Either will do, and I really needn't describe this because everybody knows how to do it. Then press the model into a caster's sandbox of sufficient size to hold it conveniently. This done, dry well that portion of the mould where the figures come. That is to say, if you are using the Italian, not the Paris, clay. Then have ready a little dough. Footnote. Pasta di pane crudo. End footnote in the form of a cake, similar in shape and thickness to what your silver or metal seal is finally to be, and put this over the figures formed by the gesso, and which will appear in relief, having previously smoked over the mould with a little candle smoke. This done, take the second box, fill it with the same moist earth, and when dried, set it upon the first. Mind in so doing that you do not disturb the part already dried where the figures are. Footnote. The 1568 edition gives a clearer version of this process than the original codex, which is confusing. I have translated it as literally as possible, but the following might be read as more descriptive of the process. The gesso matrix has been pressed into the sand of the first box, and has made the mould of the relief work of the seal, the dough is to make the shape of the body. It would be roughly cut away to clear the figures, and carefully placed over the part moulded. Then the second box would be put on, and the moist earth tightly packed in. After this, the boxes would be separated, and the dough taken out. End footnote. This second half you will easily mould, then open the mould, and after taking out the dough cake, make the mouth and the two vent holes, beginning at the bottom and going up as high as the mouth or ingress hole. When both parts are dry, smoke them over with a little candle smoke, and let them cool. Have your silver well molten, and then pour it in. Experience shows that it's better to pour the silver into cold than into hot matrices. Now for the second method, differing considerably from the first, but, as I have employed both, and the second not only for seals but for casting all sorts of other things too, I'll describe it to you also. When you have from your original wax cut a gesso matrix in the manner above described, take a little of the same gesso, mix with it a little pith of horn, footnote, midolo di corna, See Herpley's handbook, Oreficeria, for the modern process. End footnote. Well dried, a further part of Tripoli, footnote, calcinated sulphate of iron, end footnote, and finally another part of well powdered pumice stone, and pound these four parts well up together. Then add as much water to them as shall give them the consistency of a paste, neither too thick nor too fluid. Then, with a fine brush, paint the surface of your seal all round over the wax projections and into the interstices, with a little olive oil. Waiting till it is well dried, in the way we Florentines call verdamezzo, that is to say, neither too dry nor too moist, footnote, 
or as we english would perhaps say tacky End footnote. make a little wall of clay about two fingers high all round it and pour the above mixture into the work and paint it well in and around the whole of your subject pile the mixture up at least two fingers high and make about four fingers more of it at the upper end on account of the almond form which is the shape your seal will be for you need their greater size for the pouring in mouth of your silver or whatever metal you may be using when the gesso is thoroughly dried which will not be till some four hours or so separate the one piece of gesso from the other taking very great care that none of your design is injured as you may well imagine it was much easier to separate the matrix from the wax in the first method than from the composition in the second because in the former it had a firmer consistency if some of the arms and heads don't appear to you to come out quite a success and remain stuck in the matrix you can remedy that in either of the following ways you can either pick out the bits remaining in the mould with a small paintbrush and reapply them with a little powdered tripoli and since your design is in relief you will easily see the impressions made by it in the mould or for the other way you can clean out the mould entirely paint it round again and fill it up with the composition in the same way as before often if the first turn has not come out well the second does but pay the greatest possible attention to what i'm going to tell you now make a waxen form almond shaped and of the exact size your seal is to be hollow it out and lay it over the surface of your gesso relief then make your little ramparts of earth about this wax taking heed to make due provision for the channel of the casting which should be of ample length and here i ought to tell you that the longer your channel is the better chance your work has of turning out well there are no end of little details still to be observed but if i were to tell you all of them i might as well begin teaching you your a b c so i assume that my readers are people who have mastered the first principles of the art i would remind you too that both the ingress mouth and the vents have to be made of wax and applied to the wax core these vents are fixed below and turn up around the seal towards the ingress mouth they must not however come in contact with the latter because they have to do their own work of drawing out the air footnote this which is the ordinary chire perju process is again described in chapter twenty two where cellini deals with a vase he's making the accompanying diagram illustrates it in its application to seals the mouth or ingress hole or what will become the mouth is rolled in wax and attached to the top the two vents are rolled and attached in a similar way below but so as not to touch the pattern End footnote. this done bind up your seal with well-tempered iron or copper wire and let it bide in the sun or some place where it can get warm and well dried then put it in your little furnace of tiles and iron hoops and melt out the wax with such heat as may be needful of course your wax must have been free from all impurities or it will never melt out properly and when you have melted it out you make the fire stronger till your mould is regularly burnt and the more it is baked the better your work will be then let it cool and because the silver adapts footnote selye acosta and footnote itself more readily to the cold than to the hot mould cold mark you but not moist when it is well molten pour it in but ere you do this in order that it may not burn footnote riada i e oxidize and footnote strew a little borax over it and upon that a handful of well-ground tartar footnote gromma di botte tartrate of potash End footnote. and you will find this help your work wonderfully then dip the mould in water in order better to separate it from the silver 
and so break it open. This done, clean the silver off at the points where the channel and the vent holes come, and give it a subtle finish with the file. After this, in order to give the seal its final touches, you place it on the pitch, and with your first gesso matrix before you, work the silver with your punches, gravers and chisels, touching up and completing your subject, now here, now there, figures, swags, arms, bodies, legs, all alike, accentuating, footnote, risarando, end footnote, them in the matrix with your steel tools. To see better how you're getting on, you may occasionally press in a little black wax, or whatever colour pleases you better, to gauge the projections. Now, note this. My custom was to cut out the heads, hands and feet of my figures on small steel punches, and thinking the work came clearer and got a better result, I struck these punches with dexterous strokes upon the seal with a hammer into their different places. Also, you should make in a similar manner an alphabet of steel punches, likewise many other conceits according as taste prompts. When I was in Rome, or elsewhere, working in this line, I oft-times amused myself by making new alphabets, each for its occasion, for they wear out soon, and I got much credit by my inventiveness. Your letters should be well formed, and shaped as a broadly cut pen might shape them, the strokes going up or down with the action of the hand, the letters being neither too fat and stumpy, nor too long and thin, for both these are unpleasing to behold. The moderately slim ones are the nicest to look at. I ought not to omit telling you that the cardinal's arms, or whatever they may be, have to be done on the seals, and these are always richly ornamented with figure work, and I often used to have for the handle wherewith the seal was attached some fine beasts, or as often figures, according to the emblem of the gentleman for whom the seal was made. You should be careful not to omit these little complimentary touches, because they redound to the honour of the master, and please the patron whom he serves. I made, among others, such a handle in gold for the Duke of Mantua, after I had made the one for his brother the Cardinal, and in addition to all the care I had put into the seal itself, I added a little Hercules for the handle, and he was sitting on his lion's skin, and had his club in hand. For this tiny figure I made no end of studies, and it brought me much honour with the sculptors and painters, and among these was Master Giulio Romano. Some of them made use of the design too for other purposes, and I was well paid for it. Some artists have gone straight to work at their seals, with merely cutting directly into their silver, and without casting at all, but pluckily doing their design straight on in the reverse with genuine knowledge of their art, and using the steel dies of which I have told you, and they succeeded in it too. I also have done this, but I have found the casting method more practicable, though both are good and can lead to excellent results. End of section 14「Section 15 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 14. How to Make Steel Dies for Stamping Coins. Since the art of the coiner can teach the elements of stamping metals in methods similar to those of the ancients, we will treat of that art first. You must bear in mind that the ancients, though they made their coins for use, undoubtedly made their medals for show, and as regards the former, we moderns may pride ourselves on being able to produce them with greater facility, and that, like the printing of books and many such-like arts, it is a discovery of ours, which, though it be out of my scope to speak of them here, I may have occasion to touch on elsewhere. As to the coins, I shall, according to my usual custom, speak with actual instances of the methods I have myself wrought in. 
the first coins i made were for pope clement the seventh in rome who summoned me to come to him from florence some eighteen months after the great sack of rome by the lord of bourbon and since the house of medici was at that time expelled from florence the pope sent for me by the hand of master jacopo dello schiorina footnote see the vita simmons book one forty two and footnote the same that kept the ferry across the tiber by the banchi in trestoveri not far from the palace of messer agostino chigi this master jacopo wrote me twice on the pope's account when i got the second letter i made off as fast as i could for of a truth those terrible radicals footnote terribilissimi popolani and footnote in power then would have hanged me had they found it on me pope clement when i came treated me with the most winning kindnesses and ordered me to make the coins for his city and mint in rome the first coins i made were gold pieces worth about two ducats each on which were stamped figures of diverse sort on the one was the form of a nude christ his hands bound behind him done with all the care and study i was capable of down the sides of the figure ran the legend ecce homo and around the circumference the words clemens the seventh pont max while on the other side was stamped the head of the pope a new occasion soon offered itself though i don't want to write a chronicle of events and though i was not directly affected by them i can't help touching upon them slightly what the current talk in rome was at the time i don't need to dwell on any man with a head on his shoulders may easily imagine that for himself the second coin a beauty was likewise of gold and a two ducat prince on one side was a pope in his pontifical robes and an emperor also in his regalia the two were supporting a cross which was in the act of falling to the ground i forget if there was a legend on this side but on the other were a saint paul and a saint peter in more than half relief with this legend around them unus spiritus una fides erat in eis this coin brought me much honour for i put great labour into it as the pope put more gold into it than its value warranted it soon was melted down again a third coin of my making was in silver of the value of two carlins on the one side of which was the head of the pope and on the other side a saint peter just the moment after he has plunged into the sea at the call of christ and christ stretches out his hand to him in most pleasing wise and the legend to this was quare dubitasti in florence likewise did i make all the monies for duke alexander the first of that name there were forty soldi pieces and because the duke was curly-headed the people called these coins the duke's curls footnote e ricci del duca alexandro End footnote. on one side was his head and on the other saint cosmo and saint damien in like manner did i make the coins called barile and grossone as i said above the ancients had not the facilities for stamping coins we have and therefore we never see any of the beautiful sort footnote meaning in the way cellini describes them End footnote. for coins should be made or rather their dies with the purpose of striking with the greatest ease to begin with two steel tools are needed one called the peeler and the other the torsello the peeler is in the form of a small stake or anvil upon which the metal you wish to press is cut in intaglio the other tool the torsello is about five fingers high its face being the size of your coin and it gradually tapers off toward the end both peeler and torsello are made of carefully chosen iron with their heads covered in the finest steel about one finger thick 
with his file the master gives them whatever shape and size his coin may need then he makes a concoction of earth powdered glass soot from the chimney and bowl of armenia footnote terra di bolo armenio red earth that was and is used in gilding grounds etc End footnote. adds a little horse dung to this mixes it all up into a paste with a man's urine and puts it on to the ends of the peeler and the torsello to the thickness of about a finger these he then puts into the fire which should be strong enough to raise them to bright redness footnote riquo carno End footnote keeping the fire up for say a good winter's night he then lets them cool down by allowing the fire to go out footnote cellini's method of hardening differs from that of theophilus the latter in describing the tempering of files book three chapter seventeen practically employs animal charcoal to case harden his metal End footnote. the exact size of the coins is now given to the ends of the dies barring about half the thickness of a knife's back all round the circumference and the face of each is then ground on a soft polished stone until both peeler and torsello are absolutely smooth then with the compasses the exact size of the coin is drawn upon them and also with another pair of compasses the circumference of the letters that form the legend round is marked in order that these compasses should not shift about a pair should be specially made of thick steel wire and of the exact size needed it is best to have at least two pairs of each kind and also one pair that will open and shut as you please when this is done the peeler is firmly set in a big lump of lead of at least a hundred pounds in weight after this you can proceed to the engraving of your coin on the die footnote cellini uses the words stampare and intagliare in their generic as well as their specific sense End footnote. you very carefully cut upon the finest steel your design e g the head of whatever prince you are serving and in order to do this nicely you must first have your steel well softened in the fire in the way i showed you the peeler and torsello were only take heed that your tool is of the very finest steel and the tools with which you work have to be made specially for the purpose thus for a head i should make the tool in two pieces and for the various figures on the reverse of a coin i should use a number of different pieces according to my discretion some have worked with very few but in so doing have much greater difficulty in sinking the design into the die the more such pieces you have the easier it becomes but you must always give great care in the combination of your punches and this combining is done while the master is engaged in cutting the intaglios by taking frequent impressions on a piece of polished tin to which you can give the right circumference with your compasses until you get the results you wish the tools used for this purpose have two names in some instances they are called punzoni punches and in other cases madre matrices and of a truth they are the mothers that may be said to beget the figures and all the other things you fashion in the die of your coins footnote what we should call engraved punches End footnote. the men who did the best work in coining always did the whole of the work upon either the punches or the matrices and never once touched up the dies with either gravers or chisels for that would be a great blunder as all the various dies necessary for making many impressions of the same coins would be a bit different and thus cause slight differences in the coins themselves and that would be making things easy for forgers whereas coins well wrought in the way above described could be less easily copied but i must return to you dear reader where i left off above with the peeler stuck in the lead 
take your madre or punches and since it almost always is a prince's head that is cut into the peeler set to with the first piece of your combination and fitting each into its place strike it a blow with the hammer and lift hand and tool up as smartly and rapidly as you brought them down for if the madre shift even but ever so slightly it will tend to blur your work in like manner add the limbs and the heads of your figures in such wise as your craft and your experience shall teach you and so on similarly any other things coats of arms devices beautiful alphabets the beading for the coin's border till all are well fashioned in both peeler and torcello and since i should omit nothing for your better guidance know that the hammer needful for stamping in the larger madre such for instance as a head would need ought to weigh about four pounds while those requisite for the smaller punches may weigh less those for the smallest of all for the beading for instance may be very tiny each according when the sinking by both peeler and torcello is completed set to and file off the superfluous margin right up to your border of beading see that it is strongly blunted footnote balso forte this might be strongly backed i e the reverse of undercut End footnote. where you have filed it towards the beading for without this your dye would spoil and quickly perish but where it is blunted it will not spoil then set to and temper your steel footnote cellini's description is not very clear see note pages sixty eight and seventy four and footnote to this end you heat it and let it glow neither too much nor too little but just sufficient to temper it aright and for as much as in the tempering a film is formed that would tend to spoil your fair impression you must take great care to prevent it as we say in the craft the dyes should be rosso a punto to the point of redness neither more nor less and to make them so you do this you take some clean iron scale footnote scalia perhaps fine oxide of iron professor roberts austin suggests that this may have been what is now called rouge End footnote. and place it on a board and then rub peeler and torcello alike on this until they're thoroughly bright and the film quite gone from them and in the same manner may you afterwards brighten your coins and another little hint you clean out the deeper parts of your dies with pieces of pointed cork tipped with iron scale and then everything is done and you can give your dies to the stamper at the mint i must not forget to tell you as i promised how it was that the ancients never turned their coins out as well as we and the reason of it was because they cut their dies out direct with goldsmith's tools ravers chisels punches and that was very difficult for them to do especially as the mints needed a large number of these dies pile and torselli i need give you but one instance of what i mean gentle reader and you will see how right i am on one occasion when i was making the dies for pope clement in rome i had to turn out thirty of these iron pile and torselli in one day had i gone to work in the manner of the ancients i could not have produced two nor would they have been as good thus it was that the ancients had to employ a large number of die cutters and these could never do their work as well as they wished to do it having never attained our facility but now will i tell you of medals which the ancients made superlatively well and whatever i may have omitted in dealing with coins i will make up for in treating of medals so that you shall learn all in listening to both end of section fifteen
Section 16 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 15, About Medals. In dealing with these beautiful things, I will first explain to you the method adopted by the ancients, and then tell you how we are wont to go to work nowadays. As far as we can gather from the methods of this art, it appears that in the days when the art of making medals commenced to flourish in Egypt, Greece, and Rome, the rulers put the impressions of their heads on one side, and on the other some record of the great deeds they had done. What strikes us professionals, however, who look deeper into the matter, is the variety of medals struck for each emperor by a number of different masters, and the reason of this is that when a new ruler was elected, all the masters of the craft of medal stamping in his dominions, and especially those in his immediate residence, struck a medal for the occasion, the prince's head on one side, and on the other, some commemoration of one of his deeds of honour. Then all the many medals were shown to the prince, and his ministers, and to him whose work was pronounced the best, was awarded the mastership of the mint, or rather, the making of the dies for the coins. Now, as to their making. The first thing to be done is to make a model in white wax of the head, the reverse, and whatever there may be, to the exact size and relief of the final work, for we know this was how the ancients did it. The white model in wax is made as follows. Take a little pure white wax, add to it half the quantity of well-ground white lead, and a little very clean turps. It depends on the time of year as to whether you put much or little turps, winter requiring half as much again as summer. With wooden sticks, footnote, fusciletti, and footnote, it is worked on a surface of stone, bone, or black glass, and thereupon, for the ancients and the moderns are at one here, it is made in the gesso just as the cardinal seals were, of which I erewhile told you. Then you take what are called the tercelli, or iron implements used for stamping medals, just as in the case of the pile and torcelli you used for stamping coins. Only in this case they are made alike, and not dissimilar like the latter. There is a further difference too, and this you must be careful about. Whereas the latter were made of steel and iron, the former are of well-chosen steel and four-cornered in shape, and the one just like the other. After you have softened them in the fire in the same way as I showed you above with coins, you smooth and polish, footnote, ispianera gli, and footnote, them very carefully with soft stones, and mark out the size of your medal, the beading, the place for the inscription, and so forth, with just such immovable compasses as you used before. After this you begin to work with your chisels ever so carefully, cutting away the steel in order to round off the form of the head in just such manner as you have it in your gesso model. And in this manner, little by little, you hollow it out with your tools, but using the punches as little as possible. Footnote. Cesseletti di amacare. End footnote because they would harden the steel, and you would not be able to remove it with your cutting tools. This was the way in which the ancients, with their wanted diligence and patience, went to work, and in the same way, using the chisels and the gravers, did they engrave their letters, and thus it comes about that on no ancient medal have I seen really good letters, though some are better than others. So much for the methods of the ancients. Now for another of our practical instances, gentle reader, always, as I have promised you, something from my own hand. It was a medal for Pope Clement the Seventh, and it had two reverses. On the front was the head of His Holiness, 
on the reverse side was the subject of moses with his folk in the desert at the time of the scarcity of water god comes to their help bidding aaron moses brother strike the rock with his staff from which the living water springs i made it just full of camels and horses and ever so many animals and crowds of people and the little legend across it ut bibat populus an alternative reverse bore the figure of peace a lovely maiden with a torch in her hand burning a pile of weapons and at the side the temple of janus with a fury bound to it and the legend around of claudunto belli portai the dies for these medals i prepared with the madre footnote this might be translated i sank End footnote. of which i told you before and the punches using them first in the same way as i did with the coins but i must remind you how i said that the dies for the coins were not to be worked on with cutting instruments gravers and so forth here with the medals the contrary holds good and as soon as you have done what you can with your madre and the various little punches that go with it you must needs finish the work ever so carefully with chisels and gravers the letters are stamped in with steel punches just as was the case with the coins you must take heed too while striking to fix your die onto a great block footnote tassello and footnote of lead some when they strike coins have used hollowed wooden blocks footnote ceppi di legno bucati and footnote for this purpose but this will not answer for medals as the dies have to be much deeper cut the relief of the medal being so much higher just in the same way as with the coins you will do well to make wax impressions from time to time while you're cutting to see how you're getting on likewise before you temper the die footnote perhaps harden see pages sixty eight and seventy i am indebted to professor roberts austin for the following note this passage is amplified in the next chapter where the author treats of the hardening of metal dies he has shown that before working on the coin dies he has made them as soft as possible but before they could actually be used for striking coins they would need hardening and tempering hardening steel is affected by heating it to bright redness and then quenching it in some fluid which will cool the metal with more or less rapidity cold water being usually employed for this purpose hence in this chapter cellini states that there must be ten gallons of cold water in which the hot dye is quenched and kept moving as in modern practice until it is cold tempering on the other hand to which he alludes here consists in reducing the hardness of the quenched steel by heating it to a moderate temperature much below redness usually the dye would be in modern practice heated until a straw-coloured film forms on its surface probably such a film is contemplated by the author when he indicates the necessity for removing a film produced at the hardening stage by polishing with fine oxide of iron End footnote. make a few impressions on lead so as to see how the whole works together and to correct any mistakes when you are satisfied with the results set to with the tempering of the dies like you did for the coining don't however omit to have a pitcher containing about ten gallons of water footnote the barilla is about forty pints captain victor ward tells me about twenty florentine wine flasks End footnote. when your dye is aglow grip it carefully with the tongs and quickly dip it into the water and not holding it in one position but stirring it round always keeping it under water till it hisses no longer and becomes cold then take it out and polish it up with powdered iron scale just as you did before with the coins End of section 16
Section 17 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 16, How the Before-Mentioned Medals Are Struck. Medals are struck in various ways. I will speak first of the method called coniare. Footnote. Lo qual dice coniare, as distinct from the method he describes in chapter 17. End footnote. A term derived from this particular method of metal stamping, and there now go on to the others of which I have also availed myself. You make an iron frame, footnote, staffa, end footnote, about four fingers wide, two fingers thick, and half a cubit long, and the open space within it should be exactly the size of the dies, tasselli, on which your medals are cut in intaglio. These dies, you remember, are square, and they have to fit exactly square and equal into the frame, so that they may be in no way moved in the striking of the medal. Before beginning the actual thing, it is necessary first to strike a medal of lead of just the size you wish the gold or silver one to be. You do it in the usual way, taking the impression of it in castor's sand. You remember we spoke about it before. The same that all the founders use for the trappings of horses, mules, and brass work generally. From this pattern medal you make your final casting. Footnote. In questo modo ti conviene formala e gettala a ghiaresso. End footnote. Which you carefully clean up, removing the rough edges, footnote, barette, end footnote, with a file, and after that polishing off all the file marks. This done, you place the cast metal between your dies, tasselli. The metal, in that it is already cast into its shape, is more easily struck, and the dies are, for the same reason, less used up in the process of striking. When you have them in the middle of your frame, and the frame itself fixed firmly upright, push them down into the frame at one end, leaving a cavity of three fingers space from the edge of it. Into this cavity fix two wedges of iron, footnote, coni di ferro, end footnote, or biete, the thin ends of which are at least half the size of the thick ends, and which in length are about twice the breadth of the frame. Then, when you want to do the striking, set them with their thin ends over your dies, the point of the one set towards the other. Then take two stout hammers, and let your apprentice hold one at the head of one of the wedges, and do you strike with the other hammer the opposite wedge three or four times, very carefully alternating your blows first on one wedge, then on the other. The object of this is as a precaution to prevent the shifting and facilitate the action of your dies. Footnote. Ferry. End footnote. Or the pieces of metal that are to form your medals. Then take your frame, set the head of one of the wedges on a big stone, and strike the other head with a large hammer, called in the craft mazzetta, using both your hands. This you repeat three or four times, turning the frame round at every second stroke. This done, take out your metal. If the metal be of bronze, it will have been necessary to soften it first. Footnote. This may mean working the bronze hot, but more probably softening by annealing. End footnote for that is too hard a metal to strike straight off without heating, and repeat this three or four times until you see that the impression is sharp. True it is, I could give you hundreds of little wrinkles yet, but I don't intend to do it, because I assume I am speaking to those who have some knowledge of the art, and for those who haven't it would be dreadfully boring to listen. So much for the method of striking medals that we call coniare. End of section 17
Section 18 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 17, Another Way of Striking Medals with the Screw. You make an iron frame of similar size and thickness to the one described above, but of sufficient length to enable it to hold not only the two dies, to selly, on which the medal is cut, but also the female, footnote, la vitae femina, and footnote, screw of bronze. This screw is set beneath the male screw of iron, footnote, il mastio di ferro i.e. so that the male screw can fit into it. End footnote. One ought really to apply the term screw, vitae, to this male screw only, the female screw being called chiocciola. The male screw should be three fingers thick, and its threads, footnote, panny, end footnote, square, because it is stronger thus than of the usual shape. The frame has to have a hole in the top of it to admit of the screw passing through it. When you have placed your dies, to selli, beneath the screw, with the metal you propose to strike between them, you tighten them up by the insertion of iron wedges, footnote, biette, and footnote, so that they cannot possibly shift. You will find this necessary owing to the greater size of the bronze screw. Footnote. Li e di necessita che per la grandezza della chiocciola di bronzo, la quale ha da essere fatta in modo che la non balli nella staffa. End footnote. Then having prepared a piece of beam about two cubits long, or more, you fix an iron rod of sufficient thickness, and of about two cubits in length, to the lower end of it, and it must fit into the beam. Footnote. A quella si attacca nella testa di sotto un pezza di corrente, e bisogna che sia commesso in nella testa di sotto nella detta trave. End footnote. Then fix your frame into a cutting in the head of the beam made exactly to hold it. It is necessary too to bind the beam round with stout iron bands to give it strength at the place where the frame is set in, and to prevent it from splitting. Round the head of the screw must then be fitted a stout iron ring with two loops in it, and these have to be made to hold a long iron rod, or bar. Footnote. Chiowe a un lungo corrente. I give on the next page a diagram of what the upper portion of this machinery was probably like, or it may be as Professor Robert Austin shows it in the drawing in his Cantor lecture on alloys, Society of Arts Journal, March, April, 1884. End footnote. Say, six cubits in length, so that four men can work at it, and bring their force to play upon your dies and the medal you're making. In this method, I struck about one hundred of the medals I made for Pope Clement. They were done in the purest bronze without any casting, which, as I told above, is necessary for the process called coniare. I advise every artist to know well this method of striking with the screw, for, though it be more expensive, the impressions are better, and the dyes not so soon worn out. Of the gold and silver medals I struck many straight off without softening them first, and, as for the cost, perhaps after all it only appears greater, for whereas in the method of striking with the screw, footnote, colpi di conio, and footnote, two turns of the screw will complete the medal. In the method of striking in the coniare process, at least one hundred blows with the stamps are necessary before you get the desired result. End of section 18「Section 19 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 18, 
how to work in large ware, in gold and silver and such like. Footnote. Cellini applies the term grocery to all large ware of whatever process, and as distinguished from minutery. End footnote. First will I speak of the methods I learnt in Rome, and then of those that are used in Paris. Indeed, I believe this city of Paris to be the most wonderful city in the world, and there they practice every branch of every art. I spent four years of my life there in the service of the great King Francis, who gave me opportunities of working out not only in all the arts of which I have been telling you, but also in the art of sculpture, and of that too I shall speak in its proper place. End of section 19section twenty of the treatises of benvenuto cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by benvenuto cellini translated by c r ashby this librivox recording is in the public domain the treatise on goldsmithing chapter nineteen how to begin making a vase it is quite wonderful what a variety of different methods there are for making silver vases we might here begin with the casting of silver and then, little by little, get on to other subjects. There are three ways of melting silver so that it shall not burn. Footnote. Non si riada. End footnote. In the first you use the bellows, constructing round their mouth a little brick furnace sufficient to quite cover the crucible, even to be some four fingers above it. Then rub the crucible all over, inside and out, with olive oil, Put the silver into it, and place it on the furnace. You should not have too many coals aglow at first, for fear of cracking the crucible, for that is apt to happen with the sudden heat, but let it get gradually hotter and hotter, without touching your bellows, until it is red hot. At this point you gently start blowing with the bellows. After a while you will see the silver beginning to float like water. Then you strew a handful of tartar over it, and while it stays a moment so, take a piece of linen folded four or five times and well soaked in oil to lay this over the crucible when you remove it from the coals. Then swiftly take hold of the crucible with your cramping tongs, footnote, imbracciatoie, and footnote, a pair of tongs made specially for catching hold of earthen crucibles, for if you catch hold of these as you would of iron crucibles, you would break them, but these special tongs support the earthen crucible so that there is no danger of its breaking. Meanwhile, the moulds for pouring silver in must be at hand. These are made out of two iron plates of the requisite size, and as occasion shall demand, and beneath, footnote, infra, should perhaps better be between, End footnote. Them, place a few square rods about the size of your little finger, more or less, as the work may need. The plates are then bound together with stout iron clamps, struck with a hammer till they grip the moulds equally all round. Of these clamps you need six or eight, according to the size of the mould. Then you paint round the junction of the moulds with liquid clay so as to prevent the silver from coming through. Footnote. Per cagione che lo argento non versi. End footnote. When your moulds are well warmed, you pour a little oil into them and stand them in an earthen pot of spent ashes, or even on the ground between four bricks, and so pour in your silver. That is one of the methods of casting. End of section 20 Section 21 of the treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini Translated by C. R. Ashby This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing Chapter 20 Another and a better way of casting. The Florentine gold beaters used to have another way of casting, which was called casting in the mortar. Footnote 
fondere nel mortaio perhaps better mortar casting and footnote for so was the furnace called in which the casting was done you take a number of bands of clean iron footnote lame di ferro stietto and footnote about half a finger thick and as broad as a thumb and weave them into a round shape about one and one-third cubits high sometimes smaller sometimes larger than this in accordance with the quantity of the work you have to cast it must be interlaced into a domed shape to about two-thirds of its circumference and from the iron that remains over you make four legs on which the furnace is to stand note that where these legs commence you must make a grating the openings of which are wide enough to allow for one finger and a half being put through them this serves as a base for the furnace and the furnace itself you construct by means of fashioning a cake of earth mixed with cloth shearings footnote chimmatura and footnote the kind of earth that glass blowers use for their furnaces then you take a terracotta tile and lay it on the base of your furnace and strew a little ash over it on this you stand your crucible filled with as much silver as it can hold and set to work very carefully much as you did in the previous method you fill the furnace with coal light it and leave it to get red by itself for thus left the draught will produce a tremendous fire and you will cast better so than if you made fire with your bellows i must warn you too to make your crucibles out of clean iron for earthenware ones would easily crack this iron should however be coated over inside and out with a paste of clean ashes about half a finger in thickness which must dry well before the silver is put in some take for this solution clay mixed with cloth parings and the one is as good as the other for the rest you proceed with your casting just as i showed you above end of section twenty one section twenty two of the treatises of benvenuto cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by benvenuto cellini translated by c r ashby this librivox recording is in the public domain the treatise on goldsmithing chapter twenty one yet another furnace such a one as i made in the castle of st angelo at the time of the sack of rome these kinds of furnaces are the best of all it was dire necessity that taught me how to make them because i had absolutely no means at hand for doing my work being in a confined place where i had to set about using my wits i made a virtue of necessity i broke the bricks out of a room and with these bricks i set to work to construct a furnace in the form of a bake oven footnote fornello a foggia di una meta End footnote. the bricks were arranged alternately so that between every brick was an opening of about two fingers wide and as i went on i narrowed them in upwards footnote e così lo andai restringendo and footnote when i had raised it about a cubit's height from the ground i constructed footnote io lo avevo congegnato drento di modo che and footnote a grating of shovel handles and spears which i broke and from this point i continued building the furnace up and round to about one and a quarter cubits height narrowing it in towards the top then i found an iron ladle which they were by chance using in the kitchen and as it was pretty big i caked it round with a paste of ash and pounded clay footnote terra mesiolata and footnote and filled it with as much gold as it would contain and gave it the full fire straight off as there was no danger of the crucible cracking when the first lot was cast i filled it up again and so on till i had melted up about one hundred pounds of gold the whole thing went very easily and tis about the best and simplest method you can employ 
perhaps you think that i ought to go and give you a diagram of it all here in my book but i fancy that any one who knows anything at all about the craft of founding will perfectly well understand by description so that's enough for furnaces end of section twenty two Section 23 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 22 How to Fashion Vessels of Gold and Silver, Likewise Figures and Vases, and All that Pertains to that Branch of the Craft called Groceria when the silver is cast in the manner described above in the first furnace it is as well to let it cool on the iron plates above mentioned because by doing so it contracts better footnote melio e si condensa End footnote. when it is cold you clean off the rough edges from around it this done you make a scraper footnote rasoio literally a razor End footnote about two and a half fingers broad, and it should be blunted. To it you attach a stick shaped with two handles, and these are distant about half a cubit from the point of the scraper. Note that the scraper should be bent about three fingers. Footnote. Vuole essere piaggiato tre dite, perhaps inclined. End footnote. And such as is used for scraffito work, Graffiare. Footnote. This may mean only hatching or cutting generally. End footnote. With this scraper, the silver plate is to be planed, and in this wise. You make your silver plate red hot, and place it on one of the iron plates you use for casting it on. Fastening it on tightly with certain iron tools used for nailing or fastening. Footnote conficare o congeniare and footnote then setting the handle of the scraper to your shoulder with your two hands to the two handles that come fastened to it so that it comes to be in the form of a cross you pair off the surface of your silver plate with very firm pressure till it is thoroughly clean footnote mr haywood summer tells me that the tool here described is not used in modern scraffito work it would, by the description, however, be something like the diagram here shown. End footnote. I won't omit to tell you of a method I once learnt. Whilst in Paris I used to work on the largest kind of silver work that the craft admits of, and the most difficult to boot. I had in my employ many workmen, and inasmuch as they very gladly learnt from me, so I was not above learning from them. The plates I planed with such diligence gave them cause for much marvelling, but, none the less, one charming youth, on whom I set great store, said to me, with the utmost modesty, that in Paris it was not customary to plane the plate in the way we did it, and, albeit our method seemed very clever, he would undertake to produce the same result without all this planing, and so gain much time. To this I replied that I should only be too delighted to save any time, so I gave him a pair of vases to do, weighing twenty pounds apiece, and my models for them. Before my very eyes, the youth melted his silver in the way I told above, and cast it between his iron plates. Then he cleaned some of the edges off, and set to right away to hammer it into shape, and give it its rotundity, of which more anon, without paring it in any way. Both vases he turned out in this way with great care and admirable technique. Footnote. Pratica. End footnote. It is just because in Paris more work of this kind is done than in any other city of the world that the craftsmen, from constant practice, acquire such marvellous technical skill. I should never have believed it had I not seen it for myself. Then, at first... I thought that it was the quality of silver that gave them a vantage, because they work here with a finer quality of silver than anywhere else. But my workman said no, and that silver of baser alloy would serve his purpose equally well. 
I tried him, and found that it was so. From which I conclude, therefore, that a man can start straight away with shaping what he wants out of his silver, without wasting needless time in planing it up first. Of course, care has to be taken to remove certain little blemishes, footnote, sfogliette, probably little surface scalings of the metal, and footnote, from time to time. I do not go so far as to say that it is bad to plane the metal first. Nay, I have found either way good. Now let us consider how to make a vase in the shape of an egg. I follow, as always, my promised method of giving you of my own creations for different princes and great persons. In Rome I made, among many other vases, two big ones in the form of an egg, each about a cubit high, with lips and handles spreading out from the top. Footnote. Strette di sopra. And footnote. One was for the Bishop of Salamanca, a Spaniard, and the other for Cardinal Chibo. Both were elaborately ornamented with foliage and animals of various kinds. These vases were called ewers. Footnote. Aquarecce. And footnote and were used by the cardinals on their credence tables on occasions of state. Inasmuch as I made numbers of these for King Francis in Paris, and as they were all larger and more richly wrought, I shall draw my illustrations from them. You take your plate and trim off the rough edges, plane it on both sides, and slightly round the edges off. Footnote. Al quanto scantonato un poco. And, footnote. and for as much as the plates are cast in somewhat oblong shapes, you beat them into a rounded shape with your hammer, and this is how you do it. You take your red-hot plate, not too red, for then it would crack. Footnote. Spezzerebbe. And footnote. But sufficient, I would say, to burn certain little grains of powder or dust thrown onto it and put it on the stake, and you beat it very firmly with the thin end of the hammer from one angle to the other, driving the metal well to the centre. Footnote. E fa che l'entri bene. And footnote. So that when all the four corners of your plate are done, it will be marked somewhat the shape of a cross. Footnote. Verà ferito in riscontro di croce. And footnote. After this, you reverse the process and work with the hammer outwards, annealing the plate some four times, till it is of such roundness as your good craftsman may see fit. And when it is rounded into the shape of the vase you have in mind, you must see that the measurement of the diameter of your plate exceeds that of the future vase by about three fingers, and that the plate must be kept as thick as possible in the middle. Before you hit this size exactly, you take an iron stake about a finger thick and six fingers long, as blunt as possible so as not to pierce the plate. This tool you put with its broad end on the anvil, and you very carefully balance. Footnote. See Cognania. and footnote. Your silver plate on the point of the stake until it stands steady by its own weight. When the point is fixed, Get one of your handy lads to strike it with the broad end of the hammer, so that it makes a mark in the plate. I have no doubt there are masters who can find the centre point straight away without having recourse to this little dodge, especially when working on small plates, but for large pieces I have always found it very helpful. After this you turn the plate round again on the anvil, and strike it in the same manner on the stake till the point, which so far was only indicated, is now boldly marked. Then you take your compasses and strike a circle which will show you how far your outline is out, and so on, hammering the silver in conformity with it by repeated heating and beating. All the while you have to be very careful not to lose your centre point, and to beat the silver out, as I said before, so that the diameter of the plate exceeds that of the future vase by some three fingers. Applying your compasses again, you strike a series of concentric circles about a half a finger apart from each other, and starting from the centre of the cup. Then you take a kind of hammer about one finger thick at the narrow end, and one and a half at the broad end, 
this hammer is battered and rounded off footnote scantonato e tonda and footnote into somewhat the shape of the fleshy part of a finger and with it you begin beating in the middle of the plate at the centre point in fact being careful always not to lose the point the movement of the hammer should be in the form of a spiral footnote chioccola we had the word above as applied to the female screw and footnote and follow the concentric circles you take turn about in beating and heating in this manner till you see the silver grow into the shape of a hat or at least its crown footnote copper and footnote and thus approximating to the form of your vase the thing to observe is that the metal should spread equally all round for if it gives more on one side than the other it would be uneven and in this way you draw it inwards till it is as deep as the body of your model requires then with various different stakes each adapted specially to the form you are at work on you beat now with the broad now with the narrow end of the hammer and right into the body of your vase till it is equally bellied all round and when this has all been very carefully done always working on the stakes some of which are called cow's tongues footnote lingua di vacca and footnote because of their shape you work up the neck of the vase to the necessary height and similarly on other stakes specially curved for the purpose you little by little narrow out the neck any little imperfections footnote sfogliatina and footnote on the surface you remove as you go on and so finally see the neck of the vase take the perfect shape you wish it to have when you have thus finished the neck you can begin to work the bas-relief on the body of the vase like a vase for instance that i made for king francis footnote see vita page three hundred and twenty one and footnote it was one among many but it was the finest of the lot i filled it with black pitch made in the manner i described to you before then i divided out the body of the vase for the figures animals and leaves which i drew on it with a stylus of burnished steel this done i drew them over again with pen and ink using all the delicacy that good drawing requires then i took my punches these are of iron about the length of a finger and about the thickness of a goose's quill they are all shaped in different ways some are fashioned like a c beginning with a small c and ending with a large one footnote what our metal workers call semi-ring tools and footnote some are bent more some less and some are almost quite straight footnote curved chasers and footnote others again are greater diminishing from the size of a man's thumb to six different smaller sizes and all these selections you ought to have with them and with a hammer weighing some three or four ounces and striking most dexterously you beat into relief whatever you have designed then you place your vase on a slow fire and melt out the pitch after this you heat the vase once more and clean it with a solution of tartar and salt in equal proportions as i described above when the vase is quite clean you employ a set of iron tools like stakes and with long horns footnote con le corne lunghe and footnote technically termed caccian fuori snarling irons they are made of pure iron long or short as the case may be and as the work may need these caccian fuori have to be fastened into the anvil stock footnote brinkman translates a vice and footnote then you put one of the horns into the vase so that the point of the horn which should be in shape and rounded like your little finger is applied to the inside of the vase and to the parts you want to beat out and you very gently strike the other end of it with the hammer so that the blow passing to the end of the horn adjoining the body of the vase bosses up the silver from within at such points as your learned and cunning master may deem well 
when this process has been applied to all the figures, animals and foliage, you heat and cleanse the vase once more, once more fill it with pitch, and with other sorts of punches, similar in all respects to the first, but having their ends shaped like beans, and large or small as the case may be, you begin the bossing again. Each master uses his own particular punches, and all have their own little ways of working, but all have this in common, that the punches do not cut, but only press the metal. The process of melting out and reapplying the pitch may now be repeated two or three times as may be thought necessary, till you have got your figures and foliage to the highest point of workmanship, then melt it out for the last time. After this you may proceed to fashion in wax whatever graces may have place at lip or handle, improving on the model or design with which you started. These finished, you can make them in all sorts of different ways, ways so many that they were wearisome to recount. The easiest of these was the one I usually employed, and particularly in the vase I made for King Francis. Footnote. This is the ordinary Chire Perdue process. End footnote. I took earth, such as the makers of artillery use, dried it and sifted it well, then I mixed it with fine cloth shearings and a little cow's dung sifted through a sieve. Then I beat it all well together. After this I took some Tripoli, such as jewellers use to polish their gems with, pounded it up very fine, and made from it a pigment as for painting, streaking it over the wax ornaments. This I also did to the inlet holes and vent channels, after I had duly affixed them to the models. I always took care to fix these vent holes down below, and pass them upwards, but at such distance from the inlet channel that none of the silver should spill into them, and thus prevent them doing their work. When I had applied the first coat of Tripoli, I let it dry. Then I took the clay of which I told you before, and coated the work over to the thickness of a knife's back, letting it dry again, and repeating this process till the different coats were about a finger thick. Then I bound it all round with iron bands, as many as it could hold. Over these iron bands I put more coats of clay, this time mixed up with rather more cloth shearings than I had used previously, and applied another coat again of a knife's back's thickness. Then I applied the whole to a slow fire, holding the vent holes downwards, and so gradually melted out the wax, which I caught in a little receptacle down beneath. One has to be very careful not to have the fire too hot, for that would make the wax bubble, and so damage the mould within. When the wax is quite melted out, you remove the mould from where it is attached to the vase, clean it carefully of all wax, and close up the place where it is attached to the vase with the same earth that is used above. This done, you bind the whole thing round again with fine bands of iron wire, and cover it up completely with a further coating of the Tripoli mixture. Then you heat it on charcoal, firing it and the charcoal together in a brick furnace, and mind to get it well baked, for this kind of earth differs from others, in that it should all be fired at one turn. Meantime, have your silver ready for casting, or, I would say, molten, and while this is in progress, put your mould into a large receptacle filled with sand, which should be moist, not wet, and fix it in well as to the casters of artillery into their troughs, but with the greater delicacy that the handling of lighter metal requires. Footnote, i.e. smaller work. End footnote. When your silver is well molten, throw finely powdered tartar over it to keep it fresh. Then take a piece of linen, the size of a crucible, folded into four and soaked with olive oil, and spread it over the tartar that covers the silver, and grip the crucible with the tongs called imbracciatoia. You ought to have many kinds of these, small, medium, great, and adaptable to the quantity of silver you have to melt. They hold the crucible together and prevent it breaking. That happened to me many a time. Just as you've got your silver nicely molten and are pouring it into the mould, crack goes your crucible, and all your work and time and pains are lost. Take note, therefore, of this. 
while pouring your silver into the mould, let one of your assistants hold the linen rag from slipping from the crucible, for by so holding the rag on it has two good results. It keeps the silver warm, and it prevents the little bits of coal from falling into the mould. This also you may take note of. If you have little masks and such-like conceits to apply to your vase, when you have fashioned them all carefully in wax, and taken them off the vase, having made moulds of them as above described, you lay in the hollow of the moulds a coating of wax, a thin knife's back more or less in thickness, or of such thickness as you wish your mask to be. This coating you spread equally all over. In the craft it is called the lasagna. When you have fixed on to it the inlet channel and the vent holes, just as I have told you above, the latter fixed at the bottom and turning to the top, you fill in the hole with the clay, bind around with wire, and cast in the same way as before. Footnote. This is probably what we should call a cord casting. End footnote. This method you can employ in the handles and the feet of your vase, where you find the hammer difficult to work with, and I counsel you in working large vases always to employ this method of casting. End of section 23section twenty four of the treatises of benvenuto cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by benvenuto cellini translated by c r ashby this librivox recording is in the public domain the treatise on goldsmithing chapter twenty three another method for gold and silver in such things let us take another method of casting similar to the last i have tried it often and found it splendid tis this you take some fresh, finely powdered and ground gesso, and you grind in like manner, and mix with it a little brick dust, two-thirds of the latter to one-third of the former. Mix them well together with clean cold water into a paste, then take a hog sable, and working with its softest part, paint over your wax model as you did before with the clay. This time you put it all on at one go, because as you gradually paint along with your brush, the gesso was gradually sets. Footnote. Rapigliare. End footnote. So that you can soon lay it on to a finger's thickness with a wooden spoon. Then you bind the mould with fine, well-tempered iron wire, weaving it all round, in and across, and, taking the thick rest of your gesso that has not been passed through the sieve, you moisten it with a little water and cake it onto the mould as before, to the thickness of a knife's back, till all the iron wire is well covered over. Of course, the larger your mould is, the larger must this shell of gesso also be proportionately. You will do well, too, unless pressed for time in finishing your work, to let the gesso dry a bit in the sun, or in a warm and smoky corner, so that all the moisture leaves it. Then you put it over a slow fire and melt out the wax as you did in the former process. Let the fire grow greater when the wax has all melted out, and bake the mould just as you did before with the earthen mould. This is a good and an expeditious way to work in, and very useful if you want to finish anything quickly. End of section 24 Section 25 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 24, A Third Method for Similar Things. In the third method, the wax models are cut into small pieces, powdered and moulded in clay, and set in the troughs as described above. When the moulds are made, with due observance to the undercutting, I say this advisedly, lead castings are made from them, and these as well cleaned and worked up as the master may be minded. Then they are cast in silver in the same troughs as I told you before. This is a particularly good way, because when the master has his lead model, and has finished it up to suit his purpose, it can serve ever so many more times than a single casting. 
End of section 25section twenty six of the treatises of benvenuto cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by benvenuto cellini translated by c r ashby this librivox recording is in the public domain the treatise on goldsmithing chapter twenty five of figures made in silver and greater than life size now as to the way of making a great statue of silver and when i say a great statue i mean as big as a live man or bigger statues of one and a half cubits high i have of course seen plenty of in rome on the altar of st peter's and albeit the making of these is pretty difficult and many excellent masters employ on them much admirable work still these smaller statues present no greater difficulties in the way of soldering because they can be handled in the furnace entire moreover they are made of thinner plates footnote lamine and footnote of silver than the large ones the actual process of both is much the same but the large ones are so much harder to manage that i for my part have never seen any that were presentable according to my promise of giving you some practical example either of work i have seen of others or of my own making i'll tell you the following the emperor charles v was passing through france in the time of francis i for the great war had ended and francis my glorious king among the other wonderful presents he had given to the emperor gave him a silver statue of a hercules with two columns which was about three and a half cubits high you remember how i described above the beauty of all the things made in that great city of paris well i have never seen anywhere else in the world such perfect hammer work as in that city but with all their technique in the methods of embossing not even the best masters were able to give to that statue either grace beauty or style footnote from the point of view of the italian cinquecento master it would be correct thus to render the word arte in this context End footnote and for the simple reason that they did not know how to solder properly and so had to stick on the legs and the head and the arms by means of fastening footnote legala brinkman translates riveting and footnote them with silver wire now king francis wanted to have eleven statues like this made and he complained to me that those men of his had not been able to undertake such a job and he asked me if it lay in the art to do it and if i saw my way through i replied that most assuredly did i see my way through that i could do these things much better than talk about them and that when done they would be one hundred times finer than was anticipated and this was the way in which i began explaining it to that great king and quoth i there are many different ways of doing the thing and each master chooses the method to which his technical excellence or his fancy guides him first of all you make a statue in clay of the size you want your silver statue to be then you make a gesso mould of it in many pieces and this is the way the whole breast to the middle of the ribs at the sides and to the juncture of the throat above and the legs at the groining below forms one piece the next piece comprises the back from the juncture of the neck and contains the shoulders and down to the buttocks these are the two main pieces in like manner must the arms legs and head all be formed into two pieces and because the undercuttings would impede the removal of the pieces these are filled up with wax the gesso moulds are then respectively cast in bronze and you have your sheet of silver handy of such size as may be deemed expedient by the skilful master and commence to hammer it over the bronze with wooden hammers carefully rounding the silver over the various forms by means of frequent annealing these forms come to be beautifully covered the discreet and cunning master in order to just connect separate pieces together footnote i am not sure whether this gives the right shade of meaning to attestasi but i follow brinkman End footnote applies a few additional hammer strokes to their edges 
and expands them to about two knife backs one over the other these edges he cuts into jags about two fingers apart with a pair of scissors fits the one into the other and with nice judgment tightens them with a hammer holding them over a round stake or some other piece of iron as shall hinder the hammer from indenting the silver where it had nothing to back it in this way all the pieces are done first the body then the legs arms and head after this they are filled with pitch and wrought over with hammer and punches to an exact likeness with the original clay model and finally soldered together into one when i had delivered myself of these words to the king he said it was all so clear and he had understood it all so well that he very nearly thought he would himself be able to undertake such work then i told his majesty that there were other methods which a master thoroughly conversant with his craft might employ and that these methods were really easier in execution though they seemed harder of explanation whereupon his majesty retorted that verily he was a great lover of genius footnote vertu and footnote that i had spoken so convincingly of the first that he would willingly take my word for the other one of them was as follows when i had cast the king's silver into sheets in the way i told above and had my clay model of the subsequent size of the silver ready completed i went straight at the job with sheer ability of hammer work footnote vertu del martello and footnote together with my general skill of craftsmanship striking from front and from back in whatever way the art demanded by this method i got through much quicker than the first arms legs and body i hammered out in separate pieces and the head in one whole piece just as it were a vase and in the manner i told of once before when i had given them all their shape i soldered and fitted them together as before the solder i used was ottavo that is a solder composed of one-eighth part of an ounce of copper to one of silver to do the soldering i had fixed to the tube of my big bellows several channels of such length as i deemed necessary for the purpose of blowing from below on the beds of coal that i had placed under the back of my work when this and the coal was a glow that is of a golden colour i blew the bellows on it gradually and made the solder run and i kept on with this now applying it from above now from below wherever i thought it necessary and going from point to point footnote a nulla specuavo etc i take this to mean that he moved the heat of the flame about and about from point to point and footnote i have said nothing about borax for it stands to reason as any one who knows anything about his business is aware that no soldering can be done without it if it turns out that owing to the length of the pieces some of them are not completely soldered and that fresh solder and borax is needed i used instead of water to take a bit of tallow candle in order not to have to cool the whole of my large piece and on this ointment i put my new solder and borax and this had the same effect as the water thus did i solder all the different members head arms feet each for itself filled them with pitch and with my punches gave the last finish but one footnote penultima manna and footnote to my work then came the job of soldering the big pieces together and that was where those great french experts failed i built in the middle of one of my large rooms and i mean exactly in the middle a little wall about one cubit from the ground four cubits long and one and a half wide and after fitting the parts to the body i bound them on with silver wire instead of iron wire which is usually employed and in this way doing three fingers width at a time and not without the greatest difficulty i bound the two legs to the body then i laid it on the wall over a good fire and applied quinto to it i e solder composed of one-fifth of an ounce of copper to one of silver i say copper not bronze footnote ottone cellini would have used the pure copper not any alloy for this purpose End footnote. 
because copper is easier to treat with the punches and holds better, albeit it does not run quite so easily. As I worked with eleven and a half silver to half copper, footnote, argento di undici legge e mezzo, twelve being quite pure, this would give about as little alloying metal as will work well. End footnote. I had nothing to fear as far as the latter was concerned, and I would have everyone aware that if he wished to make his job succeed, he must not employ inferior silver. When my work lay in position, I began, with four of my young men, to blow the fire with the aid of fans and hand bellows, until I saw the solder run, which I every now and then sprinkled a little soft ash over it, for if one were to use water instead of ash, one would not be able to add fresh solder where the old has run imperfectly. In this manner, following just the method I have described, I happily succeeded in soldering the whole piece with breast, legs, arms and head, and ere ever a piece cooled I managed to solder it on. The whole thing succeeded most admirably and was just lovely. So the entire statue, which was about four cubits high, was lifted off the fire all soldered. I cleaned it up with the tools for cleaning, which I described before, filled it with pitch, and gave it the final polish with the punches. Then I fixed it on a base of bronze, the latter about two-thirds of a cubit high, with sundry little subjects in bas-relief gilded and beautifully executed. The statue in question was a figure of Jupiter. Footnote. See references to this in the Vita, page 145, and elsewhere. End footnote. Holding the lightning bolt in his right hand, and from the lightning a torch was kindled. In his left he held a ball to symbolise the world. Round the head and the feet was abundance of ornamental detail, and all this was admirably gilded, the which was most difficult to do. Nor will I omit to tell how I cleaned, footnote, Biancire, end footnote, up the silver of so large a piece of work, albeit I have already described to you the process of cleaning silver, for there are exceptional difficulties in this case. I did it thus wise. I went to the shop of a dyer of woollen cloth, and got one of his big vessels, footnote, caldare, end footnote large enough to put my figure in, which, as I said, was about four cubits high, and weighed about three hundred pounds. Then I took four iron rods, each about four cubits long, and four chestnut staves, somewhat longer than the iron rods. When the figure was carefully cleaned of its solder, and made smooth and polished and carefully pumiced over, we lifted it with the four iron rods onto a big bed of coal spread out on the ground, and large enough to hold the figure. This we did not do, however, till the coals were burnt out, had lost their vigour, and were well spent. Then we covered the figure all over, shovelling the embers upon it, a very tiring job this, as you may imagine, because of the heat and fume of the embers. We went on shovelling them about over the statue, wherever the need was, till the whole piece was of as equal red heat all over. Then we raised it with the four iron rods, let it cool, and, when it was cold, had ready our vessel, footnote, caldare, and footnote, with the blanching solution, footnote, bianchimento, and footnote. That is to say, water with tartar and salt, composed as I described to you above, and into it we placed the figure by means of the four wooden staves, for the solution must not be touched by iron. When inside we stirred it about and scrubbed it all over with certain big hog-sable brushes, much like those used for whitening walls and objects of similar size. When we saw it getting white, we took it with great care out of this vessel and put it into another similar one, but filled with pure water, and here we carefully washed all the blanching solution off it, then we poured off the water and dried it very carefully, after which we set to gilding whatever parts had to be gilded. Though the gilding of this statue was a much harder job than you can possibly imagine, 
i do not intend here to enter into those difficulties of detail but will confine myself to saying a word or two about gilding in general forsooth it is a beautiful and marvellous craft this and it well becomes your big masters to know of it so that they may guide such as practice professionally i knew many both in france and in rome who applied themselves only to gilding but none the less i say that great masters ought not to practise this themselves for the quicksilver that has to be used for it is a deadly poison footnote smith serato cellini refers to the fumes End footnote. and so wears out the men that practise in it that they live but a few years End of section twenty six Section twenty seven of the treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter twenty six How to Gild. When you want to gild, you take the purest, cleanest twenty four carat gold and you beat it out with clean hammers on an anvil until you get it to the thinness of a sheet of writing paper then you cut up as much as you want into small pieces after this you take a new crucible never yet used and such as goldsmiths melt silver and gold in and into it you put so much quicksilver free from all impurities as may be needed for the gold you want to employ the proportion is at the rate of one ounce to a scudi's weight that is to say one part of gold to eight parts of quicksilver rather less than more of the latter note that you should first mix together the quicksilver and the gold in a clean vessel of earth or wood and you put the crucible on a fire of glowing embers but not using the bellows when the crucible is red you throw into it some of the mixed quicksilver and gold hold it over the fire and with a glowing amber gripped in a pair of tongs stir it thoroughly together your eye and the feel of your hand will tell you whether the gold be dissolved and united with the quicksilver great care has to be taken to aid the solution by rapid stirring for if you hold it too long the gold or rather the amalgam will get too thick if on the other hand you hold it on too short a time it'll be too thin and the gold not well mixed the great care which this requires can only be got by practice when it is all mixed and dissolved and everything done in the manner described you take the hot mixture and pour it into a little beaker or vase in accord with the amount of the gold you've mixed and this vase is filled with water so that you hear it hissing when you pour the mixture in then you wash it thus two or three times in other clean water till finally your water is quite clean and pure and then you set about the actual gilding as follows wherever you want to gild on your work you have to get it well polished and scratch brushed footnote gratta pugiata and footnote for so it is called in the craft these scratch brushes are made of brass wire about as thick as thread footnote refe di cucire and footnote and done up into bundles about as thick as a man's finger more or less in accordance with the size of the work you want to scrub and tied round with brass or copper wire of course you can buy these brushes at a grocer's but there they're usually sold only of one size so that your skilled workman if he wants to do his work well and has a large piece to do binds up his own brushes himself according to the size he wants after the scrubbing you put the amalgam on with an avivatoio footnote see vita page two hundred and fifty two and footnote for so we call the little rod of copper set in a wooden handle and much the same size and length as a table fork here again the size accords with the requirements of your work carefully then do you proceed to spread the amalgam over the places you want to gild true it is that some have put quicksilver on first and then spread the amalgam after but this is not a good method 
for too many mercury dulls the colour and the beauty of the gold. Others, again, have thought to do better by putting the gold on in successive times. This I have likewise seen done, but have come to the conclusion that the best way is to put all the gold on at once that you want for your gilding, and then heat it over a slow fire, till all the quicksilver goes off in fumes. If you notice that the gold on your work is not even, you can, while it's still warm, very easily add on as much as may make it so, till all is covered with gold. Then let it cool by itself. I forgot to say in its proper place that if the gold won't stick on, you'll do well to have a little of the whitening water, footnote, Bianchimento, and footnote, of which I told you above, and you dip your avivitoio with the gold in this water, and if that still won't help you, take a little aqua fortis evaporated and weakened, and there's no doubt that'll do it. End of section 27「Section 28 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 27, A Recipe for Making Colours and Colouring the Gilded Parts. The first is colour for thin gilding. You take equal proportions of sulphur, tartar well pounded, and salt, grinding them separately, and then you take half a part of curcuma, footnote, more correctly curcuma, turmeric root, end footnote, and you mix them all four together. When you have the gilded parts well cleaned and scratch brushed, as I described above, you take a little urine of children or boys, put it tepid into a clean pipkin, and apply it with hog sables and the virtue of the urine and the sables will remove any dirt or grease that may have come on the gold. This done, you get a copper cauldron, or mayhap an earthen pot, and in one of the twain, after filling it with boiling water, you put your colour composition, and stir it well up with a rod or a bunch of twigs, till it is thoroughly dissolved and mixed. Then you tie a bit of string, long enough to hold it by, onto the work, and dangle it in for such time as one might say an Ave Maria. After this you pull it out, and dip it into a vase of clear cold water. If it has not taken colour enough, you put it back again into the hot water, and so on for two or three times till it be sufficient, minding, however, not to let it stay in over long, or else it will turn black and spoil the gilding. This colouring matter is the weakest one can make, and can only be used for one turn. End of section 28 Section 29 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini Translated by C. R. Ashby This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing Chapter 28 a recipe for making another sort of gilding colour. Take red chalk, footnote, matita rossa, and footnote, verdigris, saltpetre, vitriol, footnote, vitriolo, probably green vitriol, i.e. sulphate of iron, and footnote, and salts of ammonia, but half as much of the first as of the other ingredients. Take each by weight and pound each separately, and be careful to pound them very fine. When pounded, stir them up in clear water to the consistency of a paste, and while you're stirring, see that you go on grinding them up till all the particles are well blended. This done, you must put them in a rather big vase, because the composition bubbles up, and mind that the vase has a glazed surface, or better still be of glass, and let it be corked. In order to put the colour on, your work must needs be thickly gilded, or else it will turn black, for this colour is very powerful. But if it be sufficiently strongly gilded, the work will colour beautifully. The colouring stuff is applied with a paintbrush, but you must mind not to touch the silver, 
or you will black it. Painted over in this wise, you set your work to the fire, give it a good steaming, and dip it into fresh water. But you must mind not to overdo the steaming, or the gold would be eaten away and not hold. End of section 29「Section 30 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 29. How to make a third gilding colour for very thick gilding. Footnote. Que sia abundantemente carico di oro. End footnote. Take the work you want to gild, and in the same way as described above, clean it. Footnote. Cellini refers to the preliminary cleaning with urine described in chapter 27. End footnote. And gild it. Then skilfully dry it. Don't be particular as to drying it too much. Only let it be free of all quicksilver. Then clean it again lightly, and heat it over live embers. Whilst it is in the process of heating, spread on it a kind of wax, which I'll describe below. When the wax is spread, let the work cool, then have a fire ready of such nature as shall melt off the wax without heating the metal to redness. When heated in this way, rinse it out in a solution of tartar and water, what among goldsmiths is called grammata. This done, let it stand for such time as you can say an Ave Maria. Then clean it with a brush in fresh water, rubbing it well. Footnote. Ristiaria di buon vantaggio. End footnote. If your work has been well gilded, you may further colour it with a process I shall tell you of shortly. But as to do so you have first to wax it, I'd best tell you to begin with how that wax is made, and tis in this wise. End of section 30 Section 31 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini Translated by C. R. Ashby This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 30 How to Make the Wax for Gilding Take five ounces of new wax, half an ounce of red chalk, that is to say, red stone chalk for drawing, footnote, lapis rosso di disegnare, French, sanguine, end footnote, half an ounce of Roman vitriol, footnote, vitriolo romano, sulfate of iron, end footnote, three pennyweights, footnote, denari, End footnote, of Ferretto di Spagna, footnote, possibly calcined sulphate of iron, French, ferret, and footnote, that is, of the weight of a ducat, or one-eighth of an ounce, or it may be a bit less, half an ounce of verdigris, and three pennyweights of borax. Mix all these things together, and melt them with the wax, and apply them as above described. After this, when the wax is cleaned off, you can give it the colouring that follows here under. End of section 31 Section 32 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini Translated by C. R. Ashby This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 31 how to make yet another colouring. Take half an ounce of Roman vitriol, half an ounce of saltpetre, six penny weights of salts of ammonia, half an ounce of verdigris, and pound them upon a stone. Do not use iron. Pound the salts of ammonia first very carefully, then all the others together. Then mix them in a glazed vessel, footnote, pentolino, and footnote, with as much water as shall make them have the consistency of a sauce. Stir them over the fire with a piece of wood, and let them boil for such space as you can say two paternosters. 
do not give them a strong fire for that would spoil them everything in moderation let them cool and use them as is here written in the manner following end of section thirty two Section 33 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 32, The Manner of Applying the Said Colour. Let your work be dried with a clean cloth, then, by means of a few feathers, streak it over with the above concoction in the same way as you did when colouring the gold with the verdigris mixture. Then put it on the fire. When you see it drying and beginning to steam hard, do not let it steam quite dry, dip it in cold water. Then clean it up, and once again let it simmer slowly in the tartar solution. Footnote. Bolire freddo nella gramata. End footnote. For such space as you may say in Ave Maria. Yet again clean it in water and polish it where you will. This gives the loveliest gilding, and of the most beautiful colour that can be made, and lasts for ever. End of section 33. Section 34 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 33. What you do when you wish to leave bare the silver in certain places. When you have cleaned up the parts where the gold is not to stick, you take some flower dust, such as you may gather on the walls and cornices of mills, and we in Florence call fuscello, and you mix it with water to the consistency of a paste, and with a camel's hair brush lay it thick on the parts not to be gilded, after which you dry it well before a slow fire, and can gild safely. Another way, too, may be employed where the flour dust is not used. You take gesso in the cake, footnote, gesso in pane, and footnote, such as the shoemakers use, pound it up well, and make a paste of it either with stag glue, footnote, colla cervona, probably a glue made of stag skins or chippings. In Cennino Cennini is a footnote on glues, quoting from Dioscorides, a glue, colla torina, hence possibly cervona from cervo. And footnote. Or better with fish glue. Footnote. Colla di pesce. And footnote. But mind that either glue be well mixed with water, so that it does not get too stiff. And inasmuch as I want to omit nothing, I bid you note that this gesso is best employed when you merely want to gild and leave the silver white whereas the flour-dust method is best used when you want in addition to colour the gold as above described. This is as much as you need know about such matters. Now, though, of a truth, the prime merit of every craft is your being well able to practise it yourself, yet, none the less, it were better to leave these processes of gilding to those who are specialists, for it is, as I said, very unhealthy, footnote, perniziosima, and footnote, to practice. Know how it's done. That's all. End of section 34. Section 35 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 34, How to Make Two Kinds of Aquafortis, One for Parting, the Other for Engraving and Etching. Footnote. Aqua da Partire is the acid into which you put alloys and clippings, filings, etc., to separate gold from silver, or silver from copper, or gold from gilt copper, in other words, nitric acid. Partitore is the man who exercises this trade. 
Herpley's Manual, Oreficeria, published Milan, gives information about the modern way of using acids for separating or parting. End footnote. First I will talk of that mixture with which you etch on copper instead of cutting with the graver. This is an easy and a very beautiful method. Aquafortis for etching is made thus. You take half an ounce of sublimate, footnote, solimato. Can this be sublimed sal ammoniac? End footnote. One ounce of vitriol, half an ounce of rock alum, footnote, alumni di rocca, end footnote, half an ounce of verdigris, and six lemons, and after having care to pound the first mentioned substances well, you boil them a little in the lemon juice, but not so as to let them get too dry. The boiling should be done in a glazed pot, and if you have no lemons, you may take strong vinegar, which will give a like result. When you have well smoothed your copper plate, you can take any ordinary varnish. Footnote. Vernice ordinaria. End footnote. Such as is used for the lacquering of the ornaments on daggers and other iron work, and heat it gently, putting a little wax with it. This you do to prevent the varnish from cracking when you draw upon it. It must not be too hot when you spread it on your copper plate. When you have etched on your design, make a ridge of wax round the plate and pour on the parting water, letting it stand not longer than half an hour. If then it be not bitten deep enough, do it again. Then remove it and clean it well with a sponge. You draw on the varnish with a stylus of well-tempered steel, that is, an iron needle, which in the craft is termed a stealer. You wash the varnish off the plate with a sponge of warm oil, but very softly, so as not to destroy the intaglio. Then you use the plate and stamp impressions onto cardboard from it, in just such a manner as plates done with the graver. It is true that this sort of plate is produced very easily, but then, you see, they don't last near so long as those done with the graver. End of section 35section thirty six of the treatises of benvenuto cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by benvenuto cellini translated by c r ashby this librivox recording is in the public domain the treatise on goldsmithing chapter thirty five how to make aquafortis for parting aquafortis for parting footnote partire end footnote is made thus you take eight pounds of burnt rock alum Footnote, alume di rocca arso. Professor Church tells me that this is probably sulphate of alumina from alum shale. End footnote. And an equal quantity of the best saltpetre, and four pounds of Roman vitriol, and put them all together into the alembic. Footnote, boccia. Beringoccio, in the fourth book of his Pyrotechnica, Venice, 1540, Chapter 1, gives an illustrated description both of such an alembic and of how aquafortis for parting is distilled. See also the French edition of the same book, translated by Jacques Vincent, Rouen, 1627. End footnote. Add to these things a little aquafortis that has already been used, exercising your discretion as to the quantity. And in order to give a good looting, Footnote, loto, the closing of the joints, and footnote, to your alembic, take horse dung, iron filings, and brick dust in equal proportions, and mix them up with the yolk of a hen's egg. Then smear the mixture over the alembic as far as the furnace will allow. Then, for the rest, put it to a moderate fire, as the want is. End of section 36. Section 37 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini. Translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Goldsmithing, Chapter 36 How to Make Royal Cement. 
Take the gold you wish to refine and beat it thin. Cut it into little pieces of the size and the thickness of a golden scudo. Sometimes the scudi themselves are taken and a twenty-four carat cement refined direct from them. And in this simple... Footnote. Cellini may intend a stronger sense to the word semplice. End footnote. Cement has such virtue that it can draw all the alloy footnote lega and footnote out of the scudo itself without destroying the impression on the coin but drawing from it only what was of base metal the cement is made in this wise take tartar and brick dust and make a paste of them construct a round furnace footnote see above furnace construction and footnote and into the joints of the furnace, between one brick and another, spread the paste. Put your pieces of gold, or the scudi themselves, if you use them, into the paste, and cover them well up with more of it. Then fire for twenty-four hours, at the end of which time they will be refined to twenty-four carats. Footnote. Cellini appears not to have quite understood the process. Geber, who gives the oldest description of it, Alchemiae Gebri Arabis Philosophi Solatissimi Libri, etc., Joan Petraeus Nuremburgen Denuo Bernae Excudie Faciebat, Anno 1545, page 51, gives the ingredients thus vitriol, ferrous sulphate, sal ammoniac, flour of copper, scale of oxide of copper formed by heating the metal with access of air, ground old earthen pot, sulphur in the smallest quantity or none at all man's urine together with similar sharp and penetrating substances etc see percy's metallurgy murray eighteen eighty part one page three hundred and eighty five professor roberts austin adds that usually the cement and the gold to be purified were placed together into a porous earthen pot and not between the joints of the brickwork End footnote. Know, gentle reader, that this screed of mine is not writ for the purpose of teaching such as are refiners, footnote, partitore, end footnote, by profession, how to make aquafortis. My only care is to show how and to what end it may serve the art of goldsmithing. For it came about that having made certain golden figures half a cubit high for King Francis, when they were near the ending, drawing the softening in the fire, it happened they got a film of lead fumes across them. And had I not covered them over with this cement lotion, they would have gone brittle as glass. Footnote. I am assured that this is a point of considerable scientific interest. End footnote. Then I gave them six hours moderate firing, and so in this way freed them from so evil a blemish. The end of the treatise of goldsmithing. End of section 37. Section 38 of the treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The treatise on sculpture, chapter 1, on the art of casting in bronze. As in other places I have done, so now will I do afresh, and, in order to give more surety and confidence to him that reads this screed of mine, adduce examples from sundry great works in bronze that I made for King Francis while in the glorious city of Paris. Those bronzes, in part, I finished, the greater part I left imperfect. One of the completed ones was a lunette about eight cubits across, made for the gateway of Fontainebleau. For this arch I fashioned a statue about seven cubits long, in rather more than half relief. It was a figure personifying the fountain. Under its left arm were vases, from which water seemed to flow, and its right arm was posed upon the head of a stag, a great part of whose neck was brought out in full relief. On one side of the lunette were a number of dogs, that is to say, setters, footnote, brachy, and footnote. 
and greyhounds. On the other side were fashioned stags and wild boar. Above the lunette I made two little angels with torches in their hands, as signifying victory, and over the whole was the salamander, the emblem of the king. There was abundance of rich festoonment, and two great satires for the pilasters of the gate. These latter were not cast, but were left in a state ready for casting. The lunette, however, was cast in several pieces, and the first and biggest was the nymph of Fontainebleau herself. Footnote. See Cellini's allusion to this in the Vita. End footnote. Her head and other portions of her body stood out in full relief, while the rest were in half relief. The way I fashioned her was as follows. I made a model in clay of just the size the figure was to be. This done, I estimated that the shrinkage would be about one finger's thickness. So I very carefully went over the hole, touching it up and measuring it as the art directs. Footnote misurando come prometta late. End footnote. Then I gave it a good baking, and after that I spread over the whole an even coat of wax of less than a finger's thickness. Footnote. I interpret this to mean that he made measurements with a view to regulating the subsequent wax coat, which was in the end to be replaced by the bronze. Brinkman interprets it otherwise, According to him, the meaning would be that, because of the shrinkage, Cellini gave the figure another coat of clay. But this appears to me to imply a misunderstanding of the process. See also Simmons' interpretation of this method in the Vita. End footnote. Similarly, adding wax where I thought it needed it, or even taking a little away from off the waxen coat that was over the hole. This method I pursued till I had completed it with infinite diligence and care. After this, I pounded up some ox bone, or rather the burned core of ox horns. It is like a sponge, ignites easily, and is the best bone that you can get anywhere. With this I beat up half a similar quantity of gesso of Tripoli, and a fourth part of iron filings, and mixed the three things well together with a moist solution of dung of horses, or kine, which I first passed through a fine sieve with fresh water, till the latter took the colour of the dung. The whole formed a composition which I applied to my model with hog sables, arranging the bristles so that their softer and external ends formed the end of the sable, and were thus tenderer to work with and so gave the whole figure an equal coating of the composition all over. Then I let it dry, and similarly gave it two more coats, each time letting them dry. These coats were every one about the thickness of an ordinary table knife's back. This done, I gave it a coat, footnote, camicha, and footnote, of clay about half a finger thick, let it dry, gave it another coat about a finger thick, let that dry too, and finally gave it a third of the same thickness. End of section 38section thirty nine of the treatises of benvenuto cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by benvenuto cellini, translated by c r ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Sculpture, Chapter 2, How the Above-Mentioned Clay is Made The clay you use is made thus. You take such clay as is used by the ordnance makers for their moulds. It may be found in many places, but preferably nearby rivers, for there is a certain sandiness. Footnote. Aliquando Renosa. End footnote. Still, it must not be too sandy, Suffice it if it be thin, for the rich clay is delicate and soft, such as is used for small figures, cups, plates, and so forth, but not good for our purpose. Also you will find it in hills and grottoes, particularly round Rome and Florence, 
and in France at Paris. The clay from the latter city is the finest I ever saw, but as a rule the clay from grottoes is better than that from rivers. In order to obtain a good result, you must let it dry, and sift it carefully through a rather coarse sieve, in order to get rid of any pebbles, or bits of root, or of glass, and such like things. Then you mix it with cloth frayings, about half as much of the latter as you have clay, and take note that here is a wondrous mystery of the craft that has never yet been used by any but me. When the clay and the cloth frayings are mixed, and bathed with water to the consistency of a dough, you beat the mixture up well with a stout iron rod about two fingers thick, and, for this is the secret, you let it decompose for at least four months or more, the longer the better. For then the cloth frayings rot, and owing to this, the clay gets to be like an unguent. To those who have not had experience of this little trade secret of mine, the clay will appear too fatty, but this particular kind of fattiness in no wise hinders the accepting of the metal. Footnote. Lo accettare il metallo. End footnote. Indeed, it accepts it infinitely better, and the clay holds a hundred times more firmly so than if it had not rotted, I have used this kind of clay in ever so many most difficult works, all of which I shall tell of in their proper place. End of section 39section forty of the treatises of benvenuto cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by benvenuto cellini translated by c r ashby this librivox recording is in the public domain the treatise on sculpture chapter three another method of casting figures in bronze of life size or a little under model the figure you wish to cast directly in the clay and rag composition above described Finish your model most carefully as regards its proportions and its details of design, in fact, just as you wish to see it completed. When you have finished your figure, working it part in the fresh and part in the dry clay, as the art may require, and wishing to cast it in bronze, you give it a covering of painter's foil. Footnote. Stanuolo, i.e. tinfoil. End footnote. In order to do which, you first take a certain quantity of turps, heat it in a cauldron or pail, and when it is heated to boiling, streak it very carefully all over the figure with a hog's sable, taking heed not to injure a single muscle, vein, or other subtlety, and so very carefully apply your foil. This foil has to be beaten into very fine sheets, such as the painters use in many places, as, for instance, on their canvases for painting coats of arms. It is well enough known all the world over. Well, you put this foil over the clay figure, and, as you have to make a mould of gesso over that, you oil the whole figure well first. Were it not for the foil, it would be but ill-protected against the humidity and cohesive footnote, forza, and footnote, power of the gesso, but with the foil it is well protected. In this way you work to great advantage, for after the figure is cast in bronze, you still have your fine original model before you, and many youths and able workmen can help you clean the bronze figure up, while if you have no model to work to, this cleaning up takes a long time, is little to the poor master's liking, and has but a sorry result. This was what happened to me when I made the Perseus for the most illustrious Duke Cosimo, and which may still be seen on His Excellency's piazza. This, which was a figure of more than five cubits high, was made in the first of the two described methods. That is to say, it was modelled in the clay composition, and finished one finger's thickness under actual size. Footnote a finito magro in circa undito. End footnote. 
then it was well baked and the coat of wax modelled over it as in the case of the nymph at fontainebleau after this it was cast all in one piece in order to remove the core footnote l'anima or internal block and footnote so that the figure might be lighter i made through the wax a number of holes in the flanks shoulders and legs and at such places where i required them the result of this was that the core was kept in its place moreover i put over the wax those unguents which i referred to in the case of the nymph of fontainebleau then the two or three coats of clay next i bound it round with the iron of which i shall tell directly and then i cast it this casting was owing to its size the most difficult casting ever made but because i am now minded to tell of the casting of a smaller figure i will not muddle things too much by leaving my theme later on i shall not fail to enter upon a little dissertation about my perseus now i have to repeat then that the clay figure must have a kind of paste spread over it with a very soft paintbrush and little by little the foil is laid upon it this paste is made of flour dust and prepared in the way shoemakers do it or the mercers when they make berettas and satchels and such like and you must mind to make it very fine and thin and when you have put the foil in little pieces all over it and the whole figure is covered you can make your gesso mould there are diverse ways of making the gesso moulds the best however that i have come across and that i mostly use myself is to make as many small pieces as when put together would make a complete man and that without any undercutting as for instance feet hands head these small pieces must be made with great care and while the gesso is moist you fit into each of them an iron wire bent double and projecting out of the gesso much like a little ring so as to be capable of holding a thread through it each time that one of these small pieces is finished it must be tested and you must see if you get a good impression from it and if the piece relieves then if you see that the impression relieves without spoiling a single trifle of your work's delicacy you put the piece in its place again and with all a good master's ingenuity take the next piece off it leaving no rift whatever in between them such as would scar the work and so you go on little by little making the whole series of pieces observing the undercutting and whatever is demanded for the head hands feet etc in this manner you carefully make your division right down one half of the figure i mean the half taken lengthwise coming over the belly and the breasts down to the hips and from the bottom of them to the half of the heels footnote e da basso in sino alla metà dei taloni and footnote mind however that with these small pieces the figure is not entirely covered but leave a part of the breasts a part of the body a large part of the thighs and as much of the legs you must take care too that the pieces be so placed that they may be fitted together as one but there must be no undercutting because over this half figure will have to be cast a coat footnote camicia and footnote of fine gesso more than two fingers thick before doing this however you must mind to cover up with a little clay the iron rings which i told you before were to be put on the small pieces so that in putting on the coat they do not hinder it from being lifted off after this you carefully paint over with a brush of olive oil all such parts as shall come in contact with this coat in order that when the gesso is set the coat may easily relieve when you have tried a piece to see if it will relieve put it back in its place and finish the other or back half of the figure in the same way as i bade you do the front you must be very careful when you've finished your mould to take some strong thick cord and bind the whole figure together from top to bottom putting a lot of little wedges of wood in order to tighten the rope yet more 
and prevent the gesso from twisting. Footnote. Torche. And footnote. And buckling. In order not to run any risk of such twisting, you keep it thus bound up till all the moisture has gone from the gesso. When you see it quite dry, you unwind the cord and open the mould, and that is your first mould. Footnote. Che viene a essere quella prima camicia. End footnote. This, in small figures, may be of two pieces only. When I say small figures, I mean life-size or less. These may be made in two pieces. If they be larger than that, you must make them in four pieces, i.e. one piece on each side from the top to the navel, and another on each side from the navel to the bottom of the figure. In order to fit better together, these pieces must overlap the one upon the other a distance of about two fingers. This, all minutely accomplished, you proceed to open the mould and lay it back downwards on the ground, that is to say, with the concave sides of it facing upwards, and you take off one by one all the little pieces sticking to the figure, and put them into the cavities made by them in the mould. Footnote or mother mould, as the sculptors would call it. End footnote. At the same time removing the little bits of clay which you put on the iron rings, and in every place where the clay has left impressions, bore a hole with a small gimlet. Footnote. Succhielino di tutti che i pezzi che ti tenevano i sotto squadri. End footnote. Into the mother mould and attach to each iron ring a piece of strong cord. This cord you pass through the holes in the mother mould, and tie each piece up in this manner with a little splint of wood. When you have thus fitted all your little undercut pieces into the mother mould, footnote, da poi che tu arai vestito tutta la tua camicia, end footnote, you grease the whole mould with soft lard, and proceed to give it what is technically termed the lasagna, which is a cake about a good knife's back thick of wax, or clay, or paste. This is made thus. You take a piece of wood, and with the chisels cut out in it a square cavity, the shape of a man's palm, and of the depth of a good knife's back, more or less, in accordance with the thickness your figure is to have. Then you keep squeezing your cake, or lasagna, into this wooden shape, and apply it to the gesso mould of your figure, so as to let one piece touch the other. Then you lay the two halves together on the ground, side by side, and construct an iron framework which serves as a skeleton for the figure, and this must be made tortuously, and in accordance with the direction of the legs, arms, torso, and head of the figure. This done, you take clay beaten together with shavings of cloth, the thin clay of which I told you before, and little by little fit it round the skeleton, letting it dry, now by patient waiting, now by holding it before the fire, till the whole of your mould is filled. Then you test the two parts by repeatedly applying the one to the other. When this framework of earth and iron, which is called the kernel, not Sciolo, fills the figure so completely as to tally all round with the lasagna, you take it out, bind it round with thin iron wire from head to foot, and give it a good firing. Then you streak it over with a thin solution made of powdered bone and thin brick dust, mixed with a little of the clay and cloth frames, and apply it again to a rather slighter fire, this time so that the solution shall also be fired. Then you take the lasagna out of your mould, you must be very careful, too, to leave some pieces of the iron skeleton sticking out in at least four places, for they will keep the kernel from shifting, and these projections must tally with the gesso mould. When the lasagna is removed, you once more grease the gesso mould with fat, a little soft bacon fat is best, and it is also well to have it warm, for then it combines better with the gesso. Then you make the inlet holes, in which you want to pour your wax, and fit the kernel into the mould. Then stand the figure up straight, 
and make at least four vent holes two at the feet and two at the hands the more you make the surer you will be to fill your figure with wax the vent holes you make thus the first two you place right at the very bottom of the feet and it will be better for you to set your figure on a little eminence in order to do this more easily you must take a stout gimlet footnote succioletto and footnote and carefully bore a hole with it and this is best done if slanting downwards and see that you leave no fragments in the mould as you do it when you have made these holes you take a number of canes which you skilfully bend and so fit together that they start from the holes below and turn up straight alongside the figure binding one cane to another and all together into one up towards the top of the figure you must be careful too wherever the bits of cane join and wherever they fit into the holes to smear them well round with a little moist clay so as to prevent the wax from oozing out after this you can heat your wax and when it is molten pour it in this process now can be easily effected however difficult the pose of the figure may be if you observe the various little hints i have given you and above all give heed to the vent holes at the base after you have filled it with wax let it thoroughly cool for a whole day if it be summer say two days then undo the bindings with great care and loosen all the little bits of string that tie the pieces together within and are made for the undercuttings as i so carefully explained to you before when you have uncovered the one half you may complacently begin to try it from either front or back and i tell you this the fact of your having let the wax stand for that day or two according to the season of the year will cause a slight shrinkage in the wax of about the space of a horse's hair and so you will find it quite easy to remove this first piece from your figure then lay it down and proceed to do the like to the next piece and you will do well to lay both on long narrow benches so that you can get underneath them with your hands after this you remove from the figure all the pieces of the mould attached with the bits of string through the iron rings one by one ever so carefully and you polish and remove very nicely all the rough edges that may have been left on the figure by reason of the joinings of all the different pieces and in this manner you touch up the whole in doing this moreover if you are minded to add any subtle labour or fancy to your work you are easily able to do it after this footnote e di poi che tu ti sei resoluto and footnote you fashion in wax just as you erst made them for the earthen mould footnote tonaca and footnote all the vent holes for the bronze casting and mind that they all slant downwards to the bottom later when the figure has its last and earthen mould on these vents may easily be turned up with clay the method of doing this i shall describe minutely later as soon as i have shown how all the different coatings footnote loti and footnote from first to last are applied the mould bound up and the wax emptied out here all i want to insist on is that the vents must be made to bend towards the bottom because when that is the case the wax is more easily melted out if they were otherwise you would have to turn the mould up and down which would give trouble and you would run risk of spoiling it but if you do as i tell you are absolutely safe then note this too it is of the utmost importance that in melting out the wax your fire be so tempered that the wax does not boil in the mould but comes out with the greatest patience when the wax is all out give the mould yet another but very moderate firing in order to get rid of any moisture that may be left in the mould then you may give it a regular good firing first casing the mould in a coat of bricks set one above the other and at about a three fingers distance from the mould this firing should be of soft wood such as elder lime beech or twigs any green wood or the wood of the oak is to be avoided and use no charcoal whatever because all these fuse the clay and make it become like glass 
there are some earths that do not thus cohere and such are used in glass and bronze furnaces i shall not fail in the proper place to tell you of these but at present let me continue my narration of how to prepare our mould for the casting of the bronze dig a pit near your furnace in front of the plug at the outlet hole footnote dinanzi alla spina and footnote which pit should be so big as not only to contain your figure but also be half a cubit deeper and in order that you can give the proper fall the mouth or inlet hole footnote bocca and footnote must be at least a quarter of a cubit above the head of your figure so also as in the case of its depth the pit should be half a cubit larger in width than would be needed to hold the mould then take the mould out of the bricks in which you baked it and when it is cool bind it very carefully with a rope which should be strong enough to carry it then fasten a pulley to a beam in the roof and the rope through the pulley and see that you provide a windlass sufficiently strong to lift your figure as i don't want to omit certain little details which may be well learned from experience i may mention that when i made my perseus for that the work was so very large i lowered it into the pit with two windlasses which were weighted with more than two thousand pounds but a small figure of three cubits would not need more than one tis true you might do without any windlass at all for the latter but that would be very risky because it might tend to move the kernel of the mould that is the core footnote anima and footnote or inner block or again it might knock the shell footnote spolia and footnote outside it the windlass obviates this danger and so you very very gently hoist the figure up and move it to the mouth of the pit and with equal care you unwind the windlass and lower it to the bottom when the figure is standing in position with the inlet hole footnote bocca and footnote in a line with the plugs footnote spine and footnote at the outlet hole footnote dinanzi alla spina and footnote the first thing you have to do is to fit onto the vent holes certain tubes of baked clay such as are used for water pipes of these there are plenty to be got in florence so that i was provided and i used some of them bent and those for the bottom pieces and in all such instances where the vents were turned downwards and fitting one tube on to another i brought them into one straight line upwards this done you take the earth you cut out of the trench and sift it well then mix it with sand which however ought not to be too soft with this mixture you fill up the pit the mixture of sand and earth it may be observed need only surround the figure to the extent of a quarter of a cubit for the rest the plain unsifted earth as you dug it out of the trench will suffice to fill up the remainder of the cavity when the earth has been piled up to the extent of about one-third of a cubit you go into the pit with two rammers footnote matza picchi and footnote which are a kind of wooden instrument three cubits long and about a quarter of a cubit broad at the bottom and with these you pound the earth and weld it well together in doing this you must take great care in no way to knock at the mould it will be quite sufficient if you come within four fingers of it and instead of the rammers press it with your feet still take great care not to shake the mould this ramming in you will repeat every time you have shoveled another third of a cubit of earth into the pit every time too that the earth fills up to the level of the top of the vents take another of the terracotta pipes and add it on binding the juncture well round with a little clean toe in order to prevent the earth getting into the vents for that would stop the passage of air and so hinder your figure from coming in this way taking heed of the vents as you fill in the earth you pass from base to legs from legs to flanks from flanks to arms till at last you get earth and vents on a level with the top of your pit then you proceed to make the passage footnote via 
and footnote, down which the bronze is to flow. Also, you must take care that as soon as you begin putting your figure into the trench, you begin at the same time to fill your furnace with the bronze and heat it, so that your mould should not get damp from too long standing. All these things, if they be not observed, oft times prevent the mould from filling. When the pit is filled up to the mouth of the main entrance, footnote, bocca principale, and footnote, where the bronze is to be poured in, and also having allowed for the necessary fall from the mouth of the plug, footnote, bocca della spina, i.e. the egress channel, and footnote, whence the bronze is to issue from the furnace, and having carried up all the vents as described, you keep both them and the mouth of the main entrance carefully plugged with a little toe. Then you take a lot of square tiles and make a pavement of them round the vents. As there will be more than one entrance channel for your bronze, you must take note that the flooring in question comes right up to the ingress holes of the bronze. Then you take bits of hard dry bricks, broken up into pieces of three fingers or more in thickness, according to your cunning master's discretion, and according to the fall your bronze may need. And then these bricks you plaster together with liquid clay and cloth shavings in lieu of mortar, on the top of your flooring. Note further that of these same bricks you construct a channel from the wall of your furnace and running right round the ingress holes of your figure. Then you take bricks, baked or unbaked, the latter are better, though there's not much difference. Footnote. Con tutto ci sia poco differenza. And footnote and wall up the channel to the requisite height. The thickness of a brick wall will suffice. You construct it by laying brick upon brick and making the height of the wall equal the width of the channel. Footnote. Accomodandoli intorno al tuo canale tanto quanto viene alto. And footnote. When you have carefully joined together with your moist clay instead of mortar all the cracks through which the bronze might ooze out, you remove the tow plugs in the ingress holes of the bronze, and in their stead fit some easily removable stops of moist clay, made so that you can take them out without difficulty, for you have almost immediately to bring glowing coals into your channel, and with these you cover all the parts that have been walled up with clay, till they are well dried, and the fire must be renewed several times, till they are not only well dried, but baked. When all this is accomplished, and your metal, meanwhile, has got well fused, carefully blow with the bellows all the ash and cinders out of the channel, till none remains to hinder the passage of the metal. Then take out all the plugs that close the vent holes, and the earthen stoppers in the ingress holes, and throw some two or three tallow candles, under one pound in weight, into the channel. Hereupon, run to the mouth of your furnace, and refresh it with a certain quantity of pewter, or rather more than the ordinary alloy, i.e. half a pound per cent, i.e. of bronze. Footnote. E rinfrescala con una certa quantità di stagno di piu della lega ordinaria, la quale vuole essere cerca una mezza libra per cento di più della lega che vi arai messa. Professor Roberts Austin is of opinion that this implies an additional half pound of pewter for every hundred pounds of bronze you have in the furnace. If it is not so, should the word pewter be translated tin? That is, the lead tin alloy should contain half pound more tin than is usual, in every one hundred pounds. End footnote. More than what you have hitherto used. When this has been very rapidly done, heap up more and more fire of green wood in your furnace, and then with your iron crook, mandriano, for thus the instrument is called, boldly strike away the plug of the furnace, and let the bronze run. Gently, at first, holding a point of the iron crook in the mouth of the plug, till a certain quantity of the metal has run forth, and its first fury be spent. 
for if you did not do this you might run the risk of your mould being stopped up with wind then you can remove the iron crook from the mouth of the plug and let all the bronze go till the furnace be emptied to this end it is necessary to have a man standing at each of the furnace mouths who with the scraping iron footnote e rastiatoi brinkman has kratzeisen and footnote which is used in the craft drives the bronze towards the outlet until all is cleared out such of the flowing metal as is still left after your mould is filled you dam by means of throwing on to it with a shovel some of the earth you erstwhile dug out of the trench that is how you complete your mould not to be omitted are diverse and terrible mishaps that occur from time to time and often bring to naught all the poor master's pains so tis a wise thing to profit in good time by the experience of others oft times we figure casters call in the help of ordnance founders footnote maestri d'artillieri see above and footnote to aid us but the most terrible misfortunes not infrequently occur owing to their insufficient experience and want of care and all our labour is lost just such a thing very nearly happened to me when i was casting my perseus for calling to aid some of those fellows i found them so absolutely devoid of sense that in their stupidity they all swore my mould was spoilt and that there was no means of writing it and all this thanks to the muddle they themselves had made with my metal footnote see the account of this in the vita page four hundred and twenty and onwards and footnote the statue was more than five cubits high and its pose was a difficult one for in its left hand it held raised aloft the head of medusa in the hair of which was much rich detail of serpents while the right hand was held behind in a vigorous action and the left leg was bent all this variety of limbs made the casting most difficult and for this reason i was ever so keen to get it good and also because it would be the first big work i had produced in italy my fatherland and the veritable school of all the arts so i was moved to even greater pains and diligence than i had before used to complete my figure well so therefore i set to making a great number of air vents and ever so many flowing in mouths that all diverged from the main one the which ran down at the back of the figure from the height of the head down to both heels and spreading out a bit at the calves all these little hints are part of the craft and in this manner did i practise it when i wrought in france as i had to do almost everything with my own hand owing to the intense bodily fatigue to which i was subjected a violent fever seized upon me i struggled against it for many hours but in the end it floored me and i was brought to bed as i had those different masters of ordnance and statuary founders working for me i explained to them before i laid me down exactly the methods i had begun and how these were now perfectly easy to understand as more than half the figure was already covered and the greater part of the difficulties surmounted all that they had to do was to follow my instructions in detail and that appeared easy enough so being utterly incapable of holding out any longer i flung myself on my couch meantime the men worked at my furnace which i had so well prepared and in which the bronze was nearly molten footnote condotto il mio bronzo in bagno and footnote and ready for completing now they had a good six hours work still to employ them in order to fulfil all my instructions in proper sequence because they were not quite skilled in the technique of the craft and because my methods were different from those they usually employed well instead of doing what they were told they began larking about neglected the furnace so that the metal commenced to curdle or as it is called in the craft to cake miliaccio they call it in their lingo nary a one knew a remedy for this blunder for in a round furnace like this one the action of the fire upon the metal is from above 
were it from below it would be easy enough to heat the curdled metal again so not one of them knew a remedy then as i lay there prostrate on my bed with fever one of them in whom i had a little more confidence than the rest came to me and speaking very gently said benvenuto resign yourself to the worst the furnace has been ill prepared footnote stata a disagio e se fatto un meliaccio and footnote a cake has formed on the metal then i turned myself toward him and had all the other craftsmen summoned in whom i put any confidence and asked them if they knew any remedy whereupon these precious fine fellows said there was no other remedy but to break up the furnace and in so doing as the mould was buried six cubits in the ground they could not see they said how the mould could help being spoiled for even if i tried to dig up the ground round it which had been plugged fast there were so many ingress holes and vents that it was dead certain to be spoiled that forsooth was the only remedy they had now gentle reader picture to yourself my state i in all my ills and sickness this new trouble thrust upon me all my honour at stake why i felt the keenest grief that ever man could imagine but this was no time to give way to grief suddenly as in a frenzy my old inborn daring came upon me it's not a thing one can learn this it's in a man's nature furiously i leapt from my bed and literally frightened away that grievous fever with the biting words i shouted at those fellows oh you good-for-nothings who not only know naught but have brought to naught all my splendid labours at least keep your heads on your shoulders now and obey me for from my knowledge of the craft i can bring to life what you have given up for dead if only the sickness that is upon me shall not crush out my body's vigour thus hounding them on i ran with them into the workshop and in one go ordered six of them to different duties first i bade one of them fetch me a load of dry oak that was stacked opposite the house of capretta the butcher and as soon as this came i began throwing it into the furnace several pieces at a time now though i've said it once before as it's so very important i'm going to tell it you again and it's this in bronze furnaces the only woods you use are elder willow and pine for all these are soft woods in this particular instance however i used oak because i wanted the greatest possible heat and thus the metal began to move at once to two others i bade with long iron rods to keep poking into the furnace mouths because it was storming with wind and raining cats and dogs and wind and rain was blowing into my furnace by these means i showed them how to stave off wind and rain two others i set to work to quench the fire because a part of the workshop had caught a light and several great wooden windows were blazing like the devil so that i was in terror lest the whole roof should be aflame so tremendous was the fire with the others and there were plenty of them i set to work clearing the channels through which the metal was to run and to opening all the vent holes scarce was this done when all on a sudden just as the work was being completed owing to the terrific heat of the burning oak the whole cap of the furnace was blown up into the air and the metal began to well over on all sides they stood in utter astonishment all of them for they had obeyed me fearsomely to see the caked metal thus again liquefied the strength of the fire however had consumed all the tin alloy so i ordered to be thrown in a thick pig of fine pewter when i saw this was of no avail and that by god's grace the metal was already beginning to flow and to spread itself on the sides of the furnace i ordered two others to run into my house and fetch hither all my pewter plates and dishes two hundred pounds weight in all and threw them in bit by bit then i made another take iron crooks and strike out first one and then the second of the plugs which were very hard then as the metal began to flow through the channels i 
little by little through the thin pewter plates into it which owing to the immense heat combined with the other pewter so that my mould was soon filled seeing all this mass of metal run in so well without any bubbling or even a single hitch i concluded that all my vents were doing their work the amount of metal left over just corresponded exactly to the extra quantity thrown in so that my mould was completely filled when this was accomplished i gave thanks to god and turning to the lot of them said do you see how everything has its remedy spite of the pain such was my delight that i felt no more fatigue the fever just went to the devil and i sat down to eat and drink with a light heart together with all the lot of them and every one marvelled thereat once too in france when serving king francis and being anxious to cast a lunette of over six cubits in diameter and containing numbers of figures and animals and other things much the same occurred owing to a like blundering of my assistants for although the founders in those parts especially in and around lutetia where they turn out more of it than in any other place under the sun are safer in their technique than any others still as they are deficient in the fundamental principles of the art they lose their heads and give all up in despair when anything exceptional occurs i anticipated a similar incident to that which i have just described with my perseus on another eventful occasion for though the incidents were very different there happened to be one thing that differed from customary methods footnote una cosa la quale usciva di quella ordinaria praticaccia and footnote my people were all in despair and even i myself was much troubled at seeing them so but with my wonted pluck and owing to my thorough knowledge of the art i was here again able to bring a dead horse to life footnote un morto our workshop slang of the dead horse would seem to meet cellini's meaning here and footnote when those ancient masters of the art who were present on that occasion saw this they blessed the day and the hour that they made my acquaintance though i who was their pupil knew well that it really depended upon what i had learned from them they worked according to tradition footnote una continova pratica and footnote this tradition i mastered and i will gladly describe the rule on which it was based and how this rule stood me instead but let us return somewhat in order to continue the course of our narration for though we have digressed a bit we have not diverged from the method of our subject and can easily return to it we have shown how the mould is made and the casting done and we have evidenced this with a statue about three cubits in size there yet remains another method in itself much easier but not so safe as the above-mentioned one the point of this is that instead of making the core footnote nocciolo and footnote of your figure in clay you make it of gesso mixed with burnt bone and pounded brick provided the gesso be of good quality this method is more easy to practice because instead of applying one coat after another as you do in the clay method you can make the gesso liquid that is to say having combined the ingredients just stated one portion of gesso and an equal portion of bone and brick you make a sort of paste of it which you pour into the mould over the solution lasagna and which soon sets after this having taken off the mould footnote di poi sciolto il suo cavo and footnote you bind the core well round with iron wire and cover this very carefully with a similar coat of paste only rather more liquid this done the core is well baked in the same way as the earthen one was in the previous method and the wax poured over it into the mould just as described above when the mould is removed the wax is cleaned round and the air vents arranged also just as before described then you case the hole over with a shell of gesso also as before 
when this shell is completed to the thickness of about two and a half fingers you bind it all round with the same bands of iron two fingers wide and then once again cover it all over with another coat of gesso after this the figure is placed in a furnace made entirely of bricks and so arranged that when the fire is lighted the wax can be melted out into a receptacle set in a hole in the ground beneath the furnace the wax flowing through the air vents and these vents arranged in the manner above stated when the wax is out you make up a good fire of wood and charcoal till the outer mould footnote tonaka and footnote of your figure is well baked but you may take note that the gesso does not need near so strong a fire as the clay true it is that the gesso in our part of tuscany does not lend itself so well to works of this nature as that of mantua milan and france several very able youths who have worked for his excellency the duke of florence have been taken in not once but two or three times owing to the delusion that ours was the best way of making gesso the most excellent duke who was ever a lover of thoroughness very thoughtfully had patience with them but our young men unacquainted with the difference between the one gesso and the other stuck to their own method and remained unenlightened from this you may take note that when a master wants to do a work he should make trial not only of his clays and his gessos but of all the things he proposes to use in this way alone will he get credit by his work and in no other way in this connection i may make mention of the sorts of lime i have seen in rome in france and in other parts of the world the lime that keeps longest in the slacked state is the best and makes the firmest composition but our florentine lime ought to be used immediately after slacking if this is done it makes the best lime and the firmest composition in the world but it loses its virtue if left standing with the foreign lime however the reverse obtains end of section forty section forty one of the treatises of benvenuto cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by benvenuto cellini translated by c r ashby this librivox recording is in the public domain the treatise on sculpture chapter four how to construct furnaces for casting bronze whether for statues ordnance or other such like things furnaces for casting bronze have to be made by each master according as the special needs of his piece and work require it inasmuch as at the beginning of my book i promised always to illustrate what i was describing by work of my own i will do so with furnaces also when working for good king francis i had to make a great bronze gate for which a special furnace had to be constructed this i did in my own castle given to me in royal letters patent by his majesty whom i served most loyally for four years and these letters patent i brought back with me to florence if only to show in italy and my native land what great treasures may not be acquired and how good it is after having been trained in italy to leave home and reap such useful and honourable fruits abroad well then having to make a furnace this was the way i did it the hollow within was three florentine cubits wide which made it about nine cubits in circumference the height of the vault of the furnace was equal in size and shape to the half circle of the bed footnote l'altezza della volta di detta fornace si era il mezzo tondo della pianta della sua rotondita End footnote. to this bed most gentle reader i want you to give special attention i do not intend making a drawing of it because i have seen so many architectural drawings altered and spoiled so i shall content myself with words only to convey what i mean and such as i trust may suffice in a furnace of this nature the bed i e the place where the metal is put must be constructed with a fall just as i made the little one in question the total fall to the bottom of the bed shall be about one-sixth of a cubit 
and see that it's shaped in the manner of the streets you go a-walking in that have in the middle of them what in Tuscany we call a rigaguolo, or gully. This gully runs direct to the mouth of the outlet hole out of which the metal is to flow. The shoulders, footnote, spalle, end footnote, of the gully should slope up ever so gently till they come to within about one third of a cubit at the two gates, footnote, porte, and footnote, where you put the bronze. This third you can increase, or not, by one sixteenth of a cubit, according to whether you wish to increase or decrease depth of your furnace. The third door, about which you need not be so particular, is the one through which the fire enters, and, as it is not brought into direct connection with the bronze, it need only be blocked with a little mound of earth about three fingers high. The bed of your furnace should be of bricks, specially constructed. They should be small, but bigger at one end than the other, and measuring one-sixth of a cubit in either direction. By far the best are those used for glass furnaces, which are made much in the same way as other bricks. Some have shaped their bricks with a cutting instrument, footnote, literally a knife, end footnote, as they went along. But I find, after having tried one way and another, that the best results can be obtained by having them all the same size. Care should be taken to make the bricks of a clay that does not yield in the fire. In my native city of Florence, we use a kind of white clay, said to come from Monte Carlo, and all our glass furnaces were constructed with it. In France I found another, and ever so much better way. The bricks are one-fourth of a cubit long, and the same width as the above. They call them cement, and they make them out of crucibles used in foundries, of which there are no end in those parts. But your master has got to accommodate himself to the conditions of workmanship in every place he works in, when your bricks are thus made, they must, when quite dry, be carefully worked over with iron tools, somewhat in the nature of axes or large chisels made specially for the purpose, so as to make them cohere as well as possible. After this they are gradually cemented with quarry stones, footnote, pietre morte, end footnote, to the thickness of about half a cubit, so that you get an absolutely firm floor for your furnace. These quarry stones should be at least one third of a cubit in size, and ever so firmly united. The first or lower part of a furnace of this description should be, in diameter, two thirds of a cubit larger than the upper portion. Both must be walled with ordinary lime, provided it be good, and after the lower you proceed to wall the upper, the portion in which the bronze has to be placed. Having fashioned your bricks out of the fire-resisting earth just referred to, you take some of this earth and make a paste of it as you would of lime, minding, however, that it is well sifted and clean, and with it wall the whole base of your furnace. I insist again upon the need of your working over the bricks with your chisels carefully and smoothing them well, so that they fit together absolutely, and in thus fitting them, you must make the jointings as thin as possible. Sometimes it happens, owing to some little negligence on the master's part, if he mix the liquid earth too coarsely that the tiniest little cracks form in the drying. These cracks, however small they be, are mighty dangerous, and may cause incalculable mischief, for when the bronze grows liquid, such is its terrific force that it penetrates into them, be they never so small, and I myself have seen the whole thing burst up owing to this. Footnote. Levato il fondo in capo. Perhaps better rendered as the base blown up to the top. End footnote. But when due care is observed, and the walling made with the finest possible liquid earth, there is no need for cracks, your bronze may be safely melted, and all your work come scatheless from the furnace. After the bed you build up the vault with similar bricks in the same way, in doing which you must remember, as I said before, to make your two openings for putting in the bronze. Two-thirds of a cubit wide, and three-quarters of a cubit high will suffice them, 
and they must be semicircular atop. There must also be a third opening two-thirds of a cubit wide and one cubit high for the fire to enter in at, so that the flame, as is its wont, may curl powerfully to the top of the vault, and thence curl down again. Footnote. In modern language, reverberate. End footnote. And with great heat play upon the metal, and melt it rapidly. Four air vents have to be distributed round the spring of the top of the furnace vault. Footnote. Dove la muove. End footnote. In one of the vault bricks, at the lower end of the channel, a mouth must be made much like the air vents, and big enough for you to put two fingers quite comfortably. The air vent too must be the same size. This mouth, out of which the bronze is to flow, must be made from one brick, and mind that it is a good sound one. The said brick, too, must, moreover, be built into its place just as the others were, and helping with them to gradually lock in the vault at the top. So that you don't think me inaccurate, I would have you know that this mouth is called Bocca della Spina, the mouth of the plug. It must be half a finger wider inside than out, and before you pour out the metal, you keep it stopped with an iron stopper, looted with a little ash made into a kind of paste. Then you take a quarry stone about half a cubit square, and make a hole through the middle of it. This hole is to be exactly the size of the mouth just made in the brick, that is to say, on the side adjoining the brick, but on the other side, the side away from the furnace, it is to be six times as big, and it should be cleaned off. Footnote. Pulita mente spavato. Perhaps well rounded off. End footnote. Outside. Then you join it to the brickwork wall of the furnace with the earth, and in the manner mentioned above. But because the base and sides of the furnace have also to be considered, as I said before, you cement these with good ordinary lime. Similarly, all the quarry stones must be the same size as the first piece, and be attached to the walling in the same manner. And they must be carried up to the height of the vault, but straight, so that in the event of any accident happening to the vault, for to that the craft is often liable, it may be mended or put in order. When you have walled your furnace round in this way, you must be careful to join at the shoulders, footnote, spalle, end footnote, of the principal orifice by which the flame enters, footnote, that is what would now be called the fire bridge, end footnote, a hearth two-thirds of a cubit square and two cubits deep, measured from the bottom of this hole of the hearth. In this cavity you put six or seven iron bars, these are about two fingers thick, and of such length as to project beyond the sides of the hole about four fingers each way, and they rest upon pins set at intervals of about three fingers apart. This hearth made over the fire bars is constructed in just the same way, and with the same bricks, and cemented with just the same mortar as was the furnace. It must stand from the ground to about the middle of the hole where the fire enters the fire bridge, and the part above this point must be narrowed to one-eighth of a cubit. Straight through this hole the wood is put. Under the grating a trench must be dug, and five or six cubits long, in the direction in which the draught is to pass through the grating into the hearth. Care must be taken that the draught only blows in one way, and that long ways. We craftsmen call this trench Bracciaiola, the ash pit, because all the ashes fall into it. How long the fire is to be kept up must be a matter of judgment. Sometimes the master may have, owing to work he has to do on his mould, to keep it up for quite four or six hours. When the wood logs are burnt through, they fall into a great pile below the grating, and sometimes they heap up in such a way as to obstruct the force of the draught through the hearth that it cannot do its work. Heed must be taken, then, that when the pile begins to grow big, the ashes must be raked asunder from time to time. To do this, you must have what we call a rastrello, or rake, which you make as follows. You take a piece of iron half a cubit long and one-eighth of a cubit thick. 
on to the middle of this piece and at the upper and thicker side of it you weld an iron rod two fingers thick and two cubits long at the other end of this is fashioned a ferrule footnote gorbia end footnote into which is fitted a wooden handle at least four cubits long take heed too that when your whole furnace is duly made as above directed you gird it round with two stout iron bands the one round near the base the other about one-third of a cubit higher up the thicker and stouter these loops are the better for i know by experience of the casting of my perseus how terrific the might of the fire is the opening of the hearth through which the wood is put must be kept closed the covering must be made in the form of an iron spade of such a size as shall well cover the opening and to this spade a handle of such convenient length that when now and again you have to manipulate it for putting on fresh wood and otherwise you don't burn yourself it stands to reason that before all these things are accomplished the metal has already been put in the furnace and it must be stacked up in such a manner as to admit of flames playing easily through it for this will make the working of your furnace much more effective know too gentle reader what up to now i have forgotten to tell you that when with due care your furnace is made you must before putting the metal into it heat it well through for a space of twenty-four hours for if you do not do this you will not get the metal to melt nay rather will it stiffen footnote agiada and footnote and certain fumes will result from the damp earth that will so impede your work that it may be eight days before your metal begins to flow that is what happened to me in paris i had made a little furnace and had put my trust in a very excellent old fellow quite the best of his craft and about eighty years of age but he hadn't dried the furnace properly and sure enough just as it was on the point of melting and the fire at its fiercest out came these earth fumes when the old worthy saw that for all his heeding the metal was stiffening he got into such a stew the poor old chap that what with his mighty exertions to overcome the difficulty he fell flat down and i took him for certain dead how be it i had a great beaker of the choicest wine brought him and since there was no such great risk in leaving the work as there was in the case of my perseus since too i served that most admirable of kings and thus had not to bother so much about the peddling trivialities of making it pay for however big it was it never mattered with him i mixed a large bumper of wine for the old man who was groaning away like anything and i bade him most winning wise to drink and i stretched out my hand to him and said drink my father for in yonder furnace has entered in a devil who is making all the mischief and look you we'll just let him bide there a couple of days till he gets jolly well bored and then will we you and i together in the space of a three hours firing make this metal run like so much butter and without any exertion at all the old fellow drank and then i brought him some little dainties to eat meat pasties they were nicely peppered and i made him take down four full goblets of wine he was a man quite out of the ordinary this and a most lovable old thing and what with my caresses and the virtue of the wine i found him soon moaning away as much with joy as he had moaned before with grief when the appointed day came the fumes had duly evaporated the furnace was quite ready and well heated and in two hours we cast fifteen hundred pounds of metal with which i finished certain portions that were left of my lunette of fontainebleau and that is why i insist upon your well heating the furnace and also upon making two little quarry stone doors footnote sportaletti and footnote at the furnace openings and you make in each of them two holes one and a half fingers wide respectively and four fingers apart from each other and these holes serve for the insertion of an iron fork made specially to fit into them with which now and again as need occurs you may open and shut the doors remember too 
that each time new metal is to be put into the furnace it must be first put up against the doors footnote in suli sportaletti and footnote till it becomes red hot for if you put it in too soon with the other metal already in you run the risk of cooling the latter and so caking it footnote fare un miliaccio and footnote much as before referred to hence the very greatest care must be taken on that point in paris have i seen craftsmen cast the most wonderful things imaginable and also make equally wonderful blunders and this is due to the fact that technical skill footnote la pratica and footnote serves you up to a certain point but in some accident for instance you need the deeper knowledge of the principles of the art that leaves technical skill on one side as i have evidenced to you above indeed i may add that i have even seen one hundred thousand pounds of metal cast at one time with so much ease that i marvelled at it so great was the technical skill with which it was done at another time i saw a little error made that might easily have been remedied i stood and watched whether they knew how to put it right and i saw them throw it up work and all and so lose hundreds of scudi willingly would i have shown them what the remedy was but their presumption was so huge that had they not known how to put my remedy into practice they would have been quite capable of saying that i myself was the cause of all the ruin so i stood mum and grew wise at their cost gentle reader let that suffice about furnaces and bronze casting and let us now turn to other branches of the art end of section forty one Section 42 of the Treatises of Benvenuto Cellini on Goldsmithing and Sculpture by Benvenuto Cellini, translated by C. R. Ashby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Treatise on Sculpture, Chapter 5, How to Carve Statues or Intaglios or Other Works, Such as Diverse Beasts, in Marble or Other Stones. There are many kinds of white marble, and since those of greece are the most desired footnote piu orientali and footnote and the loveliest let us consider them first and well may i speak for i spent some twenty years in the wondrous city of rome and while there though i gave my attention to the craft of the goldsmith i always had a desire to do some great works in marble and i worked along of some of the first sculptors that lived in those days and among them that i knew best was our great michelangelo buonarotti the florentine the man that wrought better in marble than any other ever known of the reason of this i shall duly speak to you in its place let us tell then in the same way as we did before in other matters of the qualities of marbles i have seen five or more different sorts of marble the first of these has a very coarse grain footnote grana grossissima and footnote and in the grain appear certain bright points running close alongside of each other this marble is the most difficult of all to work because it is the hardest it is particularly difficult to fashion the more delicate forms in it without the chisel damaging or cracking them if you do manage though after much effort to bring them off in this stone they look lovely i have found that the grain gradually softens through the five different sorts above mentioned and the softest of all i have found verging in colour to a delicate flesh tint rather than a white this sort is the most cohesive the most beautiful and the tenderest marble in the world to work in end of section forty two section forty three of the treatises of benvenuto cellini on goldsmithing and sculpture by benvenuto cellini translated by c r ashby this librivox recording is in the public domain the treatise on sculpture chapter six of carrara marbles 
these marbles are again of several different sorts some are coarse grained with plenty of stains footnote smerilli and footnote and spotted with black these are very difficult to work in because the particular kind of stains they have in them eats into the workman's chisels tis bad luck to him if he happens on one of such stained blocks for many times they deceive you with a lovely surface outside while within are all these blots at carrara and in the mountains round are many different quarries and here our great michelangelo came himself and spent much time and labour in choosing the quarry from which came all the great statues of his hand in the sacristy of san lorenzo that he made for pope clement let us discuss this marble a bit just as i kept my promise in dealing with the other branches of the art of illustrating from my own notable works so will i do likewise with this most noble art of sculpture indeed i have always held it to be most wondrous and beautiful and what is more a good deal easier than any of the others so i decided to set my hand to a piece of work such as no man before had ever done the work in question was the crucified in marble i fashioned him in life-size of noble proportions and set him upon a cross of black marble this likewise was of carrara and is a very difficult marble to work by reason of its being so hard and brittle i destined this work for a tomb for myself and i comforted myself with the reflection that even if the work didn't quite succeed at least the intention was good but so great was the determination that i put into the work that what with all my previous careful studies i overcame all the difficulties and satisfied everybody so though of course i have done lots of other works of this kind i may content myself with instancing this one alone in illustration of marble footnote see vita page four hundred and seventy five etc and note this crucifix is in the church of san lorenzo in the escorial i give an illustration of it opposite End footnote. to succeed with a figure in marble the art requires a good craftsman first to set up a little model about two palms high and in this model he carefully thinks out the pose making the figure draped or nude as the case may be after this he makes a second model of the size his marble is to be and if he wants it to be particularly good he must finish the large model much more carefully than the small one if however he be pressed for time or if it be the will of his patron who needs the work in a hurry it will suffice if he complete his big model in the manner of a good sketch for this may be quickly done whereas the working out in marble takes a long time true it is that many strong men have gone straight for the marble with all the fury of the chisel preferring to work merely from a small and well-designed model but notwithstanding they have been less satisfied with their final piece than they would have been in working from a full-size model this was noticeable in the case of our donatello who was a very great man and even with the wondrous michelangelo who worked in both ways but it is perfectly well known that when his fine genius felt the insufficiency of small models he set to work with the greatest humbleness to make models of the size of his marble and this have we seen with our own eyes in the sacristy of san lorenzo when you are satisfied with your model you draw the principal views of your statue on to the stone and mind it be well drawn for if not you may miscut your block the best method i ever saw was the one that michelangelo used when you have drawn on your principal view you begin to chisel it round as if you wanted to work a half relief and thus gradually it comes to be cut out the best chisels for doing this are those that have got i might say very fine points but the handles of which are at least as small as the little finger with this chisel sub beer you approach to within at least half a finger of what is called the penultima pelle the last skin but one then you take a chisel scarpello with a notch in the middle of it footnote con una tacca in mezzo End footnote. and carry on the work further till it be ready for the file 
lima and this file again is called the lima rasper or roughing file or occasionally scuffina there are ever so many sorts of this tool there is the blade shaped file the semicircular file and others of varying sizes five or six of them from such as are two fingers thick to such as are the thickness of a very slender penholder stone borers trapani too may be employed wherever you have to undercut any difficult piece of drapery or any pose of the figure that stands free these borers are of two kinds one that you turn by means of a thong and a handle with a hole through it with this you can do all the more delicate and minute interstices in hair or drapery the other is larger and called the trapano apetto which you use in those parts for which the first is inapplicable when the chisels whether subbia or scarpelli the files and the borers have all done their work to the due completing of your figure you proceed to polish the surface with a fine white close-grained pumice stone i must not omit to say for the guidance of those who are unskilled in working marble that they may strike boldly in with their subia for in the more delicate subia provided it be not inserted straight into the stone does not crack the marble but just chips off as lightly as possible whatever may be necessary while with the scarpello attacker the rough edges may then be brought to an even plane and you go over the work with it just as if you were making a drawing for the surface and this truly is the right method and the one which the great michelangelo employed some have tried other ways and thinking to have their work done quicker have sought to get their figure out by taking a bit off first in one place and then in another but it took them all the longer in the end and wasn't near so good and indeed they mightily mistook for oftentimes they had to piece up their figures and yet with all their patching and piecing they could not remedy the mistakes which a want of discipline footnote obedienza and footnote and patience at the outset had led them into gladly would i go on to describe the various kinds of subbia scarpelli and trapani and likewise the mallets all of which are of iron tempered or of the very finest steel but as everybody in italy nowadays knows all about these things it really isn't necessary had i been writing in france i should have described another sort of stone which is very soft to work in and also white but not the brilliant white of marble rather a dull white this stone after it is first quarried is so soft and easy to work that some masters especially those of paris and i too while there wrought it with wooden chisels only we notched them in various ways in order the easier to cut the work out according to the sketch after this it was finished with delicate and close chisels pointed tools footnote gorbia and footnote and scarpelli of all sorts this stone in course of time hardened almost like marble especially its external surface but i never saw any that came up to marble when it was cleaned the ancients you know had so great a joy in things of this kind that they paid their sculptors with fine liberality and so they came to investigate the most difficult things amongst others they wrought in a sort of green stone often nowadays called greek stone of the hardness of agate or chalcedony now though i have seen fair-sized figures in this stone i have never been able to imagine how it was worked for though it admits of being smoothed with lead footnote il piombe and footnote and emery for the purpose of pavements and such things i can only conceive that for carving figures out of it the ancient masters must have had some secret of tempering their steel and so were enabled to overcome the stone's tremendous hardness there are yet other kinds of stone of which i have in rome seen statues both many and great serpentine and porphyry but more of porphyry for the stone is somewhat softer up to our own day there was no one who worked in this stone till one of our fiesole carvers took it up his name was francesco del tadda 
this man with a fine cunning find out the way of working in porphyry his patience was great and he used little hammers martelletti sharpened like chisels subie and other scarpelletti which he tempered by a special process of his own footnote altri scarpelletti por fatti con sue tempere and footnote francesco made porphyry busts just as fine as the ancients had he been equally strong in designing he might have done over life-size work too but let it suffice that he has the credit of being the first among moderns to practise this art would that his example might inspire all who have great work at heart princely patrons as well as artists we have yet another kind of stone which is called granite it is somewhat softer than porphyry and there are two kinds the one is red and comes from the east the other is white or black and comes from the quarries at elba it is very hard to work the column of santa trinita that came to florence from rome is of this sort moreover it is durable and beautiful but no statues have been made from this stone in our time there are still some other stones that must not be passed over stones that we get from near florence fiesole settignano and other places of these there is one of a blue colour very delicate and as charming to work in as to look at the country folk call it pietra serena great columns are made of it because it is found in large masses in the quarry statues are made of it too but it is no good for open-air use for though it is beautiful it has no durability another sort and a veritable quarry stone footnote pietra morta and footnote is the tan coloured it is soft to work in statues are made of it and it is so durable that it will resist all effects of wind and weather yet another sort and this likewise a tan coloured variety is called the pietra forte the strong stone and strong it is indeed for it is desperately hard to work in statues weapons masks and many other things are made of it you cannot however quarry it in very great places as you can the fiesole or settignano varieties i have mentioned these three sorts of stone because statues may be made in them there are many others in and around florence beautifully marked stones some hard some soft but as they're not used for figure work i shall have no more to say about them end of section forty three